Thank you very much, Dilanta. It's always a pleasure to support you and the Ministry of Health uh, as emergency physicians. And uh, we thoroughly enjoy uh, supporting uh, teaching in relation to our specialty, and we will definitely continue to do so. So a very good morning to all the uh, young house officers who are about to embark on your clinical, uh, sort of the fun part of your career now, yeah? Uh, today, I'm going to spend 20 minutes with you just going over an approach to a deteriorating patient uh, that all of you may have already kind of experienced uh, during your internship period, but definitely you're going to do so uh, in the coming few days, few years. Uh, and if you take on to a speciality of interest, I'm sure uh, it's always going to be um, kind of highlighted by these deteriorating patients, which really need your attention in a, in a systematic way. So I'm sure even by now, many of you may have seen this kind of clinical scenario. You get an unresponsive apneic patient, possibly in a cardiac arrest. You see a acute severe asthma exacerbation, which is coming close to life-threatening or critically fatal. Uh, you've seen uh, anaphylaxis, I'm sure by now, or you should see it in the near future with all this vaccination going around. You see the septic shock patient, you see it in any, any speciality, uh, be it internal medicine, be it uh, obstetrics and gynecology, be it in pediatrics. And the, and the very common young age group presentation, uh, which carries such a high mortality in our productive population, the sweat in chest pain, ST elevation, uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, the unfortunate uh, consequences of uh, road traffic accidents, which uh, is such a, such a frequent presentation to any hospital that you all are going to work in uh, with a patient with uh, head injury, unconscious, and having signs of um, a cushion signs uh, with hypertension, bradycardia, that needs urgent uh, attention by uh, whoever is attending to minimize the secondary brain injury. And of course, a very common uh, presentation with very, very anxious pa uh, pa parents as they storm into hospitals carrying their child who is uh, convulsing. And what we need to know is how to manage a status. Right, so these are some of the common um, presentations in deteriorating patients that you just need to know how to approach. And this is a simple approach that I'm going to introduce to you uh, because why do I say it is simple? Because it is uh, it is an approach which is very systematic, uh, which means that you can apply it, uh, be it geriatrics to pediatrics, from internal medicine to obstetrics and gynecology to surgical to whatever, you name it, neurological emergencies, whatever. It just fits the bill. So it is systematic, it is objective, a uh, lot of point of care uh, support that you need to make certain answers certain clinical questions at the bedside and you need to pick the life threats uh, because they stay in front of you. And if you don't pick them early, uh, you might end up with a morbidity or a mortality. Uh, then you need to initiate treatment as you go along. So it's a, it's a simultaneous process where you assess, you pick the problem, you try to fix the problem and you reassess to see if you have fixed this problem. So the, the treatment that you initiate has to be simple you know, you have to do simple things first because that makes things fast. Uh, you have to always, as junior um, doctors now in the clinical practice, always keep uh, this in mind. You need to ask for help early. The operative word is ask, right? Uh, nobody, uh, say even a consultant, um, uh, you know, at busy at another area in the hospital will not have uh, you know telepathy to know that you are seeing a patient who is very sick so please ask for help early you know call your senior house officer call your registrar early okay and never be shy to ask for help it's always better to ask for help than to answer to uh, uh, an administrator as to why you were negligent towards this uh, cr critically ill patient. And remember, 
uh, corroborate in the same fact is that it is always a team approach that succeeds in managing a critically ill patient. You can't do things single-handedly when a patient in front of you is extremely ill. So you need to muster the support of your nurses, your interns, your senior house officers, whoever who's around, or even uh, colleagues from other uh, disciplines or specialities. And remember, once you identify the problem, you initiate a treatment that is going to fix it. And please see, reassess your patient and see whether what you have started is working. Is the patient same? Is the patient improving as it, that would be your intention? Or is the patient deteriorating? In which case, again, you have to reassess your patient and try to find why your treatment or your fix it is not working. So this is absolutely essential when you're managing patients who are deteriorating in front of you. So a little bit about this assessment. Now remember assessment has to be objective. And when I mean objective, what you uh, will assess on a patient has to be the same as it is assessed by the consultant or the senior house officer or the registrar who comes to see the same patient. So you can't have a variation in these assessment criteria. You had to do it yourself at the bedside next to the patient. Do not rely on third hand information in regards to the vital parameters. It is your absolute duty to ensure that you yourself has assess these five vital parameters. And you all know as medical students, as intern house officers, exactly how you need to go about doing this. So there is no need for me to remind this, but remember you had to put into practice what you have learned over the years. And next important fact is that you have to document what you assess, right? Unfortunately, Sri Lanka is still paper-based, uh, but as you move overseas, when you get the opportunity to work overseas, this all becomes digital uh, and you have to enter the uh, vital parameters, your doctor's notes, all into a computer through a terminal at the bedside. So please, as junior medical officers starting and embarking on, a, on clinical uh, work, please get into the habit of documenting clearly what you have assessed objectively. Right. Okay, so in the systematic approach, it is absolutely essential that when you approach a very ill or ill looking or a patient whom has been flagged to be very sick, you need to pick life threats or what will kill this patient first. And two of the things that can happen in front of you where a patient might just die in front of you is catastrophic hemorrhage, which can be external and which can be concealed. And that is the, the, the challenge of picking up whether this patient is hemorrhaging in, at a very high rate with a high volume. That is exactly what is meant by catastrophic. It is torrential blood loss. Uh, you lose large volumes in a small period of time. So you need to pick this first. You need to attend to it fast and you, you need to initiate simple things very early on. The next killer that can happen in front of you is a critically dynamic airway. And what I mean a critically dynamic airway is an airway that you can lose in front of you within a few seconds to minutes. And the commonest kind of critically dynamic airways that you're going to face and encounter in your clinical practice in the future are laryngeal edema following inhalational burns and expanding neck hematoma due to trauma or penetrating injury. And any patient whose saturation is just not picking up with more and more oxygen therapy, where we call it refractory hypoxia. So these patients are deemed to have critically dynamic airway. And you need to secure this airway as early as possible with the most competent person. And your objective as junior doctors would be to send off, identify these critically uh, dynamic airways, ask for help early and keep oxygenating these patients whichever way you can until help arrives. Right, okay. Okay, so now we come back to our systematic approach. So once you identified, or if you ruled out any 
um, life threats such as catastrophic hemorrhage or a critically dynamic airway, then you move down in a very smooth and a slow assessment uh, of initially the airway. You need to ensure that this airway is open. And you know there are certain obvious things that can block the air. Remember the muscle uh, in the mouth, that is the tongue. It is a huge structure. Uh, and if you just focus on this graphic cartoon, you know, it occupies such a large uh, area within the oropharynx. And when the moment the muscle tone is lost due to a reduction of conscious level, this tongue just falls back obstructing the airway. So that is something that you have to always keep in mind when you're, when you're assessing the airway, look for airway patency. And how do you know it? You hear sounds that are caused by secretions and blood. You hear snoring uh, that is caused by a falling of the tongue uh, back. You can identify stridor if there is laryngeal edema. And remember, one of the one of the telltale signs that the laryngeal edema is getting worse is when the stridor becomes softer and softer. So do not be reassured in a, a patient who presents with loud stridor, when the stridor starts to go down, but the work of breathing is not matching that improve uh, the loss of the intensity of the sound and the work of breathing is increasing, uh, such as the seesaw breathing pattern, you have to be extremely worried because that means you are about to lose the airway due to laryngeal edema. So a stridor that becomes less, which is not accompanied by reduction in work of breathing is an absolute red flag sign that you should keep in mind. So how do we fix a, a airway which is lost its patency? Well, do the simple things first. And every one of you should be very conversant with what is called the triple maneuver. Uh, that is the head tilt, the chin lift, and the jaw thrust. And the last uh, maneuver, the jaw thrust, is something that is absolutely essential that you should uh, be very conversant with because in patients suspected with cervical spine injury, this is the only airway opening maneuver that you can do to prevent any worsening of a potentially harmful cervical spine injury. So everybody, whenever you get the opportunity to attend any skill station, please become absolutely proficient in the jaw thrust maneuver. And it, it, it varies depending on adult to pediatric to neonate, and you need to be sure how you modify your jaw thrust maneuver in all of these age categories. Suctioning using the Yanko sucker is always standard protocol. Uh, remember that it is the posterior part of the pharynx where the secretions will collect in a supine patient. And remember the Yanko suction was designed for you to, to pass it in between the teeth and the buccal mucosa and it reaches the back space in between the last molar and it can suction out anything that is collected in the posterior pharynx. And airway adjuncts, I'm sure all of you, you are familiar with the oropharyngeal airway, which is also termed the gaudel and nasopharyngeal airway. You need to know how to size these. You need to know how to insert it in adults and pediatrics. And you need to know that this is a kind of a definitive airway until you can consider uh, advanced airway such as intubation or a supraglottic device. So remember, sizing of these airway adjuncts is absolutely important and how you insert them is also something that you must learn because this will create airway patency until help and senior help comes along for you to go in for a more definitive airway. So you can maintain oxygenation, you can maintain ventilation with these airway adjuncts. Right, now, so in airway, we have so far discussed about the patency, uh, how we clear uh, uh, obstructed airway. And next important factor in the airway assessment is to understand if the patient is able to protect their airway. And airway protection is really a direct uh, uh, kind of it bearing depending on the level of consciousness. As I mentioned earlier, when the conscious level drops, your muscle tone drops and the big, huge muscular structure in your oropharynx, uh, the tongue will definitely obstruct the airway. So you need to be aware of this fact. So any patient who has a Glasgow coma scale less than seven or the, a motor component in the GCS less than five 
possibly has to be considered will be needing pro protection through an endotracheal intubation or a supra supraglottic airway. So remember this. So your assessment uh, in the airway in relation to protection is directly related to the patient's level of consciousness. And then you might also have these other issues uh, such as neuromuscular uh, insults or you know uh, where a patient is unable to cough uh, or the patient is having um, increased work of breathing because of intercostal or the diaphragm muscles being affected and becoming more and more weak. So even in these situations, airway protection has to be considered early on in the management and you need to send for senior help if you pick this in your objective assessment of the airway. And finally, remember any unconscious patient, any patient who suggests a uh, 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 a dangerous mechanism of, mechanism of injury in, in trauma, you need to consider uh, protecting the cervical spine. Uh, when I mean protection, you need to minimize or restrict movement at the neck. And how do you do it? The simple ways is to apply the manual inline stabilization with the help of one of your team members. So please be conversant as to how you do it so that you can teach a person who is not quite aware of doing it or you can do it uh, when a senior doctor or colleague comes to help or take, takes over the airway from you. Uh, remember, for, uh, for longer periods of time, especially if you need to transfer your patient into hospital or, or into hospital from uh, emergency department to, to CT or to OT or to ICU, uh, you need to uh, either uh, restrict mobility with sandbags, uh, with blocks, with a strap, or even a cervical collar. Um, in regards to conscious patients, you have this clinical decision-making rules uh, that you can apply and all of you have smartphones, please ensure that you have downloaded MD Calc. Uh, it's a free download. It gives you all these clinical decision rules and two are the very commonly employed uh, clinical decision rules to consider imaging in cervical spine injury uh, is the Nexus and the Canadian C-spine rules. Please, uh, when you have time, go over these rules and try to employ them in your day-to-day -day practice as you start your clinical career. Fine, so we've dealt with the airway. So there were three important aspects in the airway assessment. That is the patency, the ability to protect and consideration of the cervical spine. Now we move on to breathing. Now, remember the first thing that you need to assess is, is the patient breathing, uh, breathing pattern normal? If it is agonal, which is the, the correct term for what we commonly call as gasping type of uh, breathing, remember it is an indicator on, in an unresponsive patient that the patient is in cardiac arrest until proven otherwise. So you need to initiate uh, high quality chest compressions the moment you your assessment tells you that the patient's breathing pattern is agonal. And as fast as you can, uh, you need to um, attach the patient to an ECG monitor, either through your defibrillator or a monitor that is available and identify the cardiac arrest rhythm and therefore, depending on that, continue on your uh, CPR algorithm with which Kanishka is waiting to discuss with you in great detail and depth. Uh, remember, you need to also um, be objective in how you assess the respiratory rate. Uh, all of you, I think, have graduated from very renowned medical schools, so I'm sure they taught you exactly the correct way of measuring uh, the respiratory rate. Please do not forget what you learned. Please practice it at the bedside with all the patients that you are going to see and assess. So respiratory rate is one of the most sensitive vital parameters that gives us such a wealth of information because remember the rate is controlled by chemoreceptors in the respiratory center. So you can just imagine that subtle minute changes in the hydrogen ion concentration is going to change the respiratory rate. So it is that very sensitive. So please do not disregard the respiratory rate. Uh, it's this common uh, uh, vital parameter that is overlooked by many from junior to even consultants. And I am absolutely livid uh, when I work with my team, when I find that the respiratory rate has not been assessed objectively. It gives such a wealth of information. Pulse oximetry is such a simple and freely available 
monitoring device that you can just slip on. Uh, you just slip the probe onto the finger and you get a saturation reading, which gives you a fair indication at the bedside of certain issues regarding oxygenation in your patient. So always remember to slip the pulse oximeter probe onto your patient as early as possible when you're assessing your patient. The other aspect which you all should be concerned about is the work of breathing. And that is something that you have to um, inculcate in your practice, how to, how to identify increased work of breathing. This varies um, very much from pediatric to adult uh, to geriatric uh, patients. So remember, uh, you, need to, uh, you need to pick these subtle signs, nasal flaring, uh, tracheal tug, uh, the, the intercostal recessions, the, the, the use of accessory muscles of um, respiration. So all of these you need to take into consideration in your breathing assessment, which has to be absolutely objective. Right, so when you assess your breathing, you find that the breathing is affected, then you need to start assisting breathing. And the go-to, obviously the simple things first is the bag valve mask resuscitator. Uh, now remember, this is a highly sophisticated piece of medical equipment, which is an absolute lifesaver. It's a, it's a game changer in resuscitation. So you as a responsible clinicians should be very conversant with this device. Uh, you need to take time and uh, study this device. It is, it is a, it's a beauty of a design because it has uh, so many features which are absolutely, uh, you know, indescribable. And the people who designed this uh, really labored hard, spent millions of dollars and spent years and years in uh, design concepts. So please know how to use it for the benefit of your patient. If things are not really working out in terms of uh, the bag well mask, then you have to consider non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal oxygen, or ultimately uh, you might have to even consider invasive mechanical ventilation. So all these uh, obviously are beyond your scope at the current level of your clinical expertise, but remember, ask for help early. You got competent anesthesiologists, you got senior registrars, registrars, uh, senior house officers who are so competent in, in providing this advanced uh, breathing support. So please inform them early. And that is your role as junior clinicians. Fine, so we've covered airway, we've covered the breathing, and now we come to circulation. Once again, objective assessment, please, at the bedside in the patient in front of you. This is all medical school teaching, the pulse rate, the rhythm, the volume, the blood pressure, the capillary refill time, cold lines, the level of consciousness and the urine output. And if you want to be even more thorough, send off a venous blood gas to estimate lactate level and base excess. So this entire objective assessment of circulation is just to answer a simple clinical question. And that is to understand if this critically ill patient in front of you is perfusing his or her vital organs. And you all know what the vital organs are. It is the heart, it is the brain, it is the kidneys, it is the gut. So how do you gather information at the bedside in relation to such a complex physiological phenomena? Well, it is not that difficult if you do it in a systematic way and in a very objective way. So all these clinical parameters is going to give you the answer to that absolutely important and imperative question, are the vital organs being perfused adequately? So it is a combination of all these circulation parameters that we assess which will give you the most reliable answer to your question. And now this is one of the most valuable tools, uh, which I consider uh, the extra clinical skill, which I hope that uh, we will be able to introduce into your undergraduate curricula very soon. Uh, and that is the utilization of point of care ultrasonography. Uh, it's really bedside ultrasound. And there are so many protocols that have been now developed, which are absolutely user friendly. Uh, it's just that you need to be conversant with uh, the, the, the utilization of the ultrasound machine at the bedside. Uh, it is easy to learn, but you need to uh, kind of uh, ensure that you are certified uh, that your ultrasound windows uh, actually are clinically competent, uh, sort of um, what they call um, uh, 
can't remember the term. Anyway, uh, you need to be sure that what you are actually seeing on your ultrasound window can give you uh, answer to your clinical question. So you need to be credentialed, that is the term. So you need to be credentialed as an ultrasound user to practice this to make cl clinical decision rules. And it's something that all of you should consider. Uh, we as a college are hoping to introduce uh, certain um, ultrasound courses, uh, specially geared to uh, the beginners. And we hope that you will enroll in these so that you become uh, clinically competent to use ultrasonography at the bedside in critically ill patients, especially in the emergency department, and how that is going to help you make these clinical decision rules. So some of these protocols have fancy names. Uh, E-FAST, I think FAST scan is something that you all know. It is not a scan that is done fast but it stands for Extended Focused Assessment by Sonography in Trauma. And RUSH is another similar thing that is um, uh, where you use a rapid ultrasound uh, examination in shock and HIMAP uh, is clearly detailed in this uh, part of my slide. So remember all of these is absolutely essential for you to again corroborate your clinical suspicion uh, in terms of uh, circulation, uh, whether there is intravascular volume depletion, is there, um, is there leakage of intravascular volume into some concealed compartment in the body, which you cannot see by your naked eye, uh, and so on and so forth. So it is absolutely essential. It's a great help for emergency department uh, personnel when we are managing critically ill patients. So finally, uh, the whole uh, gamut of um, objective assessment of the circulation is really to answer this absolutely important clinical question. And that is we need to identify the stage and the type of shock that the patient in front of you is there with. So is the patient in compensated shock? Is the patient going into decompensated shock? And unfortunately has the patient um, presented to you too late and is in irreversible shock. So there are obviously uh, this, this element will be covered by my colleagues uh, down the line. I think Anusha is going to do a comprehensive lecture on shock. So I don't want to dwell on this, but, but you can see that there's a whole lot of um, sort of pathophysiology that can be answered if you uh, do an objective focused assessment in circulation. And finally, in circulation, never forget IV access. Uh, you need to get into the intravascular compartment of your patient who is very sick uh, and always go to the most uh, largest accessible vein where you can pass the largest uh, IV cannula because you don't know what entails in the further management. You might have to transfuse blood and blood products. You might have to give uh, vasoactive drugs. So please ensure you get in to the largest vein with the largest possible cannula because that is absolutely imperative in the ongoing management of a seriously ill patient. Uh, this uh, intraosseous access is something that is being talked about uh, in most parts of the world. Unfortunately, we do not have this easy o, uh, IO uh, device uh, in common availability. I think it is there in very, very few centers in Sri Lanka, but it is uh, absolute go-to in uh, collapse patients who present to you uh, in decompensated shock, e even in pediatrics, it's such an important tool. Uh, we hope we might be able to um, sort of find it uh, in the most essential uh, areas of uh, our hospitals in the near future, but we are working on that. Uh, remember, do not forget to send off investigation panel, the baseline investigations, as you all know, as you gain IV access, because the first few drops of blood are very precious. Uh, do not waste it, collect it, and send it off. Uh, and never forget grouping and cross-matching, uh, which is so important in your initial assessment. Uh, you might have to resuscitate your patient in the, uh, in the emergency department, so you can go to balanced solutions. Uh, remember, we don't load patients liberally with crystalloids anymore. We do not resuscitate hypovolemic patients uh, with gelafandine and things like that. Colloids is out. Uh, and early blood and blood product transfusion is absolutely paramount in hemorrhagic shock patients because that drives down mortality and morbidity. And always, always time critical drugs such as antibiotics in septic shock, uh, thrombolytics in ischemic stroke and uh, myocardial infarction, uh, ST elevation, and vasopressor drugs in uh, spinal, spinal shock, in uh, septic shock. So all these things need to be initiated and you can only initiate this 
this time critical treatment if you only have a good intravascular access. So please, as clinicians embarking on your clinical career, remember IV access is paramount and you need to be competent in achieving it. Right, now we move on to disability. And what do I mean by disability? Well, what I mean by disability is you need to objectively assess a patient's level of consciousness. Uh, there are two objective tools that are commonly practiced, uh, that commonly used in clinical practice. That is the Glasgow Coma Scale, which was developed specifically for neurotrauma patients, but now it is adapted to other situations as well. The alert, verbal response, pain response, and unresponsive AVP use simpler, uh, sort of uh, objective assessment tool. Remember, you need to do it. You need to learn how to do it. You need to know how to do it in a practical sense in the patient who is critically in, in front of you. And absolutely, absolutely essential for me to reiterate again and again, please document what you assess. It has to be written down in the notes. GCS, such and such, or is it a A, is it a V, or is it a P, or is it a U? You need to document this because this is absolutely essential that at the first point of contact, what was the objective level of consciousness because it has such a clinical bearing for ongoing treatment. So please ensure that you do that. And pupil reaction, the size and uh, light reaction, I'm sure you all are all competent as to how to elicit this and how to interpret it. And any focal neurology, do not forget capillary blood sugar in a critically ill patient. Uh, if you've forgotten it while taking blood samples in your circulation, please remember you need to complete it at least in your disability assessment. And why do we need to assess disability so objectively? Because it has treatment option uh, bearing, right? It obviously, as I mentioned before, tells you, it, it alerts you of the possibility of uh, protecting the airway if the GCS that you have measured is seven or less, or if the motor score is less than five, you have to consider airway protection uh, with advanced airway. And you, you need to ask for help and you need to start preparing for an intubation in the emergency department. And it also tells us some of the absolutely essential imaging uh, that radiology department will, will help us with, uh, such as CT scans, MRI scans, uh, angiograms, um, uh, and um, even venograms all done by MR uh, technology. Uh, so it is absolutely important that you objectively um, assess your patient's disability because it does have a bearing on the morbidity and mortality of your patient at the end of the day. Finally, in exposure, remember, this is something that you do not neglect. You need to, once you have uh, kind of gone through the airway, breathing, circulation, and the disability assessment, you need to ensure that you expose your patient. Look for telltale signs on the skin, such as rashes, a bruising, a bite or fang marks. Uh, abnormal swellings that you may have missed because the patient was covered in clothing. Uh, always be cautious when you are turning patients following trauma or unconscious patient. In, uh, so you need to uh, do this, uh, the spinal um, protection where how you log roll patients, you need to be conversant with that, but please do it and look carefully at the back and the spine and never forget this important vital parameter and that is temperature. You need to, you need to objectively measure it. It is not just keeping the, the back of your palm on the patient and saying, ah, the patient has fever, ah, the patient is cold. No, you need to do it objectively. Get your nursing staff to do one of the objective assessment. Core temperature is always better than peripheral, but try whatever you have depending on availability, but please ensure that it is objectively measured. So in summary, um, what I have mentioned here is an is a, is a approach to a critically ill patient or a deteriorating patient or a crashing patient or whatever you want to call it. But imagine the important thing is the patient in front of you. So you need to um, adopt this systematic approach. It is a simple approach, but it is assessment using objective uh, assessment criteria. So I call this the Tuna Paha technique, right? So if you take airway, there are three things that you check patency protection, C-spine. If it's breathing, it is respiratory rate, saturation, work of breathing. If it is circulation, it is the pulse rate, blood pressure, and perfusion status with CRFT or whatever you want to employ. If it is disability, it is the objective 
uh, tabulation of the level of consciousness using either the GCS or the AP, uh, AVPU score uh, and documenting pupil reaction and size and measuring and documenting uh, the capillary blood sugar. And in exposure, it is to look at the skin, it is to look at the back, it is to look at the limbs and always remember temperature. So it's the Tuna Paha technique that you should employ in your assessment, in your objective assessment, in your approach to a critically ill patient. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I know I speak a little fast, but that's in the, in the interest of time as well. And also I need to attend to a very important function, which was to start 11 minutes ago. Uh, but I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Um, I don't know if, uh, Dilante, do we take questions on chat box? Okay, in the, in the absence of any questions, um, I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Kanishka uh, Seniviratna. He's the consultant emergency physician at the uh, National Hospital of Kandy. Uh, and he's going to talk about an absolutely important uh, topic that is advanced cardiac life support, which all of you should be uh, fully aware of uh, as you embark in your clinical practice. Uh, over to you, Kanishka. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Harinder, for your kind introduction. And uh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, advanced life support, which is one of the dreaded <clears throat> emergency that you will come across uh, during your medical career. I hope some of you have already <clears throat> had a chance to manage a patient with a cardiac arrest. Right, so let's move on. So the learning outcomes of the today's lectures are to uh, uh, go through the, the basic life support and the advanced life support algorithms and uh, look at the treatment of uh, shockable and unshockable rhythms and potentially reversible causes of cardiac caress and the role of, a little bit about the role of, of a resuscitation team. Right, so what is basic life support? So this is <coughs> this is going to be, uh, very interesting one. Uh, first of all, we need to know how to recognize a cardiac arrest, <clears throat> how to diagnose a cardiac arrest. So uh, how do you diagnose it? So there are three things. One is patient will be unresponsive and not breathing normally. Uh, they are the basically indicators for com uh, commencement of the resuscitation. To add to that, sometimes, <clears throat> I mean, uh, you won't feel uh, your central pulse as well. So patient will be unresponsive, not breathing normally, or patient, uh, patient is apneic, and there will be no central pulse. So <clears throat> what do you do next? So if you recognize this kind of patient or uh, come across a patient with a cardiac caress, so you need to make sure that you are free from dangers and take the uh, victim out of the danger. So you need to get the patient out of the electrical wires, falling items, and things like that. And at the same time, <clears throat> this is very applicable to current context with infection. So you need to wear gloves, mask, and an apron. At least those should be wear. So then you, <clears throat> how do you uh, diagnose it now? Evaluate responsiveness. So how do you check the responsiveness? So you uh, tap and shake the shoulders gently of the patient or call out loud. So say that uh, ask that the patient is okay. So if the patient is responsive, leave him in the position, him provided there is no further danger. But otherwise, as Harinder mentioned earlier, always ask for help or call for help. Right? Then <clears throat> while, uh, until, the, uh, until, the, until your help arrives, so what you have to do is, uh, you know how to open the airway with different maneuvers. So you use your chin lift, head tilt and jaw thrust. But if you suspect a cervical spine injury, you just do the jaw thrust only. While, <clears throat> once you open the airway, you look, listen, feel for breathing. So you look for chest movement, listen for breath sounds and feel for expired air on your cheek. At the same time, if you are trained enough, I'm sure you all do, uh, you can palpate for carotid pulse. 
but you should not take more than 10 seconds to uh, detect carotid pulse. If you, if you don't, if it doesn't present, so you take it as there is no carotid pulse, right? So once you have confirmed your uh, the cardiac arrest, you call for help, ask for help, and so you need to uh, start your chest compression straight away, right? Just to get the circulation, uh, get the oxygen circulate. Then uh, how do you do uh, chest compression? Because this is one of the important things in the uh, in managing a cardiac arrest. So you need to give quality uninterrupted chest compressions. How do you give? So you keep your, your heel of your hand, lower half of the sternum. Keep your heel of your hand, lower half of the sternum. You need to push hard. You need to push hard. You don't, you don't just massage the chest, but you need to push hard. So your compression should at least go, uh, your depth should be five to six centimeters. Now, uh, two to three inches. Then, <laughs> at the same time, you need to push fast. Your rate should be at least 100 to 120 per minute. So that means each second, you need to give at least two uh, chest compressions. And also, you need to allow the chest to recoil. You need, you should allow adequate time to chest to recoil so that uh, you get the venous return. Right. So that's how you give proper chest compression. And the ratio is if, if the patient is not intubated, because, because in the basic life support, you won't be able to intubate a patient. So in that case, so you would give 30 chest compressions to two breaths, 30 chest compressions to two breaths. Uh, you should not take more than five seconds for two breaths, but if, it is, if you are not, uh, I mean, happy to give uh, one about breathing, uh, you can just give uh, this, uh, compression only uh, resuscitation you can continue but otherwise you have to give 30 to 2 chest compression if you i mean if this happens in a in a sort of in in, in hospital setting uh, the a per, a person may be who is embo in the patient or the there will be back mass ventilation and you might be uh, giving chest compression in that case again you have to give 30 to 2 uh, chest compression to breaks Right. So you need to, con likewise, you need to continue your chest compression until the defibrillator is available. Once the defibrillator is available, uh, your <clears throat> the further management depends on the, on the rhythm of the patient. So then you move your basic life support into the advanced life support. So advanced life support, all your management depends on the, uh, as I said earlier, the rhythm of the patient, arrested patient. There are two types of rhythm. One is shockable rhythm, the other one is non-shockable rhythm. Those are the only basic two types. Shockable rhythms are ventricular fibrillation and pulseless VT. Ventricular fibrillation and pulseless VT. Non-shockable rhythms are asystolic and pulseless electrical activity. So if you, if you think that it is a shockable rhythm, if you, I mean, not think, but if you, if you reckon that this is a a shock of rhythm like a VF or a pulse VT, you stop your CPR for, for, for a second and look at the monitor. Once you attach the patient to the defibrillator, look at the monitor. And if it is if it is a VF or a pulse VT, so it is an indication to defibrillate the patient. VF is a again uh, in the as it as it, as it mentioned, I mean <coughs> depicted here. Uh, in the first ECG, it's like a v, it's VF, like a bizarre irregular pattern. Pulseless VT, so again, broad complex, it's very rapid and regular. QRS complexes are there. So that is a VT without any pulse. Right. So then <clears throat> if, you, if you see this kind of uh, either VF or pulseless VT, you need to defibrillate the patient or deliver shock. So how we are going to deliver shock, it has to be a safe and effective defibrillation. So this is the sort of a sequence that you can give, that you can do, uh, adhere to So when you are uh, delivering a shock. So once the defibrillator is, uh, while the defibrillator is charging on the machine, you continue your CPR, but you can, you have to ask the other person to get the oxygen away and do the safety check. So you look at the bed around the bed and see whether there's any 
anyone's leaning against or things like that so once a defibrillator is charged you need to sh- say loud stand clear then <coughs> get uh, one pad when one pedal at a time and uh, discharge the shock and at the same time you need to apply gel and things like that and discharge the shock and return the patients to the machine the first shock should be in a biphasic uh, defibrillator so you can start with a 150 joule but uh, second and subsequent shocks you can go up to 270 and the maximum uh, available <coughs> energy in the energy in the uh, defibrillator what i know then can you all hear me yes can you doctor yes. yeah okay sure then <coughs> once you uh, that once you done that you defibrillated the patient so immediately you don't wait to uh, look at the rhythm or anything you need wait to you don't need to wait for to check the pulse because that is that is one of the common common mistakes that you people i have seen doing uh, so once you done the defibrillation immediately after the shock you have to resume the cpr for another 2 minutes you need to immediately you need to resume cpr so you again check your rhythm only after 2 minutes of cpr so there should be minimum interruption to the cpr for the chest compression and at the same time while you are doing the cpr if you the facilities are available you can attach the patient to at co2 monitor and or the intrain to carbon dioxide monitor uh, i'm sure most of the <coughs> et use having uh, with uh, monitors with capnogram so your <coughs> et co2 should be more than 14 mm mercury if you are giving a good quality chest compression so during cpr you need to make sure that you are giving high quality cpr like as i say uh, there should be adequate rate depth and the recoil and always you and your actions before interrupting cpr like if you are embarking on a so echocardiography or bed sand echocardiography or blood gas analysis or for that matter for intubation so you need to plan action before interrupting cpr so that, because there will be there should be minimum interruption to your chest compression and <clears throat> once you intubated the patient you can continue your chest compression uh, independently so that means the person who is giving chest compression can give continuous chest compression 100 to 120 uh, breath, the, the, the chest compressions per minute and the patient who are ambu in the patient can give about 12 to 14 breaths per minute so <clears throat> once i say once you have a secure do not interrupt the compression for ventilation at the same time assign somebody to get the vascular access access iv or intraosseous and give the drugs as indicated so we are still on the vf and vt so so now uh, you have continue first you have given a first job then uh, continued chest compression for 2 minutes and again if it is a vf or vt you deliver the second job again and continue you cpr for 2 minutes then uh, when you check again it could be a vf for a vt pulse rate reading so then after the third shock you need to give iv adrenaline 1 mg and amidron 300 mg as a bolus so mind you that always you need to give those drugs with a very large fluid flush well, otherwise because there is no circulation at the cardiac arrest station so you need to give those drugs with a very large fluid flush so after the third shock you need to give uh, adrenaline and drone and you can uh, repeat your adrenaline every other cycle after that right <clears throat> non shockable rhythm so shockable rhythm ma'am is done now we are talking we are moving into non shockable rhythm so analyze the rhythm it should be non shockable rhythm either a systole in a systole in the first, uh, like in ecg there is no electrical activity or there can be occasional p waves present but if it is a, if you see a very straight line you need to make sure that the patient is ni- not disconnected from the uh, machine so it might be a case is will be a very wavy uh, uh, there might be slight wavy form as uh, is there and <coughs> pulse stress electrical activity other form, other form so the any perfusing rhythm without any pulse without no without pulse right any perfusing rhythm for that matter even a sinus rhythm with no pulse will be a pulse rate electrical rate. as the name depicted uh, as it explains by itself so there will be uh, there is no pulse but the heart has some electrical activity going 
occur. So there it could be a organized electrical activity, but without any pulse. Right. So once you see this uh, this kind of a rhythm, either asystole or pulse of electrical activity, you need to give IV adrenaline straight away with a one milligram with a large fluid flush and repeat every other cycle. So you give CPR for another two minutes, no uh, cardio, no no rhythm or the asystole or the uh, pulse of electrical activity. Again, you uh, continue your CPR for another two minutes. Check the rhythm. If it is a system pulse, you can repeat your adrenaline at that time. So every other cycle, you need to repeat your adrenaline. Right? <clears throat> so uh, you can check the pulse once you, I mean, once you, uh, at the end of the second minute, you always check the ECG. If, if you think it is a perfusing, I mean, compatible with the perfusing rhythm, always check your pulse. Right. So <clears throat> this is. I mean, you are continuing giving this chest compressions and uh, ventilation and things like that just to buy time. At the same time, you need to correct the reversible causes. Otherwise, you won't be able to uh, survive the patient. Because the, the, the common correct the reversible causes are 4 H. You know all that. Uh, 4 Hs and 4 Ts. One is hypoxia. Uh, hypoxia. Hypothermia hyperkalemia and hypovolemia, the four hechas. The four T's are cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, thrombosis, and toxin. So I'm going to go through uh, them a uh, little bit over one by one. Uh, like uh, thrombosis, it's a common, common one now, the pulmonary embolism and cardiac acute coronary syndrome. So consider if you suspect pulmonary embolism, you know, bed bound patient or immobilized patient for some time or who has had a surgery and <clears throat> pelvic surgery, hip surgery, to, like with the background history. So consider giving thrombolytic drugs immediately if you suspect a PE. So you, if you give thrombolytic drugs, it may take up to 90 minutes to be effective. So you continue your CPR for this duration. Right, hyperkalemia always in a CKD patient or patient presence with AKI. So uh, you do a blood gas while resuscitating the patient. And if you see any high, high potassium, so protect the heart, you first 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate by a rapid bolus. So and when you check your blood gas, if there's hypokalemia, so you need to make sure that you are giving potassium 20 millimoles over 10 minutes. Right? And a little bit about maternal cardiac arrest. This is a sort of special entity. Then you need to uh, call for help early anesthetist, POG, and neonatologist because you need to intubate this patient early and probably you might have to go for a perimortem cesarean section. So you need to have a POG and to take care of the baby, you should call the neonatologist as well. So if the patient is gravid more than 40, 20 weeks of POA, always remove the carval compression by left uterine displacement with two hand techniques like the picture shows or else left uterine displacement with one hand technique or else the the best thing you can do is you can keep the patient on a wedge uh, about 15 to 30 left lateral tilt right so like this uh, photo shows so then uh, you have to continue your chest compression and at the same time you need to keep a little bit Keep your uh, hands a little bit higher up in the chest when you are <coughs> resuscitating a pregnant lady. Right, drowning. Again, there are a couple of modifications in the advanced life support in drowning. So you need to give prompt initiation of rescue breaths. You have to give five initial breaths. Breaths in contrast to I mean, conventional ALS, you need to give five initial breaths when you come across a patient who has drowned. So early again, early tracheal intubation, you need to keep a little bit higher peep and always make sure that you you dry your dry the patient's chest before defibrillation otherwise it can cause sparks and give more and more iv fluid so <clears throat> right while while you are resuscitating to patient you see a organized rhythm organized electrical activity compatible with the cardiac output during a rhythm check at the, at the end of the end of a second minute 
So you check your breath activation center first and entitled CO2 trace. Entitled CO2 trace, trace may be rising. So if there is evidence of uh, return of the spontaneous circulation, you, straight away you need to go for a post resuscitation care. Right? What post resuscitation care is uh, last but not least, it's one of the imp very important uh, part of resuscitation because most of the time I have seen that patient being resuscitated properly, but after that you <clears throat> leave the patient um, uh, in a same manner, and then patient will, might go into ca another cardiac arrest, which may which may be very difficult to uh, survive. So you what you have to do is during post resuscitation care, you need to reassess the patient according to their with breathing circulation disability and exposure, <laughs> as Dr. Harendra uh, taught you in the first lecture. So if the patient is not intubated, get the airway, ET tube in place and get the definitive airway. Do a chest x-ray, do a blood gas and correct any physiological abnormalities. Get the 2 led CG and arrange echo as well. So if the 2 led CG shows a ST elevation MI, because most of the out of hospital cardiac arrest are due to acute coronary syndrome. So if it shows uh, ST elevation, it is an indication to activate the cath lab. So you have to talk to the cardiac team. And at the same time, ICU, arrange ICU care. There, are, there is a place for targeted temperature management in cardiac care. So ICU people will deal with that. And at the end, so once you have done that, you have to do the team debriefing, speak to the team, speak, uh, talk, uh, I mean, uh, check uh, what you have, what would, I, would I have done better and what went wrong and what are the things that we you do, did good. So complete you know, and always talk to the relatives and uh, deliver the message. Right. So any questions? Right. In the absence of any questions, uh, I would like to su summarize what I, I have taught. Your guys, uh, importance of the early high quality chest compressions, you need to uh, make sure that you are giving high quality chest compressions and to go for early defibrillation if it is indicators like in, in uh, shockable rhythms and detect and correct reversible causes of cardiac arrest. And last but not least, uh, the post resuscitation care. Yeah, there is a person who's Dr. Hanan Nahaman. Uh, she has a question. Last week I had to come across a drowning patient. So what is it? What's your question? Yeah. When I attended him, his pupils were already dilated and no heart sound. So in that case, I mean, should still resuscitate him. The thing is, I mean, when to stop resuscitation and uh, when not to resuscitate a patient, uh, not to, uh, resuscitation is a very debatable topic. But when you come across a patient who has a drowned, but you are because it's the absence of respiration and no central pulse and unresponsiveness is
Good morning, everyone. I think uh, Dr. Kanishka has finished his uh, lecture. Um, can I start my lecture? Yes, Dr. Rajan. I thought uh, Dr. Kanishka would introduce us. Right. Next up is Dr. Dhananjay Samanajeeva, uh, consultant emergency physician at uh, Kalutara, on the theme of uh, essential communication skills in ED. So, over to you, Dr. Kanishka. Thank you. Sorry, I got disconnected there. So, yeah, Kanaji can continue. So, then, ah, thank so. you. Okay, thank you. Right. Good morning and welcome you all. Okay. Can you see my screen? And can you yes. hear me? Yep, yep. Okay. Um, uh, this is little... Um, off topic uh, that was given to me this time. Uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, the Ministry of Health and the College of Emergency Physicians. Um, you've been going through whole day with loads of technical stuff. But uh, this will be the only lecture that you may be using your non-technical skills and which most Sri Lankan doctors are so lacking on this. So this has caused so much of problems, not because we don't work, not because we don't see patients, but of course it is just the communication gaps and the communication errors we do. Okay. So though I'm stressing this to the emergency department, of course emergencies can happen at anywhere. It could be in the ward, it could be in the clinic, it could be at your home, right? So these tools cannot be underestimated if you are working outside the emergency department. Okay, but particularly in the emergency department, why this is important? Because we're just wondering whether you want to see my ugly face. Right, okay, so why? <clears throat> This is important because we are working in a very complex environment, which including or which we are facing very high risk situation, right? So when the environment is very complex and we are <clears throat> dealing with uh, very unstable patients as well as very high risk situations, the things can go bad. So this is the place yeah, you can get things bad, though you do your technical stuff very correctly, right? So, <clears throat> but this communication, it's not a one-way business. It is not, it, it cannot be done by only one person, by changing yourself. This is not going to be effective. This should be a culture, right? So, uh, <clears throat> In Sri Lankan setup, we always, most of the time, we are very introverted. We don't talk very much. Right? Even when you ask a question, we are a bit reluctant to um, <clears throat> answer a question. Or even to ask a question, we are a bit reluctant. We will talk about it a little later. So um, this communication uh, culture should be uh, applied to the whole people. Not only one person can uh, change an environment. Okay, so what are the evidence? Right. So there was one study, um, but you can you can find a hell a lot of studies. But um, one Danish study. So they have uh, observed about forty four, just forty four verbal communications, and imagine how how much they found. The fifty two percent, nearly half of, or even more than half of, incidents had errors. So only half were went smoothly. What were they? There were errors in handovers. There were lots of misunderstandings. And there were lots of hesitancy to speak. You knew that this is not the, uh, not the point that we need to raise. But there was some hesitance in your team, in their team. So we cannot underestimate the communication gaps where the medical errors happens very much. Okay. To start with, how to be an effective communicator? So we all are professionals. So we need to respect each other. So the respect 
will build a good rapport and effective communication. And of course, we need to understand nobody is perfect, right? So that is the human nature. That's why we call it human errors. So everyone, everyone accept the humans can make errors, right? So the only thing is we need to understand we are humans and we make errors. So our culture is to not to be inhuman, but of course be a human and to change or to practice to minimize the human errors. Right? So that's why I was telling you again and again, this is a culture-based approach. So uh, though I'm taking a one cohort and just giving you this message, this should be disseminated to the entire culture or the entire team of your uh, department, right? So the respect and the safety is a prime importance in your department. Okay, the first concept is the closed loop communication. For example, you had this uh, last lecture by Dr. Kanishka regarding the advanced life support. This is one of the most critical um, clinical scenario that you all can come across because you know the patient is already dead. Oh, I wouldn't say dead, but of course they are not responding and their heart doesn't work, right? So this is the ultimatum that we will get with regard to a critical uh, patient, right? So this is the place where you need to apply the closed loop communication. So how is that? Okay, the team leader says, right, Tanuja, please give one milligram of one in 10,000 adrenaline IV, right? So you are telling Tanuja to give the adrenaline dose and the root, right? But the telling Tanuja doesn't mean that Tanuja heard it. Hearing of that command doesn't mean that the person or the Tanuja have understood. So the understanding doesn't mean that Tanuja has executed. So how do we know? So this is why we need to apply the closed loop communication because the environment where we work is so complex that there will be so many things happening simultaneously that the team leader or the clinical head cannot be concentrating on one thing. It is not kind of a ladder type of uh, management that is running at the ALS because you don't have time for that, right? So in the verbal loop communication, the verbal orders should be received and confirmed. So how do we know whether it is confirmed? That is by repeating that back to the originator. So if I said, Tanuja, one milligram IV adrenaline, one in 10,000, please. So then the Tanuja, what she does should do? So she get the adrenaline, she gives it, and she said, or at least before giving, okay, I have prepared one in 10,000, one milligram adrenaline, and now I'm going to give it uh, intravenous, right? So then she can give one in 10,000, one, millig one milligram IV given. Then the originator or the clinical head or the team leader knows that it has executed. Right? Sometimes the Tanujam, she's not sure about what is the root. So because of this tense situation, she may heard like it is I am. So the, what will Tanuja say? Okay, one in 10,000 IV, uh, sorry, one in 10,000, one milligram adrenaline I am. So when you apply this closed loop, then the team leader hears that, oh my God, Tanuja is going to give it IM. So then immediately the team leader can correct it. No, Tanuja, one in 10,000, one milligram IV adrenaline, please. Right? So then, uh, okay, sorry, IV given, right? So that is how you can prevent the errors. So this closed loop allowing the sender of message to ensure the recipient has received the correct information. Right? Because the Tanuja will be repeating the uh, command back to the originator. Then the originator knows whether she has understood and whether she is executing what the command the team leader has given. 
right? So <clears throat> this closed loop, there is a good opportunity to correct an error before it occurs, right? Because now you can say, Tanuja, it is not IM, it is IV, please, right? So then, oh, oh sorry, I will give IV. Otherwise, what will happen? So Tanuja have understood as it is IM and without making a noise, very obedient nurse in your department, keyword they are karna, seniors lucky in a data pitting yandana. So what she does is she heard as IM. So she give IM, which is completely wrong, which can affect on the outcome, right? But speaking up and closing the loop all the time, which will improve the patient outcome by minimizing the errors. Okay, the constructive intervention. So this is a nice looking term that of course, most of the time it doesn't happen. So the intervention should be constructive. So what is the opposite of constructive intervention? It's a destructive intervention. Either you don't intervene. So there are some situations that you need to intervene. Sometimes you may be a team leader. Sometimes you may be a team player, right? So now you have identified. Now the patient is in cardiac arrest. I'm, I'm taking all these examples with the ALS because you just had the, um, the lecture, right? So now you, you identified the patient. Now the patient's heart is not working or the patient is on the monitor. Now the monitor shows you a VF. But what the attending doctor and the nurse and the team, they have not realized, right? Or they don't know that it is a cardiac arrest. Sometimes what they do, they might getting an cannula, they might start oxygen, they might start a normal saline on that, they might be waiting to uh, get the bloods or the blood gas without starting chest compressions and arranging the defibrillator, right? So, in that case, this is the place you need to intervene. But there are different levels of intervention, right? You can't say, I said, Tamusela, I monad me karane me heart cardiac arrest, and a pisukel in a gun, no, which is compression there. So that approach is not going to help, right? That is why we say the constructive inter interventions should be done tactfully. How you how you overcome that situation? Sometimes more the most of the time you you may be a team player. Of course, if you are the team leader, you can say, guys, stop, start CPR. We have a cardiac arrest, and please, Tanuja, bring the uh, defibrillator. Right? I don't know there are Tanujas in this present uh, audience, but I'm just taking the name arbitrary, right? Um, uh, so. If you are a team leader, you have a bit of authority, right? So you can directly command your team, stop doing what you do. Start chest compressions, 30s to two, and uh, get the ambu bag and start 30s to two and chest compressions, bring the defibrillator attach and get it shocked immediately. Because you know now the patient is on cardiac arrest and he's having a VF rhythm, right? But what will happen? You are a team player and now you have a little senior doctor um, is not heading in the correct path. Sometimes you have seen, now the patient is having non-shockable rhythm, but the team is trying to shock the patient because they don't know the ALS algorithm. How do you overcome that situation? Of course, you need to intervene. The patient is having an unshockable rhythm, but now the team is going to intervene. Or the most, we will take the most commonly occurring thing, you, the patient is having non-shockable rhythm, but of course you give adrenaline every other cycle, but the team decide to give it each and every cycle adrenaline. Right now you know it's bad. Giving adrenaline in every two minutes is not going to help the patient, right? So what will be? Okay, guys, shall we do it every other cycle? I think we have given uh, adrenaline during the last shock. Now it's only two minutes. Shall we just continue CPR? Sometimes they might not listen to you, right? So they might still try to give adrenaline. So you can say, guys, sh shall we go back to the ALS algorithm and just refer it? So you know, most of the places you have this uh, ALS algorithm post, right? So you, you can show them, guys, now we were here, 
right so we have given adrenaline shall we withhold adrenaline and start chest compressions and continue chest compression right so still still the poor team lead and the rest of the team is trying to no 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 we have to give adrenaline so you might need to be little firm on that right so now is guys stop stop this is unsafe right i think we have to we have to withhold adrenaline and we'll continue chest compression because see there's no place for adrenaline in every cycle it is every other cycle so likewise you need to intervene but you cannot be disruptive right i will i will post a nice video right so it's in the chat box please don't go to the uh, the link now but of course later on you can go to the link and see how the constructive intervention is important how you can save a life right so this incidents um, is a wife of the pilot who is going for a routine surgery where there are very senior anesthetists uh, playing which is unable to get uh, or secure the airway ultimately uh, the patient gets a hypoxemic brain damage we are after analyzing it that the nurses have identified the real intervention to be needed but because of the reluctance to speak they keeping um, keeping their voice introverted because they were senior consultant i am a nurse who am i to talk so they bring the kit to do the front of neck access but they are a bit reluctant to suggest it to the team but of course it took about 30 minutes for the patient to get um, the airway or the awaken up by the time the patient's brain is dead right so this is a very nice video if you have a time please go through that video that has a lot of learning experience especially for the emergency department okay next is the situational awareness of course um, this is not directly a communication skill as per se but of course the situation awareness is very important for you to um, do the communication effectively so always as i said sorry as i said the emergency department is very complex and it's a very high risk environment right so you need to know what kind of a area what is going on around you so the situational awareness is basically the environment and the moment of an event right but not only that so it is about analysis of this analysis of the situation to understand the actions that will impact on the future of the event right so you know the patient is in cardiac arrest and now you are looking around you see some blood is coming through or the your the bed sheet is soaking with red right you didn't know why it is cardiac arrest because the patient got supine but there were some stabs at from your back side right so you don't know what is the reversible cause of course it's a hemorrhage but after some time you see your bed you know the patient's bed sheet is soaking with blood right so you anticipate now the next situation is the patient needs blood blood and blood right so identifying it you need to have a situational awareness for the situational awareness you need not only the patient's condition of course it's regarding your team and the department what facilities you have what are the competencies of your team who are the visitors who are coming it could be the trauma surgeon maybe in in your department who have arrived to do maybe a resuscitative thoracotomy or maybe uh, to take the patient to the theater immediately or maybe the anesthetist have arrived to uh, get the assessment what kind of a patient and the situation right so you may be having some other colleagues around you you may be having the patient's guardians on top of that there may be some other second victim is coming to your department who is a victim of another stab injury from the same story right so um, this is complexity you need to know as a overall that is um, knowing the situation 
you can communicate effectively because if you don't know what is going on with your patient what you have done so far and what you are planning to do in the next 2 minutes next 5 minutes and next 10 minutes you cannot co communicate effectively so um, as a skill developing um, the situational awareness is very important for you to do a effective communication right okay how to communicate with patients and relations this is very important very important especially with regard to the emergency medicine right so i don't know whether you guys are aware of the incidents at digana digana a young or a boy was i think boy or a baby i don't know um, was uh, presented to uh, sorry please hold on a second so the boy was presented with a seizure right and what has happened so the doctor came and seen the patient quickly and then uh, she thought this is a febrile seizure and uh, inserted a diazepam suppository and went back and um, did her usual work and after some time she has realized baby is little uh, sick and then uh, arranged the transport and by that time uh, patient was super sick and then later found out patient had a meningococcal septicemia right um, but the doctor at that time was so busy so she wasn't communicating with the team of course there are some lot of gaps with the technical issues as well identifying a critically ill child or uh, how to approach to a um, category 1 patient or a fitting child there are, there are all technical gaps but we will leave the technical gaps away and uh, we will uh, we will concentrate on the communication so the fam family got very angry because it's simply the approach of the doctor because though if this is a very advanced meningococcal septicemia though they have done the correct thing patient might die right so whether you have given penicillin at least intramuscular still patient might die right or the keftriaxone if you can't get iv access still the patient could die or get a severe coma morbidity right but it is just the approach just think about uh, that situation if you are falling into that situation how am i going to address me 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 api dostarala apita godak weda tiyenawa ogollo me enne pa patta pattakata vela inna babata hondata amaruy api karala de karala tiyenne karuna gal eliyata vela inna kila you put a suppository and uh, just leave it then the family sees that situation that I, i'm not saying that doctor has done uh, approach in that way but what i'm saying is the, take the incident just the incidents into your mind and uh, try to uh, go to uh, the situation if you are in that situation right so uh, just uh, imagine if you are the doctor you have tons of patients waiting in the opd to get some um, dexamethasone and um, diclofenac and you are getting this critically ill child how you tackle this situation this is very tricky right so i'm again saying so the patient who are coming to the research room they are mad they are sad they are bad sometimes you get a very bad drug addict who has taken methamphetamine or ice right Uh, and coming and very rude to you right some they will be clinically very exciting you know there will be significant metabolic acidosis there are some hypoxia some ecg changes weird ecg pattern that you have never seen and clinically frightening of course now the patient is just about to get a cardiac arrest young patient if it is a old co arch who is bed bound so it doesn't trigger you so much but of course a young patient very bizarre ecg highly abnormal blood gas right the low blood pressure saturation are dropping right it is very challenging right so they don't come alone 
they are coming with this in, intense family right they have this life, lifestyle drama drug addicts will come and have a separate drama there could be non accidental injuries right so um, these patients with a complex family or the guardian comes with a very clinically frightening um, condition so these are the things you need to focus when you are communicating with the patients or relations right so you should have the appropriate knowledge base right so if you are getting a fitting child what are the things you have to do of course unless proven otherwise you need to think the worst case for this baby right so of course this is a category 1 baby you need to stop the seizure as soon as possible you need to think about the worst case scenario that could be the meningococcal septicemia or a ruptured uh, aneurysm or a bleeding into a cerebral tumor those are the worst things that you can have right so um, aiming or the excluding the worst case scenario will save your day right so for that you need to have a appropriate knowledge and of course you have the positive attitude attitudes towards communicating right when you see a mad patient you will also get mad that is not the positive attitude if you see a notorious uh, drunken father who brings their child uh, uh, in a kotahalu mangalle where that child has fallen from the slab 10 feet the father is so drunk and come and cries and shout at you at the kotahalu mangalle they had a big party right so it is natural for you to get mad but being positive you need to tackle it uh, in a way that the things can be cannot be escalated further right so for that you need a range of behavioral skills right <clears throat> for that authenticity right so you should have this little authority right you 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 show your authority but of course at the same time you show their empathy right i know the father is drunk they had a party but that doesn't mean the father wanted her his child to be fallen from the slab right of course it's a very um, very stressful situation to a parent and of course that bugger got some alcohol on board right so have a little empathy on them right and have a little listening right i know you that drunken father will talk 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 from the very beginning where the how the child has raised but of course you don't have that much of time for you to listen because you need to resuscitate right of course once you resuscitate you need to arrange the further care so but little listening to the family and the respect to the family will will settle most of the things right so but never ever lose your authority you need to have authority but same time show them a little empathy and listen actively and respect their beliefs right but sometimes you need to draw a line but always being tactful is the key for the communication with the parents and sorry patients and the relations right using mnemonics i just wanted to tell you little few, uh, things about this mnemonics in the emergency department we uh, we frequently use mnemonics so first thing is um, at mist so the at mist is the age time of incidents mechanism injuries uh, and the signs and the treatment so that we use at mist uh, when we hand over or when we evaluate um, especially in trauma coached in als isba when we are handing over and so on so we can use uh, some mnemonics which we are common but mostly we are using the isba right isba is uh, we call it isba or isba isba introduction the situation background assessment and recommendation right so simply <clears throat> when we are handing over or when we are presenting a case we don't tell the situation first we think telling the situation will uh, will not be uh, a part of healthy com communication but it's wrong situation is the most important stem in your communication it is
um, present the budget today, right? So now you know, my God, things are not going to be <laughs> very uh, good for the next whole year, right? Because by just reading the topic, you know what is going on. Now you then um, it will come with you know uh, uh, Kalutara Mandalika Varta Karu. That is would be the introduction. I am the RHO from the respiratory ward. Uh, I am Dr. Ganajar, the RHO from the respiratory ward. So that is your introduction. And we have a patient who came with exacerbation of COPD. Um, that would be the situation, right? So you simply say the situation. Or I am the uh, I am Dr. Ganajar from the emergency department, and we have a patient who uh, was recovered or the got back from the cardiac arrest, right? So then you know the next person he knows what we are talking about. Ah, this is a um, patient who had a just just had a cardiac arrest, right? Or this patient who just uh, uh, treated for the snake bite, right? So we know what we are talking about. Otherwise, what we do say, oh, this is a 58-year-old female who get up at around 5 o'clock in the morning, went to the bathroom and got dressed and got into the bus uh, which came from the 520 from the Monaragala and stepped down from the uh, Mayangane at uh, 715 and where she felt little dizzy. So she went to the canteen and had a tea. Uh, while she's having a tea, she feels so very dizzy. So she went and bought a bun and she started eating the bun and where the bun was, she was eating the bun only, she get the chest pain where she started more sweating and then she started difficulty in breathing where she called the 1990 and the 1990 was brought the patient to the um, hospital where the she, uh, at the doorstep she was unresponsive and then blah, 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 blah. And then she had a cardiac arrest. We gave a CPR for 10 minutes and then. So then what will happen? The person who are next to the, uh, or the listener, he doesn't know what this bugger is talking about. Whether it's about uh, food allergy or whether it's about some sort of a stroke, whether some sort of a choking. And finally, you got to know now it's a may most probably MI who got a cardiac arrest, right? So telling the situation, we just uh, recovered this patient from cardiac arrest could be uh, due to a myocardial infarction. That is the situation. Then only you come to the background. He's a 52-year-old man with a past history of ischemic heart disease and hypertension who got this um, chest pain while eating and brought here and on admission uh, at the doorstep had a cardiac arrest. We started CPR and the downtime was about 10 minutes. And then comes to assessment. Right. So the assessment, now the patient is having spontaneous breathing, but not adequate. Patient was intubated. The blood pressure is maintaining with NORAD of uh, 0.1 mics. Um, and uh, the oxygenation is satisfactory. The patient, uh, the GCS is uh, uh, was 8 before intubation, but we have intubated because the thinking of uh, the breathing issues and the, uh, the patient's conscious level. And uh, now the patient is about to go to the cath lab or the patient has been thrombolized uh, with uh, more than 50% resolution, right? And the recommendation is now you are handing over this patient to the ICU and I would like you to take over this patient or you are sending the patient to CCU. Uh, please take over this patient for SQPCI, right? So that's how you do the ISBA communication. So always keep your mind on the um, the tool or the standard way of communicating which will be effective. So recommendation, of course, you need to do a bit tactfully. Uh, it should not be a commanding, but technically you need to tell what you are suggesting, right? What is in your mind? Otherwise, you will say, okay, wh what do you want me to do? The cardiologist will come and say, what do you want me to do, right? So rather than telling, of course, he can, he can modify but should not be uh, left over with the recommendation. Teamwork is very important. Of course, the teamwork 
the part of the teamwork is the effective communication. I think we have talked quite a lot about the communication. Um, any question? If you have any question, you can post it on the chat box. Uh, thank you. There's a question, uh, sir, what will happen if we give shock to non-shockable rhythm? Okay, so nothing will happen, but giving shocks, uh, there are two detrimental things. One thing, it will buy time unnecessarily. And giving shock, of course, will damage little myocardia. And we know non-shockable rhythms, there is a reason. It is not due to the arrhythmia itself that causing there could be uh, maybe um, if you get 4Hs and 40s, maybe the patient is hypovolemic, uh, patient has exsanguinated. So it is not going to help the patient, but of course it will burn at least a little bit of your myocardial, right? So uh, if... If it is a shockable rhythm, it will it will, it will attempt to revert it to a perfusing rhythm. So, uh, shocks are the treatment for the shockable rhythms. If you are giving it for the non-shockable rhythm, like you are giving antibiotics to a viral infection, where you can cause allergies and you can cause some nephrotoxicities, right? All these things without a benefit. So how many cycles of shock can be given to the patient and how long do we do CPR before we stop it? I was just wondering whether it has been discussed. You can give shocks as, as long as you see a shockable rhythm, right? But of course, uh, if it is persisting, you need to look why it is. Mainly, of course, for the shockable rhythm, the treatment is shock. But you need to same time look for the reversible causes. If it is a hypothermia, sometimes giving shocks will not revert your um, rhythm. Right? In that case, you may have to do the active warming at least to 35 degrees. I, I exactly can't remember the guideline now, uh, but until you get this temperature to a desired level, how much you give shocks will not revert it. Right? Initially, you can give one or two shocks, but afterwards, look for the reversible causes that cause this shock resistant VT or VF. Right? In that case, very rarely hypothermia. It could be electrolyte imbalance, right? It could be a toxic substance, maybe a sodium channel blocker that you need to give loads and loads of sodium bicarbonate. So that is antidote, right? So um, one thing is the uh, reversing, a reversible cause for cardiac arrest. The other thing is you can try amiodarone, right? Initial 300 and if still not 150, but of course you can continue to give shocks until you succeed or until the patient goes into a non-shockable rhythm. Stopping CPR is a complex topic that is situational, but of course, if it is non-shockable rhythm that you have tried for 20 minutes, uh, that is something that you can think of calling off the uh, CPR, but uh, it, it is not simple as I said in two lines. Uh, you need to, uh, you, it, it's a separate topic. You can read about it um, in the internet. Uh, this is about actually uh, the last topic. Uh, do we need to resuscitate a drowned one brought after some time without any signs of life? I think it's always better to start. What they say is after some times means the poor fellow has drowned last night and the body was recovered this morning. Of course, it's a putrefied or kimula kala or the mora kala, or the, then no point. Obviously, you know. But of course, if it is unclear, it's always worth giving a try. Because there were incidents, even after one hour, 
they have a good neurological outcome but even after 5 minutes they have a poor outcome so i can't tell you or nobody can tell you when to start or when to stop but giving a try would be ideal because most of the time the drowning cases are very young podi baba lena was gedara swimming pool eke wetla tindala amma ta hu vela right of course you don't feel like giving up oh na 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 meya godak kala ne api dannet na meya pochchara watura hitiya da me meya awanan karanna ba you cannot do that right but of course it's still worth always um trying right you can't give a time gap but if there is a rigomotis or if it it is putrified ob- obviously you will not right but otherwise always giving a chance is is uh, justified how many uh, so is abg is out of practice so vbg is a new norm um yes there are instances that you need abg but of course the you can correlate what is happening in the abg with the vbg right uh, there are nice articles if you go through the life in the fast lane dot com um, um, and maybe em crit i am sure there are some articles you can go through it's a it's a burden to do a arterial blood gas uh, especially a patient who is critically ill so in the emergency department now uh, it is little out of fashion for you to do arterial blood gas but specifically sometimes we do if we want to calculate the pao2 uh, and so on right uh, or if you want to exactly tell the carbon dioxide but of course uh, there is a little gap right uh, we all know it's little high on the vbg but of course having a pco2 of 60 70 80 100 is always abnormal then we don't have to do uh, arterial blood gas to tell what is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the uh, arterial system right uh, and of course the ph there's slight difference and of course we have the saturation which we can always go along with the saturation right and we can correlate with the uh, saturation and the pao2 right you know the hemoglobin dissociation curve but in extreme situation no harm doing it for example in the meth hemoglobinemia or there is some such you think there is some saturation and uh, appearance gap you see the patient is very cyanotic but you have the saturation of 100 or you are getting so much of uh, oxygen you don't hear a lung signs but the saturation is very low and the patient is cyanosed of course yes you can do a abg but it is out of fashion uh okay okay the time is running so fast i'm taking other presenters time very much uh, can i introduce dr manohari she is the consultant emergency physician at the national hospital of sri lanka uh, manohari are you there yeah i am but i thought they would have a break for like 15 minutes break before this that's what they that's what in the oh. schedule Ah, is it? Break is over, I suppose. Uh, break is also over. <laughs> three minutes. I, I don't have know. Taken their I had the break. Minutes. So, uh, so should I continue? Is okay. 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 So, uh, next up is by Dr. Manohari. Uh, sorry, uh, Manohari Liangi on child emergency physician at NHS Sir Kalam. Right. Over to you, Dr. Manohari. Can you hear, Dr. Manohar? Yep. Yes. Okay. So, good morning to you all. Uh, I'm Manohar Liyanagay, uh, consultant in the emergency physician. Uh, it's very nice to see you all in this forum, and thank you very much for the introduction as well. So. let me share the screen first can you see this screen yes okay yeah so full screen today, oh, okay. yes okay. yeah today we are going to talk about sick child sick child in the sense the purpose of this topic is to discuss how to approach um when we see a sick or seriously ill child in your department so i'm going to talk on 
poured into the following flow. So we are going through a case scenario and while uh, reweaving our case, we are going to discuss about advanced pediatric life support. And then I'm going to introduce, introduce and structured approach to seriously managing how to manage and uh, see, manage a seriously ill child according to a structured approach. So this is not new. If you have done APL advanced pediatric life support course or have, if you have done pediatric appointments, but I think this is the basic uh, way we should stick to when we are managing a sick child and it will be uh, it will it will be a universal approach to any sick child with minor deviations so let's uh, start our uh, case i want all of you to imagine that you have reported to a base hospital as a sho just yesterday and today is your night shift in the ETU. This happens quite often, even though you are very new, you can be appointed as a uh, on-call doctor or ETU doctor on the very next day. And you are the only doctor in this premises. You are a ba this, even though this is a base hospital, usually type B base hospitals in some areas of the country, you have only one doctor at night and you are looking after the ETU and the boards as well. And you have a, you're fortunate you have a pediatrician resides 20 minutes away from the hospital and your referring hospital is 45 minutes away. So I hope you have absorbed the case. So you are in the ETU and everything looks under control till around 10 p.m. at night and you feel very happy and satisfied because you have just able to manage and, and or thrombolize an anterior ST elevation MI and you have transferred the patient to a nearest hospital in the referring center. And then you see one of the nurses at the front desk of your ETU is rushing in with the mother carrying a child. And you, she's asking you to see the child immediately. So this is your child, a four year old girl, few for three days, not herself since yesterday, according to the mother, and very quiet since today morning. Mother has been at work and that's all she can tell you about the child. She doesn't know whether she has eaten or drink, drank anything. And mother is keeping the child on the bed and you notice this child is abnormally quiet. So this is 10 p.m. at night. You are unsure whether this child is seriously sick or whether this child is sleeping. So what should you do? We should give the benefit of doubt to the patient. So we should consider this child is a seriously sick child until proven otherwise if the child is very quiet and not do making much movements. So what should we do next? So we should do some basic calculations. If you have not already heard about this mnemonic, you see we call it wet flag. This is a very handy and useful one. So it's about how to calculate weight and energy for depreciation if needed, or intubation tube diameter, fluid, lorazepam, or midazolam, in our context, adrenaline and glucose if needed. So you do these basic calculations if you when you are approaching to a sick child. So if you are not sure about the doses and all, you don't have to worry. You no one can remember, especially even if they remember when they are. Um, really panicking or when, the, when they are really nervous, sometimes you can't uh, remember those. So you don't have to worry, you use your smartphone uh, and try to find these calculations using an app or you can have a, a Brussel tape or sandal or some sort of document which carries the drug doses and weight according to the child's age in your pocket or in your phone wherever so this would be a very thoughtful thing to do if you are appointed going to work in an etu where you see children or oh, in a ward so then how should we proceed so we should immediately think about advanced pediatrics life support this child is seriously sick so what does this child need is advanced pediatric life support so first thing in the advanced pediatric life support, when you are the only person, uh, you should call for help. So who would come for your help? So your pediatrician, other doctors, 
anesthetist intensivist depending on the patient's condition and ENT specialist depending on the patient condition and if available or and the other nursing and minor staff so other staff and the paramedic patients people sometimes so this is the structured approach to pediatric emergencies this is a algorithm or flow chart so it consists of primary assessment resuscitation secondary assessment and looking for key features emergency treatment detailed review focusing on the systemic control and continuum was stabilization and transfer to a definitive care it should be your tertiary hospital it should be your could be your pediatric code or could be the icu if you have one so you all know primary assessment consists of good old a b c d e so i heard kanishka talking about this uh, resuscitation steps in detail and um, we have only slight differences in pediatric uh, population so we always look for airway patency and while looking for airway patency we are looking for chest rise abdominal movements and listening for breath sounds and feeling for expired air and also we are looking here listening for presence of strido and looking for evidence of recessions so if the child is crying and if the child is having a loud cry or if the child is talking we are quite happy because very sick children couldn't make a strong cry so and we know ARV is fatal so if we have identified the difficult or um, like compromised ARV what should we do so we should make do something to open up this ARV so how are we going to open up so how we have to maintain head in neutral position open the ARV and clear the ARV and use ARV adjuncts and if failing we have to go for tracheal intubations so this is how we are doing chin lift and jaw thrust in children it is different to the adult population uh, in when because we have always make sure we uh, cater our technical child's age and also only to touch from the, like uh, use the bony prominences of the child's face otherwise you will cause soft tissue damage and the positioning you might need uh, if the child is very small you might read a, a user rolled pillow or sorry rolled towel on the child's uh, shoulder blades or if the child is uh, closer to adolescence or adult age you might use a rolled towel under the child's um, occiput so but may, your primary aim is to maintain head in the neutral position you can ramp up that is another technique uh, trying to achieve uh, a parallel line between the uh, external auditory meatus and the suprasternal notch and you can use airway adjuncts i'm not going to you talk about this in detail you know how to size only thing we have to make sure is to uh, use the appropriate sides to the child and insert the concave side down using a tongue depressor aiming not to damage soft tissues of the uh, child's uh, oral cavity and this is nasopharyngeal airway and then while after securing the airway we are moving to breathing b so we look at three e's in breathing effort efficacy and effect of respiratory adequacy or inadequacy so effort would uh, be indicated by respiratory rate whether the child is having decisions or inspiratory or expiratory noises grunting whether the child is using accessory muscles or whether there is flaring of nostrils like here it's a very subtle thing that you can observe or whether the child is gasping for breathing efficacy would be shown if the child is having adequate chest expansion or if you can hear breath sounds in auscultation and the pulse oximetry saturation and effects of respiratory inadequacy at inadequacy would be shown by the heart rate skin color and mental state so child could be drowsy if the oxygen oxygen is not reaching the child's lungs and the brain so if the breathing is not adequate you have to resuscitate so we will always give high flow oxygen 15 liter per minute with the face mask and a reservoir bag and you should size the face mask not to cover nose and the mouth but not to cover the eyes and you should always use the adequate mask and the self inflating bag and make sure you have good oxygen connection uh, to the system 
failing that you go for uh, intubate if failing that you have to go for intubation and intermittent positive pressure ventilation and these are the uh, equipments we use to maintain uh, breathing and this is C and E technique of holding a face mask. Then we move to C. So what are we assessing in the circulation? We assess the heart rate, pulse volume, very important capillary refill time and blood pressure. So capillary refill time, time should be assessed in the center of the chest over the sternum. You press for 1 in 1000, 2 in 1000, 3 in 1000, 4 in 1000, 5 in 1000 and the blood pressure. And there would be telltale signs of inadequacy of uh, circulation. The child would have rapid breathing or respiratory rate. And the skin would be mottled like this or cold to touch, especially the extremities, toes and the uh, fingers. And they would be agitated or they would be drowsy if they're too lack of low in oxygen concentration in their blood. And their urine output would be reduced. And if they are hypovolemic also, they, they, even though they have a good uh, functioning uh, respiratory system, there's no way they can take uh, the carry this oxygen to the uh, vital organs, so they would show drowsiness. And cardiac failure. We have to look for signs of cardiac failure as well in children. It's lucky if the parents are presenting with uh, a history of previous cardiac illnesses, his, oh, congenital heart disease. Otherwise, you have to look for cyanosis, which is not correcting with oxygen therapy, or tachycardia out of proportion to the respiratory difficulty, or raised jugular venous pressure, gallop rhythm, or a murmur in auscultation, enlarged liver, or absent femoral pulses. I'm doing in a little bit uh, of a rush because I need to uh, come go through a few uh, slides. So I think it's important to cover all of this. So if I'm too fast, just tell me, let me know. So how are we going to sustain the circulation? So we definitely need, if possible, two large bow cannulae, large bow in the sense compared to the child's age and the size. And then failing that, and you have to, if you have IV access, you are lucky, then you have to take urgent blood samples. Uh, glucose is paramount and a culture. If, the, if you can get only few drops, I would do a glucose and a culture. If you have more, you can do a VBG. And in addition, you can do food account and other necessary investigations. But glucose and a culture is the must in a child. Blood culture. And then you, if failing that, you have to go for intraosseous access. It's, if you are having an intraosseous gun in your um, ETU or in your ward, you are lucky. It's very user friendly and handy and easy to use. And by failing that, you can use a large bone needle and cry. Somehow you have to get a good intravenous access to do the resuscitation. So immediate volume resuscitation would be using 0.9% saline, 20 mL per kg as a bolus, except in three situations. So keep this in mind. If you're suspecting dengue, if you're suspecting diabetic ketoacidosis, or if you're suspecting trauma, your volume would be 10 mL per kg. Otherwise, every other child presenting with shock, you would use 20 mL per kg boluses. And you have to repeat the boluses if necessary. So disability, then we move to D, primary assessment. So easy way is it just says the Glasgow Coma Scale, A, V, P, U. We say A for alert, if the child is alert. If child is responding to voice, it's V. Responding to only to pain, it's P. Unresponsive to or stimuli, it is U. And posture and pupils. So if you see these two postures, we are worried. So it's decorticate rigidity and uh, decerebrate rigidity, which will indicate a very low level of consciousness. And how are we going to resuscitate the disability? So if your airway is compromised due to low GCS, you have to consider intubation early. If hypoglycemic, you have to treat with two mils per kg of 10% glucose or dextrose, followed by repeat uh, infusions if necessary. And if the child is ceasing, you have to consider giving a benzodiazepine according to the body weight. If the child is having a trauma and you are suspecting raised intracranial pressure with other signs of uh, raised intracranial pressure, you have to go for three to five mils of 
3% or 7% saline. We call them hypertonic saline. And exposure. Don't forget to expose the child fully and keep sure you should cover the child adequately afterwards to prevent them going to hypothermia as well. So you have to check for temperature and you should look for rashes and bruising and other telltale signs of the source of infection or the culprit or the probable diagnosis. So before going to secondary assessment, I'm going to give some parameters about our child, the four-year-old girl we saw earlier in this presentation. So this child's you airway, you think is fairly all right at the moment. There are no secretions, no added sounds. It's, this child is very quiet. That's the only concern. So you put some high flow oxygen and then the B. So you think your child is four years of age, the respiratory rate is 40 per minute. And you can't see any recession or anything. And you move, the chest auscultation is clear. And you move to C and the uh, circulation is very compromised, you think, because heart rate is 130, capillary refill time is three seconds. And sorry, and uh, blood pressure is 70 by 40. This is a four year old child and mother has no clue about the urine output. And saturation? No oh, saturation, of course, 92% on room air and goes up to 98 with 15 liter oxygen via non the mask. So what would be your possible differential diagnosis? Please use the chat box to uh, indicate possible differential diagnosis. So secondary assessment. So secondary assessment would be focused history and examination and investigation. We have to uh, justify our investigations uh, during this phase. So secondary assessment would be giving going into details about systemic assess like the each system. So we have to cover the respiratory system, you have to cover the um, circulatory system, you have to cover the gastrointestinal system and just for a few examples of the symptoms you have to worry in respiratory system or ask about uh, in respiratory system is breathlessness, coriza, cough, noise breathing, drooling, inability to drink, have no pain, chest pain, apnea, and other feeding difficulties, and hoarseness from the mother. And the signs, you have to look for cyanosis, tachypnea. So I'm not going into detail because you have gone through this during your medical school. So investigations. So if the US, your child is having asthma, you have to try to get a peak flow if possible. If not, forget about it if you don't have facilities. Uh, blood culture is a must. Chest X-ray selective depending on the patient's thing, uh, situation and blood gas, not necessarily arterial blood gas, but venous blood gas if you have facilities. So we are going to cover a few emergency treatments. Um, the common presentations and the severe or fatal could be fatal presentations and could be difficult to manage presentations. So this is not a full list, but few. So how are we going to manage a severe croup? So let me see whether I have, yes, very good. We have one um, uh, uh, list of differential diagnosis, anaphylactic shock, sepsis, very good, yes. If you have, I would um, really encourage you to uh, like other people also to come with some differential diagnosis. Doesn't matter, uh, Just we are just trying to sort out this child. Doesn't matter, they are not uh, very, um, yeah, dengue hemorrhagic fever, yeah, septic shock, yes. Okay, I'll come to that later. So severe croup, how are we going to manage severe croup causing upper airway obstruction? The main stay of treatment is dexamethasone or steroids. Mind you, you should keep child calm and should not compromise the airway by agitating the child. So what should we do? We should use some safe way to get an IV access if the child is not able to tolerate oral medications. So the in severe croup causing airway obstruction, the dose of dexamethasone would be 0.6 milligram per kg. This is a recommended dose. Otherwise, you can use 0.15 to 0.3 milligram per kg in croup. And you can use nebulized adrenaline. Relatively, child, children uh, tolerate nebulizations relatively all right. 
compared to IV access and you have to get ready for intubation if medical treatment fails. So then epiglottitis or bacterial tracheitis. Epiglottitis and tracheal bacterial tracheitis are two common diagnoses, two sorry, two different diagnoses, and they are not common because of the widespread uh, immunizations. Epi, uh, epiglottitis is hemophilus influenza B. Epiglottitis is not common, but you can have hemo other hemophilus influenza type epiglottitis. I've seen um, a couple. And you can have bacterial tracheitis. So, how would you manage a child if you're suspecting epiglottitis or tracheitis? So, main body is the airway compromise. So, you have to organize intubation, preferred by your senior anesthetist, preferably in the theater. And you should not mm, disturb the airway by any unpleasant or frightening interventions. And once the airway is secured, you can give intravenous anti broad, broad spectrum antibiotics. Could be kefotaxim, could be kefraxone, could be augmented. And then, how are we managing a foreign body in the airway? This is very common, especially in toddlers. You might not have a clear history, but the onset of history would be sudden, and you might hear um, a strido or a respiratory noises. And sometimes you might not hear any breath sounds in one lung. So we have a special algorithm called choking child algorithm. So this is it. So we assess the child if the cough is ineffective. So we, if the child is conscious, you give five black bows and five chest or oh, abnormal trust alternatively depending on child's age and assess and repeat. If the child is unconscious, it's just a cardiac arrest algorithm. And if the child has effective cough, you encourage coughing until child lose the consciousness all the foreign body comes out. So this is the way how you give back blows and this is how you go give chest thrust. And anaphylaxis, the other possible life-threatening pediatric emergency could be very subtle or difficult to identify in presentation. So child could have obvious face, swelling of the uh, face and tongue or obvious rash, but sometimes we might not have any clue of this. So the child would be hemodynamically compromised. So the treatment would be IM adrenaline, repeated doses until the child improves hemodynamically. We can support the hemodynamics with uh, boluses of IV normal saline. And also you can use oxygen and adrenaline nebula, oxygen 15 liter per minute via, via uh, non with the mass or adrenaline nebulizations to support the breathing. Sometimes you might use salvitomal nebulizations if there is wheezing. So it depends on your child. But the mainstay of treatment, adrenaline, IM, again and again is adrenaline, IM. So acute severe asthma, this is common. If you do not treat asthma, moderate asthma early, they can turn to acute severe asthma or life-threatening asthma. So mainstay of treatment is oxygen and then inhale salbutamol and inhale iprotropin bromide. Not ne necessarily nebulizations. If the child can use uh, meter dose inhalers, they can use inhalers with the spacer device. So, and sorry, you should give early steroids and then second light treatment like magnesium sulfate and IV salbutamol. So infants with Vs and respiratory district, distress are likely to have bronchiolitis, not asthma. In infancy, it's very likely it's bronchiolitis rather than asthma. So you only require oxygen if hypoxic and you might need high, high flow nasal oxygen if the humidified oxygen, if the child's work of breathing is very high and child is exhaust, like exhausting him or herself. Otherwise, you don't need salbutamol or other nebulizations and steroid has no place in bronchiolitis. So diabetic ketoacidosis. So you would identify this by doing a blood sugar, finger, finger prick blood sugar. And I'm not going to go into details of diabetic ketoacidosis management. It has a separate guideline and an algorithm, but the mainstay is uh, fluid and insulin. 
So cardiac arrest management, we are not going to talk about this in detail because I heard Kanishka explain it very well. There are subtle differences, so I'm going to highlight those differences. So we have to give, once you open up the airway and you once you identify the child is in cardiac arrest and once you open up the airway, you have to give five rescue breaths before commencing chest compressions. And then you wait 10 seconds maximum to look for signs of life. If the child is still in cardiac arrest, you start chest compressions, 15 chest compressions to two ventilations, unless the child, this is a neonate. So what is the rate in neonate? So it's three chest compressions to one ventilatory breath in neonates in children, 15 chest compressions to two ventilatory breaths. And there are three uh, various ways of giving chest compressions according to a child's age. You can, if the child is an infant, you can use finger, two finger technique or encircling technique as shown in the pictures. Or if this is a child reasonable with reasonable weight, you can or size age, you can use one handed chest compressions or if child is almost an adult, you can use a two-handed chest compression technique. That's the only difference. And the drug doses, of course, you have to calculate according to the body weight. So why are we talking about these uh, children separately? Why is this? A, why, you had a lot of lectures about resuscitation. Why are we talking about resuscitating a sick child separately because there are few important facts to keep in mind when we are thinking of us children. Children have lower physiological reserve. So as a result, they deteriorate very rapidly once they start to deteriorate. You don't have much time, so you have to act early. And they, came, they come in a range of sizes, needing constant adjustment of interventions, equipments or consumables to size, suit the, or uh, match the size of the child. And observations on children must be related to their age. And cardiac arrest is more commonly due to hypoxemia or shock rather than a cardiac cause. Very rarely a child would have a cardiac arrest due to a cardiac cause is there not like in adults. And they need to provide psychological support. Uh, you need to provide psychological support to the parents or the carers as well. They are very distressed. So, and the, just like Ganaja mentioned, we have to pay an extra attention when we are communicating with parents or carers of the seriously ill child. Information and when we are communicating the history from the child also, we should keep in our mind they won't come up with the history. Most of the children when they are frightened they will just keep quiet. So they won't talk. So what you have to do is to you have to gather information or glean information from many nonverbal clues like facial expression, posture, the way they behave and fear causes additional distress resulting raised physiological parameters such as pulse rate and respirate. So we have to talk to them, try to calm them and explain what is happening around them before interpreting the parameters if the child is reasonably alert and active. If the child is very sick and drowsy and almost comatose, that won't help that much. So knowledge allays fear and it is important to explain things as clearly as possible to the child as well as to the parents. You should talk to child. If a child might be four years of age, they might, but they might be more knowledgeable than you think. And especially the young adults and adolescents, they are quite like to know what is happening to them and they have their own will about the things and own opinions about the things. So please talk to them and explain to 
them what is going to happen within next couple of minutes. Take your time for communication. So that's all about how to manage a seriously ill child or sick child. Hope you have understood what I have, I wanted to convey. So when you're managing us in like, not only pediatric population, any uh, seriously ill patient, use an app that will show, give you guidelines, drug doses, the treatment like steps or the algorithm. So I usually use the Royal Children's uh, Hospital Melbourne guideline, which I'm used to use for quite a few years. And this is the summary. So we are end, going to end our talk and then we'll spend a couple of minutes to discuss our uh, patient, just a few minutes. So the summary would be the structured approach to manage a sick child. We would divide this into three immediate focus and detailed review steps, three steps, immediate, focused and detailed review. So in immediate, we are assessing the child uh, responsiveness and then we go for primary assessment and or primary survey and then we research the child and then reassess. Once the child is reasonably resuscitated, we are going for secondary assessment and try to look for possible other signs or telltale signs and symptoms of the possible diagnosis and then we treat them and then we do a detailed systemic review focusing on the system control and we continue stabilization. And then we continue care and we need to plan the disposition. With, is the child going to go to the pediatric ward? Is this child going to stay, stay in ETU for a couple of hours? Or is this child go ICU or the teaching hospital, which is 45 minutes away, or depending on your location. So these are the references I've used. So, so yes, we we'll talk about no more differential diagnosis in our list. So in our chat group box, so that's all right. So we have now anaphylactic shock, sepsis, dengue hemorrhagic fever, and septic shock. So very good. So most likely, according to the history, so this child is in shock definitely. So we have to resuscitate this child circulation. So we are going to give fluid bolus. So depending, yeah, I agree. Dengue hemorrhagic fever is a possibility depending on the like prevalence of the dengue in the area and the time of the year. If you suspect, please give 10 mils per kg boluses. If not, if it's a, like it's unlikely, if you're suspecting septic shock, give 20 mils per kg boluses. And then there would be, you would not cause any harm giving an early dose of broad spectrum antibiotic. So in the systemic secondary or secondary assessment of this child, mother is coming with the history of sore throat for a couple of days prior to the illness and reduced oral intake due to the sore throat and muffling or reduce the changing of the voice for two days prior to hospital present, like last two days. So this would take you to a possible diagnosis of a throat infection. So what are the possibilities? Could this be a um, bacterial tracheitis? This is four year old child unlikely to be crew. Could this and the lungs, given the lungs clear, it's not a respiratory infection. So could this be an epiglottitis? So you have to ask whether this child is vaccinated. So mother says yes, this child is vaccinated. There could be unvaccinated child in the community, children in the community. So mother says yes. So what are we thinking? You don't know what it is. So you look at the airway. This child airway is not compromised. It didn't show any signs of obvious compromisation of the airway other than Le, le, low GCS, so this child is not very alert, child is only responsive to voice. So you decided to give high flow oxygen, you get, get a IV access, take blood for sugar, sugar is alright, and then you give a, a fluid bolus. So you think dengue is unlikely given the history of sore throat um, and difficulty in solving, you think this could be a, some upper airway infection and you decided to give a 
fluid bolus of 20 mils per kg and then you give a broad spectrum antibiotic. So that's all you have to do at your level and you continue the resuscitation, continuous observation of the hemodynamic parameters and support the child and try to get a focused history and arrange a disposition until your pediatrician arrived. Mind you, I told you, you, your pediatrician lives 20 minutes away, so he's the more senior person who is capable of looking after this child. You Once you, once you decide this child is sick, it's not looking good, you immediately give a call to your pediatrician and ask for his help, and then you start your resuscitation. And then you continue the resuscitation and reassessment until your pediatrician arrives. If the child is deteriorating, then you have to act accordingly. I think at your level, at our, like basic, um, it's not, I'm not saying it's a basic medical management, but a basic resuscitation management that we have to do. Continue our patient's care until we get the senior help. So even me, if I can't manage some conditions, but that's what I would do. I'm not I'm capable of managing all the conditions which I would be presented with. So I would continue the care and reassess and look for any uh, other clues of a, any other possible diagnosis. So that's what I would do. Okay. So that concludes my lecture. So do you have any questions? If you don't have any questions, I would like to thank all of you for listening to this lecture. I did it a little bit fast thinking of the time and I hope this will convey the importance of having a structured approach to manage a sick child. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And our next speaker would be Dr. Chamara Bedugodarachi. He is a young an energetic emergency physician who works at the moment in Nigamu Base Hospital. He has a very bright future in front of him and he would talk to you about how to manage a patient presenting with chest pain. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much Manohari for that uh, very kind and Nice introduction. I'm very proud to have that introduction. So we'll start. Actually, this uh, lecture was originally supposed to be delivered by Dr. Nandana. So since uh, he's not available to, I will be doing this lecture. So I will share my screen. Let's start. So, right, so I have 30 minutes to do this lecture. So approach chest pain in emergency department. And if you have any problem with my signal strength, please talk and let me know that there's no, if there's any interruption up to the uh, voice or the, the video quality. And uh, the topic given to me is the approach to chest pain in emergency department. And uh, to be delivered this lecture in 30 minutes is almost impossible, but I will try my best to do this, right? And um, chest pain is important because it's common. So I'm not going to go into very fine, fine, fine details of this lecture, but I will just tell you it is common. So once you are posted as post interns to the some hospitals, you may be looking after sick patients in the emergency setup. That means ETUs, PCUs, or accident services, so accidents and emergency services, which has been putting up everywhere in the island now. And you might be working as some doctors in wards. So wherever you work, emergency is an emergency. So there should be some kind of structural approach and some emergency-oriented thinking pattern for you to identify acutely 
life threatening conditions and to do proper treatment for those patients so wherever you work maybe in a medical setup or maybe in a uh, emergency setup or ward setup chest pain is common in sri lanka and in other countries as well the other problem is we have to worry about chest pain because it can be the cause of most benign to the most fatal pathology and you can't differentiate these fatal to benign pathologies from just history alone just examination alone or just investigation alone so you have to think collectively and most of the time you think chest pain means mi if there is no mi no chest pain if there is chest pain uh, chest pain there should be an mi or it should not be so the only thing we think about is myocardial infarction or acute congress syndrome but you have to know that chest pain can be the symptoms of many pathologies many organs in the chest or abdomen or nearby structures or it can be as i mentioned differed from most benign to the fatal thing so in emergency setup some patients you admit some patients you discharge so you have to make sure that you discharge appropriate patients and you admit appropriate patient then you attend immediately to appropriate patient so that is the basic introduction so i can't go into many details of these statistics of the uk but basically what you need know, it's common and you can't differentiate it's hard to differentiate and the atypical presentations are typical so that from one symptom alone you can't say this chest pain is due to this let's see how it's fine causes as i mentioned there are causes for chest pain which are imminent life threatening so you have to act immediately you can't wait and there are some other causes which are not that immediate life threatening but that has some specific management so you have to start that and you have to uh, do ongoing management of that patient so you can't send that patient home and there are some other category in the middle benign pathology costochondritis gort or gastritis so you can just identify that and make sure there are no missed nasty pathologies and um, safely discharge the patient right so if you ask me what is the most difficult thing i would say this mid middle category is the most difficult thing, to identify that there is nothing wrong and send them home at the same time next it's very important to identify immediately so which which th those patient can die within next seconds to minutes so you have to act fast right so out of those pathologies so if you categorize this um, pathologies according to the most life threatening and non -life, that life threatening non urgent and urgent there are causes which can be be given by cardiovascular causes pulmonary causes musculoskeletal causes gastrointestinal causes or other causes so let's think about these things separately even though i will not be able to discuss with about all these conditions but at least if we can discuss about these bad six big six of acute life life threatening conditions of chest pain you can do something right and then at the same time in your future you will learn more about the urgent causes you will learn about non urgent causes as well right let's see assessment of the chest pain fine now uh, you have had couple of uh, lectures now and then you are just about to have your lunch break you must be a little bit sleepy and uh, if you want to sleep just listen to this slide so just look at this slide listen to this slide and sleep and uh, this most important like important slide i just want to tell you the other slides are also important but this is the most important slide assessment of chest pain i think probably you must have had couple of lectures now which highlight about the structured approach for an emergency patient or an urgent patient i'm highlighting the same thing again structured approach not to miss anything bad chest pain just 
we have to do the initial sterilization then we have to do once the patient is stabilized we have to go for the direct and history and examination and then we have to do some risk is a new word for you probably but if i tell you about a couple of examples you will get to know that is not that uncommon because you know about that right so what is the risk assessment what are the appropriate investigations and then what is the definition management for each and every thing that's what you need to think even though we are not covering everything you have to know about what are the definition management and then what is on going care how we are going to dispose let's see how we are doing this each and every step in detail initial stabilization how we do that this is called the blueprint right so any patient any acutely ill sick patient comes to you maybe to the emergency department if you don't have a functioning emergency department in the board set up you need to identify this patient is ill sick acutely life threatening that is called triage so you have to identify which patient no we needs to be addressed first immediately and then we who are the patient which can be addressed little bit later after addressing the immediate life threatening condition so that is called triage in basic terms so it has a nice definition but i don't want to tell about it triage means that so if the patient coming with chest pain definitely the patient is in high priority basically it's category 2 if the hemodynamics everything is normal just chest pain itself is a category 2 that means you have to attend at least within 10 minutes unless all the parameters are stable so you have to get them to a resuscitation bed or a monitor bed in your ward not to the floor not to the uh, wounds area that patient has to be in a monitored place right and then what is initial stabilization you have to think whether this patient is stable or not right and then so first thing chest pain patient coming with hemodynamic compromise blood pressure 80 by 60 you don't prop that patient you have to pay, lie that patient down and sometimes you have to put to a legs up assume some patient one of one of the other patient comes with chest pain difficult in breathing with loss of tongue in acute heart failure so you can't lie, lie them flat because you have to uh, prop them up and so position is also important So how to position that patient and then ARV. Whether there is any problem with the ARV, whether there is any problem with the breathing. Assume there is no air to the right side and coming with chest pain, but no air to the right side and both hyperresonant chest. That is tension pneumothorax. So in the initial step and treat. Otherwise, next time, next second, patient will. Have an cardiac arrest in front of you, right? I will switch off my video so that it will be easy, right? So cardiac arrest. So that is that is the importance of initial stabilization, breathing, assess the pneumothorax, and some other causes immediate life threatening, and circulation. Assume this patient has got this rhythm coming with chest pain, this rhythm, and patient's blood pressure is eighty by fifty. Having ischemic type chest pain, so that means patient is having a broad complex tachycardia with a compromised hemodynamic. So unless you don't stabilize that condition at that point, and if you waste your time, patient's time, taking the proper history and doing some examination, doing labs, patient will die. What this rhythm needs is. a synchronized dc cardio version so i'm not going to tell about that but the importance of initial stabilization is that and then disability what is the gcs what is say how you do the exposure how you measure the temperature how you monitor so that is the important first important step in the initial stabilization of any sick patient which is applicable to the chest pain as well so at the end of this initial stabilization you have to make sure that the piece that this patient is stable enough right this patient is stable so i can take a proper history after identifying and managing immediate life threatening condition let's see how we are going to do 
go for the next step. So you have to go for the history, direct that history. I think you just uh, finish your internship and you are fresh than us, and you have still some some knowledge of your medical uh, schools knowledge is in your head, so that you know about the proper history. Assessment of pain. So emergency setup does not mean that you just write chest pain and ECG and just dispose of the board. You have to take the proper history to identify what is the cause for this chest pain. So what is the site, onset, character, radiation, and so that's symptoms. So every each and every step of this chest pain history is important. To identify what is the probable history from the pain assessment, we can see a couple of likely causes are there. Even though it's not one, there can be a couple of causes. And then in the history, you have to ask about risk factors. So I will talk about a little bit about risk factors as well for each and every condition, but I will not be able to do a complete description, sorry. But there are some risk factors from the character of the pain. These possible diagnoses are there. But when you take the risk factors of the history of the risk factors, yeah, this diagnosis, this probable differential diagnosis is more likely. Then you can think about that line. List. So that is the thing we do. History, pain assessment, couple of likely causes, and do the risk assessment for each and every condition. And then you do directed examination to get some more other, other points to support your diagnosis and no how sick the patient is. So that's what we do, directed history and directed examination. Always ask whether you had this pain before, whether you have been investigated for this chest pain before and what is the result? And whether you have got any cardiac angiogram, exercise stress before. So that gives some idea where we are going to. So if the patient is having some bad history of possible angina and then positive straight meal test, that patient is more likely to have an acute coronary event. So that's what we need to do in the history. Fine. Risk assessment. So, as I mentioned, after having a couple of different diagnoses for history, we have to do the risk assessment. I think you have heard about this Wales criteria for pulmonary embolism, Timmy and Gray score for acute coronary syndrome, and now new one is heart score. Like that, there are a couple of risk assessment tools. You can use them. I will very briefly tell them. Uh, but that is the basic idea of risk assessment to, to identify the risk for that patient from that pathology. And the most prob the prob probability of having that um, condition. So that is called risk assessment. When I tell individual cases, you will be able to uh, identify what is said in the investigation. What are the appropriate directed examples? So basically, in chest pain patient, you can do ECG, you can do check x ray. And uh, if you are complaining, not now, but later, if you work in Establish emergency care setups. You will know about how to do focus point of care ultrasound scan to identify various life threatening conditions, drop on in and some other ancillary tests. So, how that's how you direct your investigation. Everything is directed to identify and manage the course. Okay. Initial simulation we did, directed history and examination we did, history and risk assessment in we did, and then once you identify, you can start definitive management and then from the emergency setup, you can think whether this patient can be sent home, whether this patient can be sent to the ward, or this patient to the ICU, or whether this patient has to be transferred for another care, another hospital. So that's what we need to think about. That structured approach is very important. That's what we are always highlighting in the previous lecture. Also, they, Dr. Manohari highlighted about that structured approach. The same thing I'm going to highlight here. Fine. I have another 15 minutes left. Good. Let's talk very briefly about the big six. Those are the accurately life threatening condition which, which can present with chest pain. So I will not be discussing what all the everything about these conditions, but this is just an outline, right? This is what AMI, or acute coronary syndrome. 
what you need to identify here is don't think about too much about these numbers so it's a bit complicated what you need to identify is proper history is very helpful very helpful in our medical school life and when you do your cases and when you do that so you are taught about ami pain acute myocardial pain in the davidson i still can remember that photo of that uh, elderly person coming out of the cafeteria with a coffee in hand with a cigarette in the cold weather with a uh, hand like this so that is a typical explanation but now yeah that is true so how it is described is the heaviness retrosternal heaviness like an elephant sitting on the chest with some radiation to the left side and some nausea vomiting and some kind of severe palpitations and uh, syncope those that, that is a typical presentation but now with current uh, research and data there are some controversies so so as you can see increased likelihood of from the history increased likelihood of acute myocardial infarction they say the chest pain region right arm or shoulder is more sensitive and region to chest pain to both arms or shoulders is again sensitive a little bit less than the right arm and the chest pain region to left arm is likelihood wise less sensitive than radial right arm so that is little bit different from what we have learned in our medical school what i want to highlight is sometimes some junior doctors think oh this pain is only radial to the right side so that is not a typical description so that can't be an ami that is not the truth radial right arm is more sensitive radial both arms is more sensitive and as we which extension is sensitive and radial left arm is a little bit down but that doesn't mean that radial left arm does not mean an acute coronary syndrome but that this but you can't exclude so radial right arm and both shoulders may be a little bit more sensitive than just left into left radial to the left arm only that's what i mean so with evidence and with research data these historical factors also there is validity also change that's what i always want to highlight and then as we with diaphoresis as we with nausea vomiting worse than previous angina or similar to previous angina or mi those are important thing described by pressure from these numbers i what i wanted to highlight is i don't think too much none of these factors alone can include acute myocardial infarction as the only cause or the exclusive cause for chest pain that those are not that sensitive historical factor alone can include or exclude myocardial infarction so these are good evidence but not very strong evidence right so basically stick to the medical school uh, description of chest pain but at the same time know about these things as well so that history is very 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 important this is decreased likelihood so normally again so in our normal practice junior doctors come and say this pain is very pleuritic this pain is very positional this pain is very sharp this pain is reproducible with that patient and there is some it's not as which so so it can't be an ami that is the the idea that is a thinking pattern but it is not true so from these numbers yes it is that is having some decrease likelihood but from these numbers again you cannot exclude ami from your differential diagnosis from these things alone alone right so that is a thing so you can use these things collectively but don't say this is this can't be a good consequence just because this is reducible just because it's sharp or pleuritic right okay so at the same time uh, burning pain improvement with gt and abrupt onset of pain does not have positive or negative like to those are actually neutral so you don't have to get conclusion 
based on these historical factors alone. So basically, no single factor in the history alone can confidently rule in or rule out equine market influence. That is a baseline, right? And there are atypical symptoms. Atypical symptoms are typical, in, especially in elderly, in women, and in diabetics. They can present without chest, like dyspnea, weakness, generalized weakness, syncope, altered mental state. So you have to suspect those patients, right? Okay, risk factors. I'm not going to talk about risk factors uh, in detail because you know conventional and non-conventional risk factors for chest pain. And uh, otherwise, I will not be able to finish this lecture. Okay, examination, not very sensitive, but you, you can hurt the heart sound. Sometimes they can be in cardiogenic shock. They can be in left ventricular failure. Those are positive things in examination. And then ECG, what you look at is ST segment and T wave abnormality. So I will not do a complete lecture on ECG changes in acute myocardial infarction because it is beyond my scope today. But basically, S3 segment elevations, Q wave formation, conduction deficits, uh, T wave inversions, new S3 segment depressions, everything is sensitive. That's what you need to look at. What you need to do, see is whether there is any changes which shows S3 elevation marker infarction because that is a time critical and you have to go for the reperfusion uh, or revascularization therapy as soon as possible. So that is important, but I will not talk too much about that. Additionally, you can use jet set rays to, but it is very non-specific. Troponin I is most of the time helpful and focus if you are confident, that means ultrasound scan, point of care. If you are confident, you can do it, but I will not highlight that in this lecture. Okay, so you know this, so I will not go into details. Basically, acute coronary syndrome is unstable and the non ST elevation and ST elevation MI. And the treatment options are different for each and every condition, especially STEMI. You have to think whether how you are going to reperfuse this patient. So that means whether you are going for thrombolytics or whether you are going for PCI. That depends on the time delay for PCI. Uh, it is more than, and it depends on where you work, whether you have PCI capacities or not. So that is a completely different lecture. I think you will be covered in that topic later or in another topic. So this is a basic outline. Risk assessment tools are there. Just Google and see. There is a very good risk assessment tool called HASCO or Timmy score, I think you might have heard about Timmy and Grace. Heart score is something which is very nicely validated for emergency department setup. You can use that, just Google and see when you are having some patients with that, but I will not tell in detail. Basically, you can see from the heart score, what is the risk for MACE? MACE means major adverse cardiac event within next six weeks. So again, you can think whether this patient is high risk or low risk, right? These are the... Uh, factors we check history factors ECG age risk factors the same things I have mentioned but they have validated and put into nice algorithm and nice um, scoring system so that we can either easily identify the risk for the patient just to highlight just think about it or did I say okay 10 minutes more 10 or 5 minutes more now I am going to do this quickly so this is a uh, uh, rare condition, 3 in 100,000. Basically, in the aorta, you have got intima, media, and adventitia. Due to some reason, maybe a plaque, there can be some uh, damage to the intima, or there can be some kind of the rupture of the vessel inside the wall, that is uh, vasovenorum or vasovarteria, uh, the vessels inside the vessel, the rupture causing blood accumulation in between these layers, causing narrowing of the lumen and sometimes there can be a rupture as well. We differ, uh, give them two, uh, there are some uh, classification system. If the ascending aorta is involved, that is type A. If it is not involved, that is type B. That, uh, uh, that classification is important for the management, but basically you can have this 
propagating dissection over the arch and ascending and descending water. That is the condition. In the history, you can see sudden onset sharp tearing ripping pain. It's like an subarachnoid hemorrhage of the chest. Sudden onset, really the worst pain ever. It is migrating and it can be made due to the involvement of other arteries, branch arteries. It can have some neurological deficits. It can have mesenteric ischemia. It can mimic kidney stones as well. So this is a basic description uh, in the chest pain. You have to think about this, right? There are risk factors, multiple risk factors. Whatever it is, those are acquired or congenital condition which weaken the structure of aortic wall, right? So I will not go into many details. They are diaphoretic. They are very sick. They have hypertension or hypertension. They are tachycardic and they can have some differential blood pressures as well due to involvement of uh, arch, right? New murmurs, focal neurological signs. And then ECG, some kind there can be ischemic changes. Chicks can show widening of mediastinum, globular heart, and sometimes changes on the bronchus position. Left bronchus can go down, right bronchus can go up. And there can be some pleural effusions as well. CT angiogram is the different diagnosis, but you can use the ultrasounds and d dimers to help with the diagnosis. So basically, you have to resuscitate the patient, A, B, C, D, E, and blood pressure has to get down to 100, 120 systolic, and the heart rate has to be get down to 60. So for that, what you need to use is beta blockers most of the time, like labetrol, what we have here is labetrol. So neurosurgical, so cardiothoracic referral has to be done urgently. There are some risk uh, scoring as well. I will not go into major detail. The same things put into some well scoring system. Pulmonary embolism is the third condition which can be life threatening. Basically, you can have some pelvic or lower limb, limb vein clots which has been migrated to the heart to the right side of the heart and block the pulmonary arteries. And they present with dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, substantial chest pain, cough, hemoptysis, and syncope with or without evidence DVT. Risk factors, again, uh, the other risk factors which can cause, uh, provoke the patient into a venous thromboembolic disease. That is what we have been highlighted in the Wales code. Examination, most of they are tachypneic, tachycardic, and some kind of hypotensive as well. There can be some rare features like pleural hub and elevated JEP as well. Investigations, ECG can show non-specific sinus tachycardia or really there can be some uh, your textbook S1, Q3, T3 pattern like this, but uh, uh, sometimes there can be some isolated right bundle branch block, right, isolated right axis deviation. Uh, really you can see S1, Q3, T3 pattern. Check C3, most of the time non-specific, but there can be some pulmonary infarctions like this as well small pulmonary infarction, which, which is called Hampton's hump. Focus, I will not tell much about focus. Okay, P workup, that is a completely different lecture, uh, another one hour lecture, so I will not tell. Only thing is pulmonary embolism with shock, you have to go for thrombolysis with healthy place. Pulmonary embolism without shock, uh, you can manage with anticoagulants inoxaparin or heparin with later convenient to do oral anticoagulants. That's all about the management. As I mentioned, we also have some risk factors or so Wales criteria. If you want to roll out, you have to use per roll. Those are the just words you can just remember and uh, Google whenever you are free so that you can build up your knowledge on. Okay, as I mentioned, treatment is high risk and low risk, anticoagulation and with thrombolytics. Fine, let's see. So I already uh, discussed about this in the in the, uh, basic resuscitation thing. Sudden onset bloody type chest pain with dyspnea. Uh, risk factors can be smoking, uh, muffins, and uh, taunting, for the primary 
tensions and there, it can be trauma associated as well. That is not relevant for this lecture. And uh, examination, as I mentioned, tachy mean tachycardic, reduce ANP, you know that. So I will not tell everything since I have to stick to time. Otherwise, I'll be blamed by the organizers. Investigations, you don't have to wait for this X-ray because tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis. You have to decompress immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you can use check X-rays and focus if you are in doubt and if it's not the tension. As I mentioned, needle decompression at the fifth intercostal spade mid axial line or second intercostal spade mid clavicle line is to be done, followed by intercostal catheter with underwater drain. And then you have to identify what are the risk factors for that. Okay. Last two pericarditis or myocarditis. So basically, patient can present with pericarditis with or without uh, pleural eff pericardial effusion. If a patient person with pericardial effusion with a tamponade effect, that is a pericardial tamponade and which is a life-threatening condition. So basically, history, there can be features of pericarditis like atypical retrospinal turner, pleuritic pain, which is positional relief with sitting forward. And if there's an effusion, they can be very sick, distinct and dizzy. And the causes can be infection, malignancy or uremia. An examination pericarditis, they are tachycardic and feverish and temporary. You can have big striat. Big striat means low blood pressure, regular venous pressure distension, regular venous distension, and muffled heart sounds. And there can be some atypical symptoms as well. ECG, you can see widespread saddle shaped ST elevations of all, most of the leads with uh, reciprocal changes in the AVR, that is ST depression in AVR, and PR, ST, PR elevation in all the, most of the leads with PR depressions in, sorry, other way around, ST elevation is most of the leads with PR depression, and ST depression and PR elevations in AVR. And x ray can show some globular heart, and focus can show some pericardial effusion. ED management is pericardial synthesis, aspiration of pericardial fluids. I will not go into detail, but it is an emergency procedure. Fine, media sinus or is structure. So this is called Buhav syndrome. So sudden onset retching or vomiting, followed by acute chest pain, which is pleuritic and severe, and these patients are very sick. Some kind these patients can present after some instrumentation as well, but uh, I'm talking about spontaneous history perforation after vomiting or retching. What happens is you can have severe medial stenitis and patients are very sick. So they are shocked, tachycardic and tachycardic. They can have subcutaneous emphysema as well. ECG is non specific. Chick can show this uh, gas in the peritoneum, medial stenitis and there can be some subunit emphysema as well. And focus, again, you can see some flow refusions. Management, resuscitate, very thoroughly aggressive. They have, you have to resuscitate these patients with antibiotic fluids, and the, the patient has to go for operative debridement by the cardiothoracic surgeons. They are very sick. So very brief, very fast outline of all the life-threatening conditions coming with chest pain. So that is big cyst, right? And there are other causes which I'm not going to tell, but you have to know that these are very important conditions. So you have to identify and know about these conditions for any patient coming with chest pain, right? And uh, okay, so based on these things, there are some guide management algorithms. Uh, if there's any need, if there's any need, uh, I can uh, send these algorithms to you, but uh, the same things I have mentioned. So those are the things I need to mention in this 30 minutes regarding chest pain. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer 
it's a fast lecture so this lecture has to be done at least within one hour but uh, so my idea today is to highlight to the importance of the structured approach of chest pain any patient just as uh, and the importance of history and directed risk assessment of each and every condition for these chest pain patients and give some idea about the big six just words and couple of words but actually if we have some idea you can think about those diagnoses so i think it's the time for the break since there are no um thank you nisan sir for the for the comment and your next lecture after the break will be by dr anusha banwada the acting consultant emergency physician in uh, tg hospital ratnapura she will talk to you regarding an approach to a shock patient very important lecture so have your lunch and refresh yourself and i think she will do a excellent talk, talk about uh, shock management and assessment and uh, enjoy that and uh, i think that lecture will be on uh now it's hopefully should be at 11:30 i think you can have 15 or 10 minutes break and that lecture will be on 11:45 right so that is not lunch break so tea break so you can have a tea and uh, come in front of the computer right thank you very much for giving me this opportunity so see you soon again Uh, Dr. Anusha, are you doing the lecture or are we going for a break?
or whatever you prefer doesn't matter ah okay i thought uh, okay yes. so we can go to the next lecture in that case uh, dr anusha banwela uh, consult image vision at uh, teaching hospital ratnapura on management of shock yes. over to you doctor okay shall i share my screen I hope you can see the screen, right? Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Hello, can you see my screen? Okay, I hope you can see my screen and um, hope you can hear me as well. Um, so, um, what I'm going to do today is regarding management of shock in the emergency department. Um, so, it's um, basically uh, like shock is not an uncommon presentation to emergency departments. It's quite a common presentation. Um, so, it's very important for you all to know how to manage a patient in shock at our department. So, uh, first of all, we'll see what things we are going to discuss today. So, we'll first have a look um, at the definition and pathophysiology of shock. And we'll have a brief discussion on the types of shock. Um, just to tell you that I'm not going to discuss like separately management of each types of shock, but I'm discussing you the basic approach to management of shock. So after the definition and pathophysiology, we'll talk about the types of shock and initial actions and the assessment that we should be doing and what are the diagnostic testing, specifically in the emergency department and the treatment options, how we should start uh, treatment for these patients with shock. And finally, we'll look at the indicators of resolution of shock. So just before starting the proper topics, um, let me tell you. So it's, it's important to ask ourselves, do we really know what is shock? And if we see a patient in shock, um, do we really know to identify that this patient is in shock? And then um, it's very important to understand that sometimes a patient in shock can present with very obvious features to identify that the patient is in shock and uh, we may be easily um, seeing a reason for the shock. And also sometimes it can be very complex. It will be very difficult to identify the cause of a shock. And we all know when a patient presents with shock, we know usually they present with um, like instability with low blood pressures. And also we all know it's we left with a very um, small time to treat these patients. So as well as that, if we don't treat these patients on time, they will die as well. And then if we diagnose these patients early, uh, that they're in shock and we start treatment early, the patients will do better as well. So shock is not really a diagnosis. We can't tell the diagnosis of the patient is shock. It's just a physiological, pathophysiological state. What happens in shock is the oxygen supply to the body tissues is not adequate to meet the metabolic demands of the tissues, which um, in turn result in organ and organ dysfunction. So it's been shown here, if you can see, the oxygen delivery to the tissues is less than the required oxygen demand resulting in shock. Just to brief you out regarding this, um, this, this formula shows the factors that the global oxygen delivery is dependent on. You know this part, I think, heart rate into stroke volume, which we called cardiac output. So global oxygen delivery is mainly dependent on cardiac output, which is heart rate into stroke volume. And this whole part in this formula is arterial oxygen content. So in blood oxygen, it's mainly uh, bound to hemoglobin. So um, 
this uh, oxygen delivery is mainly dependent on hemoglobin as well, as well as that some amount of oxygen is being delivered um, with the plasma as well. So we all know now it's all dependent on cardiac output and arterial oxygen content. I'm showing in this picture what's happening in our body, what happens with the circulation. The basis is the heart acts as a pump and pumps out blood. And bloods go through this vasculature into our organs to supply oxygen. And then after that, it's being carried again through the blood vessels to the heart. So the heart acts as a pump and these old blood vessels act as a tank to supply adequate oxygen to the vital and non-vital organs in the body. So we'll see how a shock can occur in a patient. There are few mechanisms, but what is common is impaired delivery of oxygen to the tissues. That's the most common reason for shock in most of the patients. So delivery of oxygen through this blood circulation to the tissues is less, but there are some other mechanisms as well. There can be some instances like um, impaired utilization of oxygen by tissues. Um, if you can uh, remember like tissue, ox tissue level oxygen, um, utilization issues with toxins like cyanide, um, cyanide, and also sometimes it may be increased oxygen consumption by tissues as well. And also there can be combination of the processes going on in a patient as well. But most importantly, most of the times what we see as the problem is impaired delivery of oxygen to the tissues due to various reasons. I think from the med school days, we know this shock, what are the categories of shock? Basically, we have these four categories, which I will be briefly discussing you all. So in hypovolemic shock, the problem, what happens is the volume inside the vasculature or the volume inside this tank is less than expected. This can happen in various ways. So obviously, if a patient is having bleeding, it can cause hypovolemia or loss of volume, which results in hemorrhagic shock. So hemorrhagic shock is a hypovolemic type of shock. So volume can be low in other instances other than the uh, hemorrhage as well. So volume loss can be as a result of other types of fluid loss like burns and uh, diarrhea vomiting. So all these things are hypovolemic shock. So hypovolemic shock basically can be two types, hemorrhagic shock and non-hemorrhagic shock. So going into the next type of shock is the cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic, you by the name, you can understand that it's something to do with the heart. So as I said to you before, heart acts as the pump to pump out blood, which goes through the circulation into body tissues. So heart fails. The problem here is the heart fails to pump out blood due to some, some reason, which I will tell the reasons or the causes for cardiogenic shock later. Like if you all can remember, this can be due to arrhythmias, heart blocks, myocardial infarctions. So whatever the reason, the problem is at the heart level and the heart can't pump out blood adequately. So we'll move to the next type of shock, which is obstructive shock. Um, the mechanism is different from others. So obstructive, by the name also you can understand there's some sort of obstruction. Heart is functioning, but as we all know, there are some outputs from the heart, right? The blood goes out from the heart, either from the left ventricle or right ventricle. So there is an obstruction or block to the flow of the blood uh, after heart pumping the blood out. So for example, like causes like um, cardiac tamponade and pneumothorax, plural, um, sorry, um, pulmonary embolism. So in these cases, there is some sort of obstruction to the cardiac output. So the reason here in this third type is obstruction to the blood flow um, out from the heart. So it's the um, obstructive shock. Mm -hmm. Finally, a little bit of um, different pathology here happening at distributive shock. If I ask you what are the types of distributive shock you know, you might tell me that sepsis, anaphylaxis, neurogenic shock, all those things. So the mechanism, the basis of what happens here is there is excessive vasodilatation due to some reason 
which impairs the distribution of blood flow. So this excessive vasodilatation can be due to different mechanisms. So examples for distributive shock would be septic shock, anaphylaxis, um, sometimes neurogenic shock for a patient with a spinal injury, and sometimes even toxic shock syndrome. All those things can be examples of distributive shock. So now I'm going to show you briefly the reasons that I like the causes of uh, these types of shocks. So hypovolemic shock, as I said to you, can be due to either hemorrhage and other non-hemorrhagic uh, fluid losses. So distributive shock, as I said to you, there is excessive vasodilatation causing impaired blood flow uh, through the tissues can be due to these things, sepsis, anaphylaxis, neurogenic shock, etc. Cardiogenic shock, the, the failing part is the pump or the heart, can be due to myocardial infarctions, heart blocks, heart failure, all those things, and cardiac toxins, any of these things. So obstructive shock, there's a block or the obstruction um, to the cardiac output. So it can be due to pulmonary embolism, tension, pneumothorax, pericardial tamponade. So briefly, those are the types of shock. Then we'll move to find out what are the initial actions that we should be doing to these patients with shock. So as I said to you earlier, it's very important to recognize a patient in shock early and start empiric treatment as soon as possible because um, at the start I said to you, we, have, we are left with a very small time because the tissue oxygenation is getting less. So the patient can die at any moment. So we should start treatment as soon as possible. At the same time, um, I think I mentioned about this fact as well, the, the reason for the shock may sometimes be readily identifiable when the patient presents to us. For example, if patient comes after a trauma or some gunshot wound, which is bleeding, we know that this is a hypovolemic shock a type like this is hemorrhagic shock, which is a type of hypovolemic shock, and we know what to do. And we can we can start definitive treatments as soon as possible. But sometimes, at the same time, it will be a bit difficult to understand uh, the cause behind this shock. But what's important is to start your assessment and start your treatment, empiric treatment, as soon as possible, and do your investigations to find out the reason. So many cases can present with vague complaints with no focal etiology and um, then uh, patients can present with this lethargy, weakness, altered mental status and non-specific symptoms like chest pain and dyspnea. So these things, these symptoms can be a result of the primary insult or the cause of the shock or as well on the other hand they can be a result of end organ tissue ischemia as well. So what we commonly expect from a patient with shock is that they will present with hypotension. Yes, that's commonly seen, but it's, it's not always the case. Sometimes they may not come with hypotension. We will also find during our initial assessment that the patient is having increased capillary refilling time, which is more than two seconds, 3D pulses with the tachycardia and tachypnea. And as I said to you, in early shock, they may sometimes present with a normal blood pressure. And even if you expect a tachycardia in a patient with shock, sometimes these patients might have a normal heart rate. For example, if a patient is on beta blockers, their heart rate is anyway low. So those patients can have a normal heart rate even if they are in shock state. Also, they will um, have a cool, pale or ashen skin with dry mucous membranes. Next, they will have altered mental status, which can be due to as an out, uh, outcome of um, reduced oxygen delivery to the brain. Next thing. So um, if we, even if we expect a patient having a cold periphery, sometimes they may have inappropriately warm peripheries in case of distributive shock. As I said to you, the distributive shock, there is an excessive vasodilatation. That's the reason 
to these findings. So even though we expect them to have a cool periphery, they might sometimes have a warm periphery in case of distributive shock. In cardiogenic shock patients, you might see sometimes with your cardiac monitoring presence of arrhythmias, and dependent edema, suggestive of heart failures, heart murmurs, those things. These things that I'm uh, briefing you are the uh, signs that we can identify during basic assessment of the patient. They will have a jugular venous distension, which is possible in a cardiogenic shock, as well as that they will, it will be seen in obstructive shock as well. So assessment pipes, we have to start our assessment in ABC order, airway, breathing, circulation, to see whether the patient is able to maintain the airway, how is the patient's breathing, whether the oxygen saturation is normal, if there's any lack of oxygen saturation, we need to provide them with adequate oxygen externally and with the breathing assessment. Also, we can see whether there are any signs suggestive of um, problems with respiratory system as a cause of shock like pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax. So if we suspect them, we need to correct them at the same time as well. Then goes to circulation. And while our assessment uh, of the circulation, we have to get a proper IV access as well. Then we have to go for a focused history with the physical examination to find out other causes for the patient um, to have the shock. Uh, so cardiopulmonary examination to look for signs of heart failure, abdominal examination to see whether there are any evidences, intra, evidences of intra-abdominal bleeding or intra-abdominal sepsis focus, and extremity examination to find out anything abnormal in the patient to suggest a cause for shock. To tell you about the IV access, we usually prefer to have two large IV large bow IV accesses to these patients, preferably in cubital fossas. But if we fail to access, uh, like have um, IV access in a patient, we can go for the intraosseous access. Um, then patient's ECG, very important, chest radiograph. We don't send the patient with shock to the radiology department, but if we can get the uh, uh, mobile um, X-ray into our uh, department, we can have a uh, X-ray of the patient if required as well. Then um, the next point, bedside, bedside ultrasonography, which we call FAST in trauma. I hope you have heard the name FAST, that is focal assessment of sonography in trauma, um, is very important to identify this cause for sure. Um, focus is point of care ultrasound, which is also um, in a patient with non-traumatic case, to identify, uh, we can use focus scan or uh, point of care ultrasound to look for a cause for shock. I will um, tell you briefly what things we can um, see with the scanner. Then we can initiate, after gaining the IV access, we can initiate the intravenous fluid resuscitation as well. Okay, so this is a briefing of the things that we can see through the ultrasonography in a patient with shock. So you all might not have access um, to our, just our ultrasound scanner, but in case if you get the chance, that's a very good equipment for us to um, find out the reasons for shock. And uh, to tell you about that, if a patient is having hypovolemic shock, I'm just briefing, um, you all might be knowing there's um, inferior vena cava, collapsing inferior vena cava. We might see collapsing IVC uh, and also as a source of bleeding or fluid loss, we might see peritoneal blood or fluid. And also sometimes if the patient is suspected to have an abdominal aortic aneurysm, we can see evidences of ruptured abdominal aneurysm as well. So if we suspect a patient to have a cardiogenic shock, we can easily have a look at the patient's heart to see whether, how is the contractility of the heart? How is the ejection fraction of the heart? So we will see a poor contractility of the heart. And also we can see B line profile or B profile in lungs. B profile indicates there is a lot of interstitial edema in the lung tissues. So these things are bedside test. So ultrasound can help us to come into this conclusion.
Uh, so distributive shock, then obstructive shock, in obstructive shock as well. We can see a lot of things. We can identify pericardial tamponade and also uh, sometimes um, signs of these absent lung sliding and the, all those things are signs of pneumothorax. So it's very important we detect them early. So we can see interperitoneal hemorrhages, pneumothorax, pericardial tamponade. So how is the global cardiac function with the guys uh, uh, treat use dejection fraction and intravascular volume status. We can have a look at the inferior vena cava, IVC, whether it's collapsed or whether it's full sometimes. Um, in cases of like heart failure, in hypovolemia, the IVC can be very much collapsed. And also we can have a look at these vascular catastrophes like uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture. I'm just showing you a bit of few pictures. So this is the heart when we look through the ultrasound and we can clearly see there's evidence of collection of blood around the heart, which is due to a uh, pericardial effusion. So the cause can be pericardial tamponade here if the patient presents with shock. So here, this picture, this view might be a little bit familiar to you if you have done scans for patients with dengue shock and all. Uh, we have a look at the same, same view usually. Um, so there is liver and there's kidney here. So we look at the uh, hepatorenal pouch to find out blood or fluid here. So in a patient with trauma, if we see a picture like this, and if we suspect abdominal trauma, so it's very likely the cause for the shock of the shock for these patients are is hemorrhagic shock due to bleeding. So this shows some evidences of pneumothorax. Uh, we can have a look at the lungs with the scanner as well. So absent lung sliding and uh, some other modes to identify pneumothorax. We can have a look at the aorta as well to see whether there is any evidence of. Um, abdominal aortic aneurysm and a rupture. Okay. So if you can have a look at this view, we can see the heart is contracting very poorly. So we can identify this patient is having a very poor contractility of the heart and a low ejection fraction. So this, this patient case might be a cardiac failure or a heart failure. So this is how we look at the inferior vena cava. So we, we put the uh, abdominal drop longitudinally near the area of C, uh, just below the CP sternum. We can see the lower part of the heart and the inferior vena cava um, and see whether the inferior vena cava is collapsed. Okay, so just a bit of evidences to find out the reason for shock. So in your history, in your short history taking, if you get a report of a trauma, and any other source of bleeding, like history of malina, hematemesis, and also some um, significant vaginal bleeding in a patient with some gynecological um, source, um, maybe a miscarriage or something like that. So we can think the reason is a hemorrhagic shock, which is a part of a hypovolemic shock. And then, so I'm so showing you the almost similar pictures here. This is also the hepatorenal pouch blood here. So in a patient with trauma, this can be due to intra-abdominal bleeding. So if a patient is pregnant, positive urine HCG, coming with uh, CV abdominal pains and you see some sort of pelvic fluid, so it can be a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And also if we get, uh, so that's about bleeding. So if we got any other evidences from patient's history, um, supporting fluid loss, like decreased oral intake for a few days, diarrhea, vomiting, all those things, DKA, they can be causes of hypovolemic shock as well. Then cardiogenic shock, chest pain, shortness of breath, syncope, recent leg swelling, and if you do the ultrasound scan, poor contractility of the heart, for a patient with septic shock, signs of infection, history of recent fever, dysuria, abdominal pain, these can be uh, positive uh, features from the history. Anaphylactic shock, we, we all are familiar with that. So patient with exposure to a trigger comes with 
skin symptoms and all those things, we can uh, think of anaphylactic shock. So what test can we do for these patients? Um, we do a bit of test, like we find out um, the patient's a serum lactate level. So investigations can be either to detect the etiology of shock or to look at the outcomes of the shock as well. So um, serum lactate levels will be helpful for us to see the tissue, the lactate increase due to inadequate oxygen at the tissue level. So there is anaerobic metabolism taking place at the tissue level and uh, there can be increase in lactate. So usually we get the lactates with our venous blood gas or arterial blood gas. Okay. And the next thing is ECG. We can do an ECG as well to see whether the patient is having any arrhythmias or uh, features of myocardial infarction. At the same time, we take blood for the investigations like full blood count, blood urea, creatinine, all those things. And we can arrange pregnancy tests if we suspect anything like a ruptured ectopic pregnancy uh, and also other full set of blood to look for a suspected cause for this shock. Then we'll just briefly move to the treatment options for us in these patients. So what treatment can we do in our emergency department? So it's very important to um, uh, start with timely empiric treatments. We are, we are uh, establishing patients' airway breathing circulation and then ensure the patient is receiving a proper oxygenation. Um, it's very important because I said to you, the global oxygen delivery is one major factor which is dependent on patient's hemoglobin and all those things. So it's very important to have a maximum arterial oxygen saturation to those patients. If there's any problem with a patient being unable to protect the airway, it's very important to go for an intubation as required to reduce the metabolic demand of the patient as well. But it can be sometimes tricky because patients' hemodynamics need to be optimized before intubation because if we are intubating a patient, the drugs that we use for uh, sedation and paralysis, sometimes those things can cause further uh, deterioration of the patient's hemodynamics. So we might need to give rapid fluid pulses and all those things before going for intubation. IV access, as I said to you earlier, if we fail to get the IV access, we can go for intraosseous access, then volume expansion to start with crystalloids. And sometimes um, your fluids won't always improve patient hemodynamics. For example, like in a patient with cardiogenic shock, fluids is not the answer. So fluids may sometimes further deteriorate patient's condition. And in case of a hemorrhagic shock, it's very important, even though you start with replacing crystalloids, it's very important uh, to uh, give adequate um, amounts of blood as soon as possible. The next thing, uh, if the patient's hemodynamics is not improving, with this volume resuscitation, we can start patient on vasopressor medications. Um, one of the uh, first choices is uh, vasopressors like uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine. We should also treat the underlying etiology of the shock as soon as possible if we identify the etiology. So, for example, if we see there is uh, obvious hemorrhage, we have to stop this bleeding as well. Otherwise, however much we give fluids or um, blood, the patient won't improve if we do not stop uh, hemorrhage. So, it's very important to stop further bleeding in these patients if there is any way that we can do that. So, in case of, think of a sepsis or septic shock, it's very important to start fluids, then start vasopressors, um, so, and also antibiotics and infection source control. 
we all know about management of anaphylaxis. You have, you may have done enough um, uh, cases of managing anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock during your intern period. So um, the first choice is intramuscular epinephrine. So if the patient is having a cardiogenic shock, if you find out the reason for the shock, Maybe if there's an arrhythmia, we can go for cardioversion, cardiac pacing, and management of myocardial infarction, depending on the reason for the cardiogenic shock. So these are definitive management points. If it's a pulmonary embolism, the patient might need a thrombolysis. If it's a cardiac tamponade, pericardiosynthesis, or we have to drain out this uh, blood in the pericardial sac. So if it's a tension pneumothorax, we have to decompress this decompress the attention pneumothorax. Inside the ICT, all those things are important in these cases. Um, finally, we'll have a brief look at the indicators of uh, appropriate resuscitation in these patients and what, what things can indicate that the patient is improving. Um, obviously, if the patient's hemodynamic parameters are improving, if the blood pressure is um, improved now and the heart rate if the patient had a tachycardia it's getting down and all those these these things indicate that the patient hemodynamic parameters are improving then um, so as i said lactate level in our abc or vbg is a initial thing that we do in a shock patient so if the lactate is so lactate usually is expected to be high in a patient with shock due to increased anabolic, anabolic metabolism at the tissue level. So if the lactate level is reducing, that also indicate the shock is um, getting corrected now and the volume state of the patient being restored as well. Okay, so next thing is... Uh, resolution of the acidosis and return to normal metabolic parameters. So what should we be doing once we initially stabilize this patient after the shock? So if the patient is stabilized now, now the patient is in the emergency department, we should find a place to send this patient for further care. Ideally, the patient should require admission to ICU setting under care of an intensivist. So we had to discuss with the medical team in charge and find a place to send this patient. Ideally, it should be an intensive care or a HTU setting for further management and further observation. Okay, I think I have done almost all these points. Um, I will briefly tell you about the take home points of my lecture. Um, so, as I said to you, shock can be difficult to identify. Patient may sometimes present with uh, obvious features of uh, cause of the shock, but sometimes, most of the times, they present with very like ill-appearing um, hypotensive tachycardic features, but sometimes the clinical picture can be very difficult to identify. They can be subtle features and very, very widely. So it's a true emergency. We have to start treatment as soon as possible because it's a very small time left for the patient. And also we have to promptly and aggressively treat the patient in the emergency department to reduce the morbidity and mortality of the patients. We don't have to wait until the diagnostic studies arrive to start the resuscitation. We have to start the resuscitation as soon as possible for these patients. Then it's very important um, to understand and uh, know the categories of shock and also uh, recognize the pathophysiological features and start the proper treatment as well. So those are my uh, take home messages. I'm very happy to accept any questions if you have um, and I'm happy to answer these questions. If you have any questions, are uh, there any questions? I don't see any questions at the, the chat 
as well. So I think, I hope you have understand, uh, like understood the basics of management of shop. Um, and I will introduce our next uh, lecturer to you. Um, she is Dr. Madhurangi Ardhya She is the consultant emergency physician at Base Hospital Kanadura. She will be talking to you about trauma resuscitation. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Anita. Uh, that was my introduction. So um, uh, we are, this is a kind of a lecture series for the emergence, in related emergency medicine. And it's very important that you should know about how to manage uh, emergencies in your uh, ward setup, or if you're going to the ICU or even to the emergency units. So it's better to have a, a rough idea of that. So um, uh, I think that you have been going through that uh, lots of topics and very important topics. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, another important topic that's usually we will encounter uh, during your uh, uh, professional career. So uh, this is what we called trauma resuscitation. So um, the trauma is very important because uh, this is the one of the common presentation uh, to the emergency departments, as well as, uh, on the other hand, uh, this globally as well, it is a kind of a very common presentation to the emergency services. And uh, the next thing is that uh, most of the trauma victims are young and otherwise healthy. So uh, actually, these are the kind of a preventable mortality and morbidity. So that's why we have to get a proper idea of uh, how to manage uh, the trauma victims. So in this lecture, um, I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about the pathophysiology underlying uh, each and every steps of uh, a trauma resuscitation and uh, what is your uh, organized or structured approach to a trauma patient, especially that's what we are practicing in the emergency units. And uh, damage control resuscitation, that is the term that we are giving for a trauma resuscitation. And uh, one of the neglected part in a trauma that is the monitoring or assist the progress of what we have done to this patient during our resuscitation. So I think almost all of you have seen and heard of this uh, uh, graph. Uh, this is what we call primordial distribution of trauma related death. So this trauma related death has a trimodal distribution in relation to the times. So you can see three peaks. I'm basically focused on the middle peak or the second peak. So before that, I tell you that's the first peak, uh, that is the deaths occur immediately after the injury. So if it is like within seconds to minutes, if it is a death happens to be like within seconds and minutes, it should be a very massive injury. So it is, we can't save the patients respective of our early intervention. So usually uh, by the time of pre-hospital service or retrieval services uh, approach to the patient, and uh, by the time of the patient uh, admitting to the AN unit, uh, the patient uh, could have died. So we have very little to do uh, to prevent these deaths. And uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about this uh, third peak, that is the deaths occur days or weeks after the injury. These are the deaths that occur due to complications of trauma itself or delayed or missed management during our second, uh, the early presentation of the uh, patient to the hospital. So uh, this is usually the causes are most of the time, uh, maybe sepsis or ARDS. Uh, kind of thing. And uh, these actually can be prevented by early and effective interventions during our initial stage of resuscitation. So that's why we worry, uh, basically focus on this middle peak, that is deaths within, that occurs within hours. So these are mostly related to hemorrhage. And in the previous lecture, and Dr. Anusha mentioned about um, in detail about this uh, hypovolemic shock. So that's one of the commonest recent uh, uh, to happen uh, during this uh, 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 this uh, peak, the deaths related to this peak, and it's mainly due to hemorrhage or bleeding. Uh, so we are talking about uh, a golden hour 
and I think you have heard of this golden hour. That is what we called the first hour of the after the injury, because with, if you have uh, if you are intervening intervening to the patient, and if you are starting treatment immediately, early as possible, and it it, it is a kind of effective treatment, we can save about thirty percent of the patients uh, by preventing deaths. So that is what we call intervention during the golden hour. Now we have advanced the time to the platinum 10 minutes, because that's uh, if we can do all those interventions within first 10 minutes of the presentation, that could be. So we can save more than uh, what we are expecting. Uh, we can save more lives, what we expect, expected. So I think you hope of you can understand uh, the, the important point in this trimodal distribution is that most critical fact in the trauma resuscitation is the time. So time is the critical point and that, that is the one we can understand through this graph. The lethal triad of the trauma, I know all of you have heard during your medical career. So there are three factors we believe uh, which uh, can contribute to the death in trauma related victims coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypothermia. These are actually, uh, the factors are interrelated to each other. Coagulopathy, it's because of, it is similar to um, uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which we are talking uh, during the sept sepsis, but it's different because the trigger for this coagulopathy uh, is mainly tissue factors, which is released from the uh, traumatized tissues. So we name this as a trauma-induced coagulopathy. And uh, the second thing is acidosis. Because of the hemorrhage or reduced perfusion to the uh, distal tissues, this result in uh, uh, producing the lactic acid uh, with the anaerobic uh, metabolism, and which causes uh, increased lactic acid production within the tissues, which in turn affect mainly to the cardiovascular system. So that is the main part uh, plays a role in this uh, trauma resuscitation, the heart and the vessels. So the heart can be suppressed with acidosis and there could be a vasodilatation in the peripheral vessels, so which can further worsen the uh, shock state of the victim. Temperature, which is one of the neglected part in the resuscitation, but is so important in trauma resuscitation because hypothermia, which can in turn affect to the coagulopathy and worsen the, this lethal trial. Right, I know that you have seen many trauma resuscitations uh, in your institutions, uh, basically in the emergency units. It's very chaotic, it's very disorganized. I mean, it's very stressful conditions. But with the introduction of uh, the emergency medicine to the medical carrier, uh, its main reason for the introduction is was like uh, to establish a proper protocol or structured pathway for the initial assessment of the patient. So then we can get a, uh, a very good outcome of whatever we are doing. So you can see this is the way that we are managing patients in our a &E units. It is kind of a team approach. So you can't do a lot uh, to manage this polytrauma patients. So the trauma management starts from the pre-hospital stage. So we have the pre-hospital service, that is our uh, ambulance service. So they are going to the, take the patient and from the retrieval of the patient, that from that time onwards, the management should start. Ideally, we should have to get a, a pre-hospital notification to the emergency units, uh, but still we are working for that. And then the reason for that is that we can prepare uh, according to the particular victims. And uh, so, which involves organizing an emergency trauma team and also activating or informing the other relevant authorities. As example, trauma surgeon plays a major role in trauma. An orthopedic surgeon, uh, it could be anesthetist and a blood bank, a pediatrician or obstetrician. So it depends on the patient, we have to inform the relevant specialties. And then in the emergency units, we have well-organized trauma team. It includes, uh, you can see this is possibility of uh, this person could be the team leader, 
he or she always uh, will be the so get the sole authority to organize the um, uh, resuscitation and there will be airway doctors and airway nurses to assist in the airway part and the procedure doctor uh, to assess for the procedures like uh, inserting the tubes and uh, another doctor will do for the primary assessment and there's one other important person that is a doctor who's doing the bedside scan Dr. Anusha previously mentioned in detail about this uh, point of care sound. In trauma, it is called EFAST. So uh, we find out uh, what exactly this patient is going on, whether there's anything that we have to intervene immediately. This is very important. So this is, you can see that uh, each and every person in the trauma resuscitation have some sort of, a, has some sort of a designated role. So they know what they want to do. So the environment is very calm. So approach to trauma patient, just like in any other emergencies, it is what we call primary uh, survey. So here, this is a bit different. Uh, even in the, uh, uh, even uh, not only in the trauma patients, but even other emergencies, we are going uh, with the clinical primary survey assessment, as well as uh, if you have the ultrasound scan, we are doing the point of care ultrasound to rule out. But so at the same time, we can rule out uh, um, in any emergencies that we should have to intervene, like a life threatening problems. In trauma, the approach is different. <laughs> Rather than going for A, B, C, D, E, we are going for a C, A, B, C, D, E approach. C is to control the catastrophic bleeding. We know in trauma, it's basically there's a damage to the tissue. It could be a bone or a muscles or a ligament or whatever, but there's a disruption of the intact vessel. So what will happen? There's a leaking. If we are not going to stop the leaking point, whatever we are filling into the tank or whatever we give in as during the resuscitation won't be effective. So first thing is just look at whether there's any catastrophic bleeding that you should have to stop. So that is the first thing you have to do. So it could be uh, like put in a pressure bandage or uh, put in an arterial tourniquet or just lift the distal. If it is a distal uh, bleeding point, you can uh, lift the distal part of the limb and uh, then it will reduce the bleeding. And if there's anything that you can control with the pressure bandage, you can see a bleeding point, you can just go ahead with the digital uh, or the pressing with the finger. So likewise, you can apply some sort of a bedside manuals or uh, procedures to control the bleeding. Then you're looking for a airway. So basically in trauma, facial injuries are very common. So if the patient, even the patient is conscious, you go ahead with the intubation to secure the airway because that patient's airway can be soiled with the bleeding in facial injuries. And especially we are always focused on the cervical spine in trauma. All trauma patients should have a cervical spine stabilization unless until you exclude uh, the injuries, uh, which can be in the later part of, later part of the uh, management. So until then, you have to manually or with a collar, you have to stabilize the cervical spine. And if you are suspecting traumatic brain injuries, go ahead with the early intubation if there is a drop in of uh, conscious level or if you feel that patient couldn't maintain the airway. In chest assessment, basically we are looking for a trauma. Uh, so if you are suspecting whether it's kind of a uh, tension pneumothorax or hemothorax, go ahead with the uh, finger thoracotomy. That is what we call, we're not going to put a IC tube. Instead, we are just putting, a, uh, make a hole on either side of the uh, chest. Uh, uh, if it is a blunt trauma, if it is a penetrant trauma on a particular side of the chest, we just make a hole with a scalpel and a, a faucet. Um, and uh, then after relieving the pressure, we can go ahead with the put in IC tube. That is a definitive management. Resuscitative thoracotomy, which kind of a new inter intervention in a penetrating trauma, which uh, we can't see very commonly, but is something to read. In circulation wise, the first thing you have to do is how to get a very large IV, a large bow cannula, at least two cannulas, and 
start analgesia as early as possible because the patient's anxiety and the pain should be relieved then and there. Otherwise, it could be a kind of a vicious cycle, which also worsen this um, underlying lethal triad as well. So give analgesia, better can give IV if it's a significant pain like morphine, fentanyl and uh, gets the basic blood investigations. And we'll talk about this rotum and blood transmission later. And then you assess for the uh, dysfunction. Basically, we are going for the AVPU scale and assess pupils just to get a rough idea of the patient's cognition. Don't ever forget about the temperature and uh, warm the patient if this uh, temperature is low and uh, check the blood sugar. Then you are going for a secondary survey. That is, you are briefly assessed for any other trauma. So um, this is not like complete assessment, but after uh, excluding all the life-threatening injuries, then and their management, then you're going for a second uh, survey and tertiary survey usually done in the definitive care before the patient is, uh, definitive uh, care facilities before the patient discharge or um, uh, to uh, stabilize, right? So these are the four important uh, creatures that's important in trauma resuscitation. Why I'm telling like that, the pigs, sheep, mouse, and injured soldiers in the battlefield. These are the things which involve in uh, finding out evidence-based uh, or the updated guidelines facts, uh, which included the trauma resuscitation. So they have given their lives to save thousands of lives uh, in a trauma resuscitation. So whatever the clinical trials, what we are using at the moment are based on these uh, uh, animals and the battlefield injuries. So with this updated or the evidence-based medicine or the, this um, updated facts, we currently come to a, a management protocol in trauma, what we call damage control resuscitation. This is actually uh, starting from the street and through the emergency unit to the ICU. So it is kind of a continuous process. It is kind of a systemic approach. So then we are not going to miss most important things to be corrected. The basic uh, targets for uh, in damage control resuscitation is to control the bleeding and correct the lethal triad. So there are three facts we are talking in damage control or DCR, permissive hypotension, early hemostatic resuscitation and damage control surgery. So these are the three factors you have to remember. So we'll talk about this permissive hypotension. It means, we are just maintaining kind of a low blood pressure. We are not going for a high blood pressure. You learned that's previous in shock. We basically going for a, to keep the blood pressure up. That's why we are doing a lot of interventions. But in the bleeding and hemorrhagic shock, we plan to go for a low blood pressure because there's a bleeding point which should be corrected. And it is most of the time could be in the theater. So until going to the theater, if you are giving more blood to keep the blood pressure up, so that will cause it that dislodgement of the clots at, at the injured site and causing more bleeding. So it will worsen the condition. So we want to just keep the blood pressure low to keep the perfusion of the vital organs. So what we are going to do is go, go for the uh, uh, blood transfusion that we'll talk in later. And this uh, permissive hypotension is more beneficial in early resuscitation until that we uh, control the bleeding point. But uh, usually it is mapped around 50 to 65, except in severe traumatic and spinal injuries, because we know in traumatic brain injuries, uh, there's a possibility of increasing intracranial pressure, which cause uh, to overcome that, we have to keep high mean arterial pressure. So it should be more than 80 to 90. So hemostatic resuscitation means that we know that there's a loss of blood. So if you want to replace, to prevent uh, the shock, which goes in uh, affecting to the vital organs, we have to give blood, it, not the fluid. I think all of you have uh, heard of this ATLS guideline. We learned previously in a few years back about giving two liters of crystalloid until we get the blood. Then it, then it further changed into later uh, into one liter of crystalloid, then go for a uh, blood. But now they're telling that, um, we, if we have blood, 
uh, in the emergency department or if you can get early as possible then start the blood transfusion early as possible even before the crystalloid but practically in Sri Lankan situation we know that it's very hard to get uh, uh, blood within 15 to 20 minutes of the uh, patient's presentation that's why we to, to take the time we are starting crystalloids but remember it should be very little as possible because until we get the blood because we, that uh, large volume of crystalloid may cause dilution and coagulopathy, which uh, affect into the uh, lethal triad and worsen the condition. How much of blood we should have to give? That's the other, other question. So there are a lot of clinical trials, which I mentioned that previously depends on this ex experiments with these fat uh, animals. They found that um, a one to one to one uh, ratio is the best, but now actually they are selling rather than fixed and a strict one to one ratio, you can give one to two red cells with the one FFP, one platelets, like kind of a ratio. Uh, and uh, so that is better rather than going for a strict one to one to one ratio. Right, so we are replacing blood as well as the protein factors and other relevant factors in the blood components. So when we're talking about the blood transfusion, massive transfusion protocol is what we are talking. It is different from the massive transfusion. So here we are giving a balanced uh, volume of uh, uh, blood and components to prevent dilutional coagulopathy. You should be familiar with the institutional policies, protocols, especially after finishing your internship. So when you're going for this, your career starting from now onwards. So you have to be familiar with all the protocols. It's a massive transfusion protocol is the one thing that you have to be familiar, which is usually activated by senior clinicians. And there are some criteria uh, that's activating the MTP. Uh, that's called ABC score. Just read about that. And uh, it, we are sending baseline bloods and then uh, notify the laboratory to activate the massive transmission protocol. The important thing is we should not, we actually don't want to worry about how much of blood we have to get because this blood bank then uh, send in a pre-prepared pack. So we just want to give the transmission. Once the patient's bleeding controlled and hemodynamic is stable, then we can inform the transmission laboratory the blood bank to seize the MTP. And other than the blood and blood products, uh, fibrinogen is very less with the um, trauma patients. So cryoprecipitate is the one which is very commonly used. And the tranexamic acid, you know, that's uh, this, there are a lot of trials like crash trials uh, have mentioned that uh, the benefits of giving tranexamic acid in major trauma within first three hours, like a one gram stat dose uh, within 10 minutes and uh, then one gram over eight hour infusion. And always don't, should not forget about the calcium in trauma patients, especially with the massive transmission protocols. And the Rotom is kind of a new gadget which has introduced to this uh, trauma resuscitation. We know that usually we are sending um, coagulation tests uh, to find out whether there's any coagulopathy. They found that uh, uh, this coagulation test have a bit of a poor predictability of bleeding and thrombosis. As well, let's take some time. Practically, we have that experience. So this, uh, the found this raw term, it is called um, thromboelastometry. You can see this machine and this uh, the report. That's what we are getting through this uh, machine. Usually, we can get it within half an hour. That will give exactly a guide what sort of blood or blood products we should have to give according to this patient. So it is kind of individually uh, recommending what sort of uh, product. Sometimes we don't want to give the uh, total, the pack cell or the uh, whole amount of uh, pack cell or the FFP or platelets. Instead, we can give whatever the deficient factors at the moment. So it's kind of a new thing, uh, new technology can be used in the trauma resuscitation. So damage control surgery, that is the last one in the trauma resuscitation. So it is starting from the AN unit through the ICU to the operation theater. And this is where we practice scoop and run. We always discourage scoop and run. We always uh, encourage to do stabilization before we are taking the patient out of the uh, uh, AN unit. But here we are always encouraged because we have to stabilize the patient, but stabilization depends on the how we control the bleeding point or the damage point. So it can be done in the theater. So while doing the resuscitation, we can send the patient to the theater. And uh, what they're doing is just 
um, stabilizing procedures like packing uh, fibrin seal, putting fibrin sealers, uh, et cetera. And then uh, once we stabilize the bleeding point, then move to the ICU to optimize the patient and then to the late surgery or delayed surgery to, for the definitive treatment. So the last thing, the monitoring. As I mentioned to you, this is one of the most neglected part in trauma resuscitation, not only trauma, most of the emergencies. Are we going to assess the progress of this patient? Yes, we should have to, because then only we can see that's whether this patient need uh, uh, things like uh, uh, further uh, sort of, uh, what sort of things we have to modify. Right, uh, so the clinical judgment is the best thing. So what do you mean by clinical judgment? You have to uh, see the patients, see more and more patients. Then only you can see that's, uh, whether this patient's clinically improving. I always encourage you have to see more patients because the clinical judgment cannot be replaced with the uh, high-fi technology investigations. So it is always a good clinician should have a very good clinical eye to evaluate the patient's assessment, especially in the AN unit. We have very little uh, resources uh, to come to a diagnosis. We don't have hi-fi stuff or hi-fi technology or uh, detail uh, or more time to assess the patient like in wards or ICU. So always we are going with the clinical judgment. Urine output and the cognitions are the two important things in uh, trauma uh, uh, pro assessment of a progress of the patient's management. Uh, we actually use lactate and base excess to assess the tissue permission because we know this is a trauma, uh, hemorrhagic shock is the main thing. And to see whether that's our uh, treatment is effective too, we can use lactate and base excess. So in summary, trauma resuscitation it should be well organized and should be start from the time of the injury. And it is the CABCD, not the ABCD. We have to stop catastrophic bleeding. Damage control resuscitation is the name we are giving for trauma resuscitation. We are targeting for a low map and uh, early blood transfusion and uh, scoop and run for the damage control surgery. Rotom is kind of a new friend to the AN unit, but it is better, but it is not essential thing. So out of this, clinical judgment is the best, not only for the monitoring, but for the diagnosis of the trauma patients, uh, the related problems. So I think I have got a few questions. Um, i just go through that. So uh, yeah, finger thoracotomy. So it is, yes, uh, one, patient, uh, one doctor has asked about that finger thoracotomy, just we keep open. Yes, of course, we just make a hole on particular side to keep it open. And uh, then once we stabilize the patient after primary survey, then we are going for a put in a, a definite procedure that is the uh, intercostal tube insertion. So until then we just keep it because we relieve the pressure with the finger thoracotomy. Right, this is one of the another common uh, um, sort of uh, misunderstanding about us giving IV opioids to the head injury patients. So remember, you have to give painkillers. So head injury, does, it is not a contraindication to give IV opioids. What you have to do is just document the GCS before you give in the IV opioids and then give the analgesia because patients should not uh, uh, be in pain uh, because of the head injury. So that will further worsen the condition as I mentioned previously. Right, and uh, dextrose in head injury? Of course not. We are not giving dextrose in head injury unless it is a significant hypoglycemia. Well, I'll answer one or two questions because we don't have time. Um, there's a long questions. Uh, right. Yeah. So the morphine, it actually don't afraid to give the morphine uh, to head injury patients. You should have to give, just be, document the uh, GCS before that. So I think uh, overall you got the uh, brief idea of uh, the trauma resuscitation since we don't have time. And now it is a lunch break for you. And after the lunch break, um, uh, you will get a, another 
very important topic that is the management of prairie arrest arrhythmia that will be done by Dr. Tushar Avidana Patrunu. He's a consultant emergency physicians in uh, General Hospital, um, uh, sorry, District Hospital, uh, yeah, General Hospital Martha. So that's another important topic. So I hope you will have a good lunch. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madhurangi, for that uh, detailed lecture. Uh, I think we are in for a lunch break now. Yes. Uh, so we're going to have a uh, lunch break until 1.15. Uh, so come back at one fifteen. Right.
Recording stopped. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second part of the session after lunch. Uh, I uh, invite Dr. Tushara Vidhanapadana, consultant, emergency physician, DJ Matra, to start the topic of cardiac health. Over to you, Dr. Tushara. Can you hear? You, can, you have to unmute. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Dr. Roshan? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roshan, for your introduction. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Tushar Vidhanapatana, consultant emergency physician, uh, District General Hospital, Matara. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the new young specialty emergency Recording medicine. in progress. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to discuss you with about uh, cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, the topic is periarrest rhythm. Uh, the thing is, uh, electrophysiology is a separate subject, but everyone should be, every medical officer should be able to identify life threatening conditions and should be able to manage life threatening conditions while seeking necessary support from uh, senior colleagues when necessary or the respective specialist. Okay. <clears throat> so, this is, um, I hope everyone can listen to me. Uh, so, uh, every, everybody is familiar with this algorithm. This is a very, uh, very basic algorithm that you should need to thorough. Um, my apologies for the inconvenience. Uh, the surrounding may be a bit noisy. Just give me a few seconds. Okay, so uh, adult tachycardia uh, in, in an emergency department, always it's uh, a teamwork. So uh, in, please stop scribbling on screen. Um, uh, so um, uh, in an emergency department, always uh, resuscitation is a teamwork we are having pre-allocated role like airway nurse, airway doctor, resuscitation team leader, uh, airway nurse, circulation nurse, then assisting nurses, scribe nurse like that. We are having pre-allocated roles. But when you are working in a particular unit, if you are going into an ideal emergency, in an emergency department, all right, you can have pre-allocated uh, roles. But if you are working in a small hospital, but even though prior preparation is very important, for important to face uh, emergencies. So any patient, any adult patient coming with uh, tachycardia, uh, initial approach is you need to assess the patient according to A, B, C, D, E approach. Um, it is very easy to say that I am approaching with A, B, C, D approach, but this is practically not happening. I'm not going to talk about the resuscitation. My other colleagues may have already discussed this. Uh, so, if you're tachycardic patient, oxygen saturation is less than 94. You need to start oxygen, and you need to have, you need to obtain IV access. This IV access for all unstable patients, you need to have a bigger caliber cannula. Um, sometimes we see that uh, there's a star putting blue cannula or um, pink cannula for these uh, unstable patients. It's better if you can go with a higher caliber starting um, uh, from 18, I mean uh, 18 gauge. Ideally, at least you should have 18 gauge cannula in your unstable patient's uh, cubital fossa or in, in the patient's wrist. Um, and you need to connect this patient to ECG monitor, blood pressure, you need to monitor blood pressure saturation and uh, ECG rhythm and identify any treatable, treatable reversible cause. So, 
um, in these kind of patients, when you are putting cannula, at the same time, you can take uh, necessary blood for blood investigations, um, including electrolytes and venous blood gas. Why venous blood gas is important? That's a bedside test that you can perform if facilities are available. You can identify electrolyte abnormalities. If patient is getting poor perfusion, their lactate level may be going up. Like that, you can get a lot of information from the uh, um, venous blood gas result. You don't need to do ABG. Venous blood gas is sufficient unless your patient is hypoxic. Then while you are doing quick assessment, you need to identify which patient is in life threat, whether your patient is in life threatening condition. That is, we are going to discuss um, four features. That means if these features are present, we will take this patient is hemodynamically unstable. So those features are, it's very easy. We are telling this patient is hemodynamically stable or this patient is hemodynamically unstable, but you need to check few components which include shock, syncope, myocardial ischemia, and whether your patient is in severe acute heart failure. If these life-threatening conditions are present, you need to manage uh, this hemodynamically unstable patient appropriately. That means your patient is hemodynamically unstable. So irrespective of the rhythm, this fast tachycardia should be managed. So what you need to do is, you need to do synchronized DC cardioversion. You need to do synchronized DC cardioversion. So you can go up to three attempts with appropriate sedation. Uh, you, if you are competent in handling airway, <clears throat> you can use propofol and fentanyl. You can give fentanyl, uh, if uh, young patient, you can give propofol 50, uh, sorry, uh, fentanyl 50 micrograms and propofol according to the response. But you need to do, you need to assess um, patient's uh, risk of, uh, I mean, airway risk. So you need to have a proper training on that. Hmm? Uh, airway assessment is very important. In case if patient starts to desaturate, you may need to do bag mass ventilation. So you need to have a resuscitation equipment before giving these medications. You can give propofol and fentanyl. So propofol will, uh, once getting propofol, patient may lose their awareness. And fentanyl working as a analgesic. So no awareness, good analgesia is given, patient is comfortable because this cardioversion is a very painful procedure for the patient. So today I today morning I cardioverted one patient uh, with propofol and uh, fentanyl, uh, with propofol sedation with fentanyl. 78-year-old uh, lady who presented with uh, supraventricular tachycardia. This patient was hemodynamically stable, but patient was resistant to ordinary pharmacological medications. So I move on to some advanced uh, options uh, and cardioverted and reverted back. So this cardioversion, then once adequate um, sedation and analgesia is given, you need to do synchronized DC cardioversion. You need to do synchronized DC cardioversion. I'm just going to the next slide. So I talked about uh, um, ABCD approach, well, dedicated approach, uh, ECG recording and all. Um, adverse features, if your patient is hemodynamically unstable, you need to do synchronized DC cardioversion up to three shock. If your patient is shock resistant, that means if patient is not coming back to uh, sinus rhythm, you need to give IV amir around 300 milligram over 10 to 20 minutes, followed by 900 milligram over 24 hour infusion. And with, after giving amir drone, some they become, uh, they, 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 they may respond to uh, cardioversion. If patient is further resistant, that's the point where you need to seek um, assistance from uh, senior colleagues. So this is the device available in my department. <coughs> Uh, uh, this is the uh, defibrillator. Uh, nobology is, but you need to familiar with the nobology, but uh, uh, the device fundamentals are same. So in this device, it depends on the, uh, the nobology may be very little bit. I mean, uh, basic setup is uh, 
almost same for all brands but you need to be familiarized with the device available in your department so uh, this is the defibrillator available in my department which has facing facility also so um, we need to select uh, manual defibrillation mode and you need to synchronize so there's a synchronize button once it press then the device will prompt whether we need to synchronize then we need to confirm and need to do the synchronized cardio version otherwise your patient if you um, cardio uh, then it doesn't call cardio version if you deliver a shock without synchronizing then your patient can go into ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest this is a very dangerous weapon you need to use very carefully in your department if you are not familiar with this device always get assistance from uh, your colleague and get proper training on defibrillation uh, so that's i talked about the management of any arrhythmic patient coming with hemodynamic instability so hemodynamically unstable patients you need to manage with uh, synchronized dc cardio version with appropriate sedation then uh, i'm going to talk about hemodynamically uh, stable patients here you can see now your patient doesn't have any features of uh, hemodynamic instability then you need to see you need to take proper ecg and see the appearance of qrs complexes if qrs complex is more than 3 square uh, size it's called broad complex uh, rhythm so if heart rate is more than 100 then it's called tachycardia if it is less than that it is not tachycardia so if your patient is saying more than 3 square in ecg with a rate more than uh, 100 then it's considered as uh, broad complex tachycardia so assume your patient is saying more than 3 square size qrs complexes in the ecg so then you need to see whether these qrs complexes are in regular rhythm or in an irregular rhythm so if it is irregular broad complex tachycardia so the possibility is include atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block you need to treat as irregular narrow complex tachycardia uh, so uh, or else it could be polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that is you know that toss rd point a you need to manage with iv magnesium 2 g over 10 minutes with that patient may return to sinus rhythm so if your patient is having regular broad complex tachycardia this is i am going to talk about the hemodynamically stable regular broad complex tachycardia if it is a vt you need to treat medically with iv amiodarone you need to give iv amiodarone 300 mg iv usually i am giving it over 15 minutes then followed by 900 mg infusion over 24 hours this is kind of chemical cardio version if uh, previous certain diagnosis of svt with bundle branch block sometimes supraventricular tachycardia those who are having previous bundle branch block can present as regular broad complex tachycardia so you need to treat as for regular narrow complex tachycardia that means you need to treat as svt then i am coming back to the narrow complex tachycardia so your patient's qrx complexes are less than 3 square size with fast rhythm so you need to check whether it's a regular or irregular if it is a regular we treat it as svt or supraventricular tachycardia you need to perform vagal maneuver i'll talk later about the vagal maneuver if vagal vagal maneuvers are failed you need to give iv adenosine provided your patient is not having bronchial asthma or copd you can start with 6 mg rapid iv bolus 
and you need to connect three way tap and one end you are giving uh, six milligram of IV adenosine and other end you need to give a big flush. This is our conventional practice. Latest, latest evidence show uh, diluted large bolus of uh, IV adenosine also effective, but I am not practicing it. Uh, so you need to give six milligram. You need to, before giving medication, you need to explain that when you are getting this medication, you will get a feeling of impending doom. That, mo that means patient feels that they are going to die. So you need to explain patient before giving these medications. If it is failed, you need to give 12 milligram. And uh, earlier, uh, guide, previous guideline says we can give 12 milligram two doses. Latest guideline uh, 2021 is being updated as uh, 6 milligram, 12 milligram, and the subsequent dose is 18 milligram. So today, my patient, I tried all these manuals, but all these medication, all these doses, but patient did not revert it back to, uh, I mean, patient reverted for a sinus rhythm for a few seconds. Again, patient is going into sinus rhythm. So if your patient is adenosine, uh, if your patient is having bronchial asthma or COPD, other alternative medication is IV verapamine. As this patient was not responding to adenosine, I gave a dose of IV verapamil 5 milligram, but patient reverted back to sinus rhythm. Roughly about 15 to 30 minutes, patient again reverted back to supraventricular rhythm SVT. Then this patient was uh, medication resistant, then other available option was cardioversion. So any kind of any kind of rhythm you can control with electricity. Electricity is a good medication. So th that today morning patient I cardioverted with propofol and fentanyl sedation, and I gave hundred synchronized uh, shock. Then patient reverted back to sinus rhythm, and due to propofol, she got apnea. Uh, two three minutes, I had to do ambu ventilation. After that, patient was monitored in proper position. Once patient was fully woken up, I sent to the uh, medical ward as our cardiology department was full of patients. Uh, if, because this is a shock resistant one. If it is a, if it is not shock resistant with a sing, if single with the single dose of medication, I'll observe this patient couple of hours in short stay, and I'll discharge patient in a three to four hours time back home with cardiology or electrophysiology follow up. Uh, if your patient is having irregular narrow complex tachycardia, then the it could be probable atrial fibrillation. Sometimes you may see, you are not quite sure whether it's a SVT or fibrillation. In case, you may need to caliper QRS complexes. That means if this is the ECG QRS complexes, you need to keep another piece of paper here. You need to mark each R, wave, R waves with a pen on the white edge of the paper. Then move this somewhere else and keep over QRS complexes are C, whether those, QR, those marked areas are overlapping. If those marked caliper, mark, you, you are caliper, I mean, what you marked on the paper is not overlapping with the respective QRS complexes at other place, then it's a irregular rhythm. Then it's not a supraventricular rhythm. So, uh, that is how, if you have a doubt, you are going to identify uh, whether the your rhythm is regular or irregular. So moving back to the uh, my uh, discussion, uh, I talked about irregular um, irregular narrow complex tachycardia and hemodynamically unstable hemodynamically stable patient. It's a probable atrial fibrillation. So it depends on patient presentation. If your patient coming with atrial fibrillation within 
48 hours of symptoms onset. That means patient is telling that I, I got palpitation probably about it started two hours ago. Like that, if patient is coming less than 48 hours, you can revert this patient back into sinus rhythm with cardioversion in emergency department. You can do uh, electrical cardioversion. If your patient is presented late, you need to decide whether this patient need to be reverted back to sinus rhythm or whether this patient need trait control. There are two modalities of atrial fibrillation management. If your patient presented less than more than 48 hours duration, you need to see whether this whether I need to manage this patient with uh, rate control or rhythm control. Rate control or rhythm control. If you are going for a heart rate control, you, are you need to keep the heart rate less than 120. So you need to start oral beta blockers. Oral beta blockers. Or you can do elective cardioversion. If you, if you are planning to go for a, a rhythm control, so you need to go for electrical. Uh, you need to, um, if you are planning to go for a rhythm control, always you need to do elective cardioversion. So if it is more than 48 hours uh, atrial fibrillation, patient may have blood clots in their uh, heart. So if you cardioverse this patient, this thrombus can get dislodged and sometimes your patient may end up with stroke, cerebral stroke. So um, that's why we are doing anticoagulation and do elective cardioversion. So if you are going for a rhythm control, you need to uh, risk assess whether, the, whether this patient is having a thromboembolic risk. There are different scoring systems for that. Hmm? You need to use one of these and see whether this patient needs anticoagulation. Once anticoagulated, adequately anticoagulated, then you can do electrical cardioversion and take this patient back into sinus rhythm, or you need to, that patient need to continue anticoagulation lifelong if patient is, if you are planning to keep them on rate control. So I just discussed it different names, but I, in subsequent slides, I'm going to show you uh, these ECG rhythms for your convenience to identify. Any, any patient is, uh, if you cannot manage with pharmacological agents, if ineffective, uh, you can go for synchronized DC cardioversion. Remember, always synchronize DC cardioversion. Right, I'm going back to the, the other slides. I discuss about the QRS complexes, broad complex and narrow complexes. So we divided a narrow QR, hemodynamically stable patients, narrow QRS complexes, regular and irregular. Uh, I'm going to discuss with this, I have discussed irregular uh, narrow complex tachycardia. It's a probable atrial fibrillation. Um, I prefer to give max sulfate as the first line medication. So. I used to give IV max sulfates two to four gram over 10 to 20 minutes. Most of the time, they are rhythm and uh, rate may very well control with, uh, sorry for that. They are, they are rhythm, become very well controlled with max sulfate. If max sulfate doesn't work, then um, I will move on to the other medications, uh, rate control medications like beta blockers, DLTSM, or if patient is in acute heart failure, I will consider IV digoxin or amiodarone. Assess the thromboembolic risk and anticoagulate necessarily. ECG features of atrial fibrillation. This is one of the atrial fibrillation ECG rhythm. No obvious P waves you can see, but sometimes fibrillatory waves may mimic P waves. And no, there are no isoelectric baselines. Variable ventricular rate, RR interval is variable. I told you, if you have a doubt, mark R wave on a 
piece of the key piece, edge of the piece of paper here, mark R wave one here, 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 like this, and move it somewhere else and keep and see whether these marks are overlapping with these R waves. If it is not overlapping, then the rhythm is irregular. So QRS complexes usually less than three small square size, but it, it may become more if patient is having a pre-exciting bundle branch block, uh, pre-existing bundle branch block, or if patient is having accessory pathway like in WPW syndrome. Fibrillatory waves may mean key waves, right? Okay. So then uh, that is irregular narrow complex tachycardia. Regular narrow complex tachycardia. Uh, I told you about the uh, regular narrow complex tachycardia way about vagal maneuvers. Vagal maneuvers are carotid massage. You need to make sure that patient is not having any carotid bruit. Um, uh, you need to auscultate and see if there's a carotid bruit, the carotid massage is contraindicated. Um, because when you are starts to massage their carotid, patient may end up with thromboembolism. The thrombus can shoot and end up with stroke. So you can ask your patient to provide valsalva manure, provided no contraindications. That means um, in, uh, if patient, your patient is awaiting for a clipping of a cerebral aneurysm, then it's a contraindicated. So it increases intracranial pressure. Uh, otherwise, you can do uh, you can ask your patient to perform valsalva manure. Or the most successful, newest one, latest one is modified valsalva manure. You just search YouTube, you can see how it performs. That means you are you need to ask your patient to get, uh, you give a 20 cc syringe and ask the patient to blow it in a sitting position uh, as fast as and hard as possible to participate to this uh, plunger to move out from the syringe. Ask patient to keep on doing for 15 seconds, then you need to bring the head in down with raising their legs more than 45 degrees um, all of a sudden. You need to explain this procedure before uh, performing it to the patient. Uh, very, very, you need to clearly explain, then you need to perform. It has a 80% success rate compared to um, our conventional Valsalva manual. You just go through the uh, uh, YouTube, you can see how, how to perform video with the how to perform this manual. Uh, so you don't need to give any medication. Without pharmacology, you can reverse um, supraventricular tachycardia without any medication. In pediatric patients, we use submersion in ice water. Eyeball pressure is no longer practiced, it's contraindicated. So I prepared this presentation uh, before this 2021 guideline release. So uh, here, IV admission should be 6, 12, and 18. This is based on old guideline. Okay. Uh, this is a SVT. You can see regular narrow complex tachycardia. No visible P waves. RR interval is constant. Then the broad complex tachycardia, VT or uncertain rhythm. If your patient is having VT or uncertain rhythm, you can try with IV amidron. If known to be SVT with bundle branch block, you need to treat as regular narrow complex tachycardia. That means you need to manage as SVT. This is ventricular tachycardia. This is a broad complex tachycardia originating in the ventricles. Uh, there are different varieties of VT are present. This is a monomorphic, regular, narrow, regular, broad complex tachycardia. This is a monomorphic ventricular rhythm. So there are a lot of varieties of ventricular tachycardia. This is a very basic one, but you need to read and thorough it this kind of ventricular tachycardia, those who are studying further will, uh, you need to read, uh, read and understand other varieties of ventricular tachycardia. So usually they are having broad complexes and uh, absence of right bundle or left bundle branch morphology. Extreme axis deviation, uh, QRS is positive in AVR and uh, negative in one and AVF. Usually, AVR lead is negative. Here, QRS complexes become positive. Then, AV dissociation is there. You can see capture beat, fusion beats. I cannot teach everything within half an hour. I just wanted to show you that there are a lot of features, supportive features in identifying ventricular tachycardia. If your patient is saying R is R complexes, that means right bundle branch block, 
pattern with taller left rabbit ear. Taller left rabbit ear. If you get V1 uh, RSR pattern, normally if it is a uh, right uh, bundle branch block, your patient may have uh, this two right. If, if you think that this uh, right bundle branch pattern is two rabbit ears, usually right side is bigger than the taller than the left one. But if it is a uh, VT, their left side become more prominent, left rabbit ear. So you need to read around this. I cannot explain everything within half an hour. So SVT with bundle branch, how to identify? You need to read it. So broad complex irregular rhythms, Irregular broad complex tachycardia, AF with bundle branch block, treat as for irregular narrow complex tachycardia, or AF with WPW syndrome, consider amiodron, don't give uh, beta blockers or adenosine, then patient may go into cardiac arrest. So alternate pa alternative paths they become activated. So re-exciting rhythms, consider amiodron or electricity. So polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, um, out of this, TOS RD point is the one common one. I told you that we are managing this with IV max sulfate. This is a uh, TOS RD rhythm. You can see uh, the axis, the, the, the rhythm is um, see, the twisted around the isoelectric axis. Treatment is IV max sulfate. Any tachycardia, if you have a doubt, you need to manage as uh, VT unless proven otherwise. Any resistance case, electricity has a place, place and unsure, always seek expert help. So that is all about the tachycardia. Then today I'm talking about the periarrest rhythm. Uh, then the, I'm moving to the bradycardia. I'll quickly go through this because I'm, I'm running behind the time. Uh, so same as you need to assess patient with ABCD approach with good teamwork. Oxygen, if appropriate, and obtain IV access, monitor ECG, BP. Uh, oxygen saturation record to LED, ECG. When you are taking blood, same time, remember to do EBG. You, if Sometimes your CKD patient may come in with bradycardia. The underlying cause may be hyperkalemia. If you are doing a bedside BBG, you can identify uh, hyperkalemia. And you need to, you can treat them and there. Then your patient's bradycardia may be subsided. Then you can direct this patient to nephrologist for hemodialysis. So venous blood gas is a very important one to identify treatable causes. If you identify any treatable cause, you need to treat accordingly. If your patient is having, if your patient is hemodynamically unstable, that means life-threatening signs, shock, syncope, myocardial ischemia, or heart failure. If yes, the treatment of choice is IV atropine. Uh, Western guidelines, IV atropine, 500 micrograms IV, but we are having on uh, 600 microgram IV while you can give single wire, 600 microgram. Then if there's a satisfactory response, yes. So you need to assess whether, whether your patient is at a risk of AC stall. That means if your patient had a history of recent AC stall or morbid type 2 AV block or complete heart block with broad QRS complexes or ventricular pause more than three seconds, then your patient is at risk of AC stall. If no, so with atrophy and if you are getting satisfactory response, yes, you can observe your patient in emergency department or in your emergency room. Uh, if your patient is having any factor of risk of AC stall, you need to go ahead with interim measures. That means even with atrophy, if your patient is not responding adequately, you can go atrophy, go with atrophy up to maximum three milligram. That is the point where you are getting maximum block of parasympathetic response. Or if patient is not responding, then you can go for isoprenaline infusion or adrenaline infusion. Being emergency physicians, we prefer to give IV adrenaline infusions, two to 10 micrograms per minute IV uh, adrenaline infusion and maintain uh, adequate cardiac output. If you are having facilities, you can go for transcutaneous pacing. From the beginning, I show you that uh, the defibrillator, which available in my department has transcutaneous pacing facilities, which is a temporary measure uh, to reverse underlying cause. If it is sinus syndrome or myocardium in, induced uh, bradycardia, uh, 
this patient need uh, pacing, uh, TPM, uh, transvenous pacing or permanent pacing later should be arranged by the electrophysiologist. If your patient is not responding, uh, or if this, if your patient need those, this kind, these kind of uh, interim measures, you need to seek help. Either you need to uh, direct this patient to uh, cardiology unit, or you need to consult electrophysiology if specialty is available. So, um, alternative medications include IV aminophilin, w uh, dopamine, uh, glucagon. If your patient is uh, beta blocker poisoning. The patient is having a beta blocker uh, overdose, so that you can give uh, IV um, glucagon. Or oh, your patient is having a CCB, calcium channel blocker overdose, the treatment is uh, glucagon. Uh, these are the treatment options that you can use to manage your hemodynamically unstable bradycardia patient. So, this is a very basic uh, overview of managing patients with cardiac arrhythmia. But this is a separate specialty. Life-threatening emergencies should be able to manage by all medical officers working in the emergency department. Uh, not only emergency department, if you are practicing in a particular ward, if your patient is developing this kind of thing, you should be able to manage. So um, this is the uh, defibrillator available. So there's a pace amount. So we need to pace. Um, if I'm going to pace my patient, I will pace uh, pads or uh, intraclavicular and apical positions. I just electricity, once selected to pace a mode, then I can select electricity, desired electricity level, till get adequate. Uh, I need to program the rate and I'll adjust electricity according to till I get the captured beat over here. That means pacemaker rhythm till appearing it here. Uh, I will adjust electricity with adequate sedation because patient is getting vigorous muscle contraction. It's very painful. So your patient need adequate sedation. Okay. I have come to end of the presentation. Uh, within my time limit, I think I will answer one or two questions if available. Next speaker is uh, ready to, uh, is ready with uh, uh, presentation. So I will answer one or two questions. Um, Sir, when to give uh, asynchronized shock? Asynchronized, we are giving shocks in cardiac arrest. We are not going to synchronize straight away. It's called defibrillation. Atrial fibrillation less than 48 hours is synchronized BC shock, the only treatment. Uh, it depends. But if it is a less than 48, if it is a recurrent uh, presentation with uh, atrial fibrillations, uh, so. Uh, if patient is coming, presenting several times uh, with uh, less than 48 this uh, oral salbutamol. Uh, one doctor is asking whether it's all right to give uh, oral salbutamol. But uh, when I'm practicing overseas, no one was used. I have seen some of the cardiologists are using oral salbutamol to get its uh, probably the side effect. Salbutamol causes tachycardia. Uh, in some centers, they are practicing, but it's not evidence-based. Okay, I think I have answered almost all the questions. Um, uh, I will uh, put my email address in chat box if anyone is interested or if anyone is having further questions. I'm happy to uh, help you and uh, guide you and uh, I'll share references if necessary. So I have shared my email address. If anyone need any assistance or any advice, I'm more than happy to help you. If anyone is interested uh, in doing emergency medicine uh, as their postgraduate specialty, you all are welcome to our new specialty. So I'm going to stop my presentation at this point. Our next speaker is uh, ready to uh, present Dr. Nadisha. Yes, Dr. Nadisha. can you hear? Ah, yes, Nadisha. So I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker. He's um, Dr. Nadisha. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll stop at this point. Nadisha, over to you.
Dr. Disha, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, thanks. Sorry for the uh, trouble. And hope can you can see my uh, screen now? Yes. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see and hear you both. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tushara, uh, for introducing me. Uh, and I'm really uh, sorry for the uh, technical problems you are having in this um, virtual platform. Uh, so, uh, my name is Nadish Fernando. I'm a consultant emergency physician, currently working at uh, Teaching Hospital Karapiti. Today, my topic is, uh, so I have uh, uh, resuscitating a patient with unknown poison or overdose. The second one is uh, uh, management of uh, snake bites. So I'm starting with the uh, talks presentation. So my objectives are, uh, so I discuss uh, about different presentation due to uh, poisoning and overdose and uh, how to approach and the blueprint to manage uh, these uh, presentations and what are the things we should do and what are the things we shouldn't do in a patient uh, who is having a, a overdose or the poison and uh, I'll discuss about common uh, antidotes as well. So, um, so uh, in a to a busy emergency department or a, a ATU room, uh, so poison patient can be present uh, as different ways. So, as an example, so they can come as a cardiac arrest, or the otherwise they can come um, telling that accidentally they have ingested some uh, uh, break fluid or maybe some poison. And the other things, they may present with reduced responsiveness. Sometimes they can come with seizures. And a um, lot of them might come as complaining of self-ingestion. And sometimes kids, they can come with uh, taking some pills and stuff like that. So whatever the presentation is, so suspected poison patient management, the, the approach is uh, same. So this is the mnemonic uh, you need to remember. So I would say it's uh, RISAS, RSI, dead. So first of all, resuscitation, then the risk assessment, then in support to care and monitoring, then the basic investigation in the bedside, then it comes to the dose and disposition. Um, I have seen most of the time uh, medical officers are, are not doing this first part. Actually, when there's a uh, patients coming with suspected OP overdose dose. So before they taking into the emergency department, sometimes they just ask the minor staff to, okay, uh, please do the gastric lavage and activate the charcoal and take the patient into the bed. So that is totally wrong. I just need to emphasize on this, that we should start the resuscitation, then risk assessment, supportive care, investigation, then it should come to the decontamination and stuff. Okay, so resuscitation. In resuscitation, we need to assess the airway, breathing, circulation, and if there's a seizure, we need to control that. We need to measure the temperature and blood glucose. If there's low blood sugar, we need to uh, replace them. And if there are, if there's an uh, antidote uh, for a suspected poison, we need to give it 
then and there. So those are called the resuscitation antidotes. So what are the resuscitation antidotes? So suppose if your patient is a heroin addict and coming with low GCS, we can try with some naloxone. And we can give flumazenine to the patient where we suspect who is having um, benzodiazepine overdose and sodium bicarbonate to the patient who are overdosed with tricyclic antidepressant and high dose insulin euglycemic therapy for the beta blockers and calcium channel overdose. IV intralipid is the antidote for uh, local anesthetic toxicity and atropine for the OP and hydroxycobalamin for the cyanide and digibine canerutab um, for the So the risk assessment. Uh, so before, so for the risk assessment, it is important to find out what is the agent and what is the dose and time since ingestion and current clinical status and patient's factor. So all these factors due to this overdose. So I will uh, I will tell you a story. So we have a two boy who was brought into the emergency department by his worried mother while they were at a nearby cafeteria. The boy's mother noticed two white tablets on the next table. A few minutes later, the tablets were missing, and she sure that her son followed the tablets, probably about 30 minutes ago. So he is currently well in your department and has age-appropriate vital signs. So what are you going to do now? So though these are very simple two tablets, it might be a very lethal uh, medication. So if the kid is two years old, the weight may be uh, about 10 kilograms. So for a 10 kilogram child, if they have taken this kind of pills, they might die. So these are the things called the pills, a single pill which can cause, a, cause death to a, a kid. So if those tablets are calcium channel blockers, Tricyclic antidepressant, chloroquine, opiate, sulfonylurea, beta blocker, theophylline, or amphetamine. So this child might die if we didn't act uh, timely. So that is why it is very important to assess the risk. So after that, we need to take a focus history and focus examination. So we are not going to do whole top to bottom uh, examination and a very detailed history. It's just the focus history and physical examination. So what are the things we are going to uh, examine? So in eyes, we can see the pupil size, whether it's reacting, whether it is, whether we can see yellowish discoloration and temperature is really important. And in lungs, Sorry, in lungs. So we need to see whether we can see any crepitations or any wheezing. And blood pressure is really important. Uh, and heart rate, whether heart rate, what is the heart rate, what is the volume, like that. And bowel sounds and skin. So this is the in detail clinical assessment, which I'm not going to tell now. And also in physical examination, sometimes we might be able to notice uh, toxidromes. So there are things called toxidromes. Those are the uh, clinical features, the collective clinical features happen due to some toxins. So as an example, uh, the very commonest things you all might know, uh, the cholinergic toxidrome that is due to uh, 
organophosphate overdose, they might have, they might be sweating with pinpointed pupil, like with lacrimation, urination, diarrhea, and with uh, ronchi in the lungs, and they might be bradycardic with hypotension. So if you can see all together in a one patient, so it's a cholinergic toxidrome. And in uh, there's other one called opioid toxidrome. If your patient is drowsy, respiratory rate is very low and shallow, and pupils are pinpointed. So you can diagnose it as an opioid toxidrome, and you can treat with uh, naloxone. So like that, uh, there are anticholinergic toxidromes and uh, like that, there are a lot of toxidromes. And after that, it's a supportive care, just a mnemonic for supportive care, fast hugs in bed, please. So it's very big mnemonic, but uh, you can remember it. So fast is fluids therapy and feeding, analgesia, anti -emetic. Sedation and spontaneous breathing trial if, they, if you have intubated the patient. And thromboprophylaxis, head up positions if intubated, ulcer prophylaxis, glucose control, skin and eye care, catheter, nasogastric tube, bowel care, uh, temperature control, uh, de escalation treatment, and psychological support. So, this is the uh, so, for most of the poisons, the treatment is supportive. So, this is just a mnemonic to remember. So, next one is bedside investigation, which is very important. So, you can check blood sugar so in some and might have severe hypoglycemia you need to do is blood gas which is really important you can get clues uh, from the blood gas about uh, toxins the other thing is ecg definitely anero poisoning uh, and beta blocker and calcium channel blockers you can get an idea about uh, what is the uh, poison going on and then the you need to do the bedside renal function test, liver function test, and especially uh, in, in higher centers, you can send uh, tox toxicological screening in teaching hospital and some uh, private sectors. And also uh, basic food blood count and coagulation profile, as I uh, earlier said, and uh, sometimes radiological investigations also uh, helpful. Uh, in management of the poison patient. To detect the aspiration, you can do the chest x-ray and for especially in uh, iron tablet overdose, you can do an abdominal x-ray and see whether uh, how many tablets uh, have your patient ingested. Okay, decontamination, very interesting part. So there are different ways of uh, doing decontamination, GI and the skin. Say some are having a uh, risk to the patient uh, more than benefit. So we need to carefully uh, find out uh, what is best and what, what, is, what are the bad things for a patient. So induced vomiting still practicing in some centers, but it is uh, uh, so never ever do induced vomiting in your uh, poison or the overdose patient because uh, they can aspirate and uh, they can get aspiration pneumonia and even though you are doing uh, induced vomiting it's not going to uh, uh, help your patient the other thing is gastric lavage so it's i would say it's un unpopular because in other countries especially in australia where i work uh, so they are never doing gastric lavage so but i have seen in uh, our centers uh, do still doing the gastric lavage uh, but it is uh, very unpopular. So sometimes it is contraindication. So as example, if you have not done the initial, initial resuscitation, so uh, it's contraindication. And if your patient is unable to maintain the airway, so it's a contraindication. And especially in small children, we are not going to do the uh, gastric lavage. But if after assessing the risk, 
uh, if if the amount of ingestion is too much and if the uh, if the patient's gcs is very low and if you have intubated and protected the airway provided that maybe we can do the gastric lavage but otherwise uh, uh, sometimes contraindicated and the next thing is activated charcoal or the adsorbents so usually if your patient comes within first hour of ingestion you can give activated charcoal doses 1 gram per kg usually for adults 50 gram we give in a 100 ml but provided that your patient's airway should be protected with intubation or they should be able to maintain the airway by themselves but sometimes there is no point of giving uh, activated charcoal for some uh, poisons so you can remember it as charcoal so charcoal doesn't absorb charcoal so caustic so the corrosive heavy metals alcohol uh, cyanide chlorine and iron uh, aliphatic hydrocarbon and lithium so for those uh, things we are not going to give uh, activated charcoal the other thing is whole bowel irrigation which is uh, not much practice in our setup just remember that there is a a thing called whole bowel irrigation which we can use to uh, eliminate the uh, toxic substance so we can give polyethylene glycol and the uh, the other enhanced elimination uh, things are multi dose activated charcoal urinary alkalinization and hemodialysis so uh, after uh, elimination so in our research rsi uh, uh, did uh, so it comes to the uh, antidote so these are the common antidotes which is available in our practice so for the amphetamines so that means uh, ice and uh, recreational medication so the antidote is benzodiazepine so if your patient is benzodiazepine overdose you can give flumazenine so beta blockers it's high dose insulin is glycemic uh, therapy uh, for the bupivacaine and local anesthetic is sodium bicarbonate and intralipid or calcium channel blockers it's iv calcium and high dose insulin therapy carbon monoxide uh, so it's oxygen and hyperbaric uh, oxygen for cyanide it is hydroxycobalamin sodium thiosulfate and sodium nitrate for iron it's this this ferioxamine for opioid naloxone as i said earlier op it's atropine you all know paracetamol it's nac for the inacetyl cysteine for tricyclic and anti, uh, those antidepressant overdose the so sodium bicarb is the antidote and it's very interesting for the toxic alcohol Uh, the the antidote is ethanol so the disposition so after managing so you need to send your patient if it is intubated to the icu or to the hdu if it is not intubated maybe you can send to the ward for further management if your center is very small one maybe you can send the patient to the bigger hospital also if it is very minor uh, poison or overdose you can observe and discharge so my take home so messages this is a very important slide uh, so in induced vomiting is out now it's no longer practice in the world other than in some limited benefit you can do it provided that uh, your your patient's airway is protected activated charcoal only within first hour and provided that the patient's airway is protected so uh resas rsi dead is the blue pin which we can apply and the supportive care is the main treatment for most poison and treat the patient not the poison so any questions so i have to do another lecture as well if you have any questions you can ask now uh, if you have any questions in this uh, lecture
So in the absence of questions, I am going to move to the to my next lecture. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, sir, Dr. Nadish, you can see. Okay, okay. Thanks. But uh, your presentation is not uh, open. I think your computer screen. I have is... opened it. Can you see it? No. You, you can't see. The snake post in the. Is it? Can you close it and reopen? I think it will do. Yes, yes, so. What about now? Yes, yeah. Okay. All right. So the ne next topic management of snake bite in a peripheral hospital or a ETU. So I'm just going to run through this topic because I'm uh, running behind the time. Uh, so objectives. So I'll discuss about the first, first aid, what to, we should do and what other things we shouldn't do. Initial assessment, resuscitation and management. Uh, overview of highly venomous snakes in Sri Lanka. Uh, features of local and systemic envenomination indicated and we should immediately transfer the patient to a uh, medical care institute. So just to show you a picture about the immobilization because we should you should not uh, confuse with the tourniquet. So this is how you should immobilize. It's not the tourniquet, just uh, putting a, a, a uh, putting a, a board or something underneath the uh, limb and just putting some uh, few knots uh, very loosely. It's not the putting tourniquet. And what are the things we shouldn't do? That is incision, application of anything to the wound and uh, no venom stones, no tourniquet, no alcohol, no NSAs, and no fruit juice. So management at the peripheral hospital or a ETU. So this is uh, just first rapid clinical assessment and if there's uh, if we should resuscitate so we should as a manage from the airway breathing circulation and then detailed clinical assessment and identification of the snake and look for signs of envenomation and whole blood clotting time and uh, if needed we need to give antivenom and uh, so we have to give uh, prevention so they, they can get anaphylaxis and severe reaction due to antivenom and to prevention there are some treatment which where we can give and if there are established if they establish a, a reaction we need to treat that and after antivenom regular monitoring and uh, then we need to disposition the patient so this is the stepwise management of a snake bite patient so in initial assessment so as everyone said, it's airway, breathing, and circulation. They may have low respiratory rate uh, so, uh, and low tidal volume where yeah, you need to manage appropriately. They might be cyanos and they might have neck muscle uh, weakness. So this is the clinical uh, features or the situation where they need uh, initial resuscitation. So if the respiratory muscle paralyze, uh, or they, if they have a poor respiratory effort, we need to manage very aggressively and cardiovascular collapse and profound hypertension. If they are in coma, we need to manage and profound bleeding have to manage. And if they have any arrhythmia, we need to manage. So the resuscitation, they might need intubation and ventilation. Uh, so if the air is not protected, maybe start with the uh, the lateral position. Uh, so if they hypoxic, we need to give oxygen. 
IV cannula and uh, cardiac monitoring, and if they are hypotensive, inotropes and anti-arrhythmic drugs. So just to just overview about uh, snakes in Sri Lanka, we can categorize highly venomous, mildly venomous, and non-venomous snakes. So highly venomous snakes are cobra, rasas viper, common crab, Sri Lankan crab, so scaled viper, hump nose viper, and sea snakes. So this is the uh, cobra where you can identify with the uh, nice hood. Uh, so they can basically they cause uh, local tissue necrosis, neurotoxins, and cardiotoxins. So next venomous, highly venomous one is the Russell's viper. You can identify them with uh, their nice uh, dot uh, pattern. Uh, they can cause coagulopathy, neurotoxins, and cardiotoxins. Next one is soul scale viper. You can diagnose, uh, you can identify them with the sawtooth pattern in their body. They can cause local reaction and coagulopathy. So the, the next highly venomous snake is uh, the Indian crate or the common crate, uh, and then the Sri Lankan crate. So, um, so crate. Basically, they cause neurotoxicity predominantly. And the next highly venomous snake is the uh, hump nose viper. There you can uh, identify them with their uh, hump appearance. Sea snake are also highly venomous. They have flat tail. Uh, envenomation can cause basically uh, muscle damage. So uh, these are the features of uh, systemic envenomation. So as neurotoxicity, you can your patient might show double vision, ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, altered consciousness, hematotoxicity. Uh, they can show hematuria, hematemesis, hemolysis, and if you do a whole blood clotting follow. and nephrotoxicity. Features they can show oliguria. You measure the input output and rising uh, blood urea and creatinine. As cardiotoxicity, they can complain chest pain and hypotension, and there may be ECG changes. So, the uh, myotoxicity they can complain muscle pain, abdominal pain, and vomiting, and painful vinterinopathy. So, uh, in summary, Russell's wiper they can show local effect and uh, coagulopathy and neurotoxicity, all three. Cobra, basically local effect and neurotoxicity. Crate, it's neurotoxicity commonly. So scale viper, local effect and coagulopathy. Hump nose viper, local effect and coagulopathy. And sea snake viper, sea snakes, basically uh, muscle pain and stuff. So the local things they, due to snake bite is Telling and discoloration. This is just to show you how to do the whole blood clotting time. You just take one to two ml of blood into a glass tube and you keep for 20 minutes without any disturbances and check for clotting. So the left right side one is a clotted one, left side one is a um, prolonged uh, whole blood clotting time. So this is only important in wiper bites because they are the only one have a uh, uh, leading manifestation. So we can do the whole blood clotting time on admission and in one hour, two hours, six hours and 12 hours. So this is a very important one side uh, that is indication for antivenom. So antivenom where we have Indian polyvalent antivenom, which made against only for Cobra, Russell's viper, soul scale viper, and trade. So it's not suitable for hump nose viper and sea snakes. So we administer when the earliest evidence of systemic envenomation is noticed. So uh, we can give it to all proven Russell's viper bite if the flag waiting for the systemic envenomation. In cobra bite, any clinical features of low pain. So how much? It's We can give 10 miles in cobra, crate, and soul scale viper bites. But if it is Russell's viper bite, we can do 20 miles. 
So infusion should be started slowly at the beginning in order to detect allergic reaction. And we had to complete it within one hour. So same deals for pediatric patients as well. So what are the things we need to do to prevent uh, uh, antivenom induced reaction? So there are different uh, stuff people are doing at the moment. They are giving hydrocortisone, chlorpheniramine, and adrenaline. But it's only proven uh, medication is adrenaline, where we can give adrenaline subcut 0.25 ml, 1 in 10,000, before starting the antivenom as prophylaxis. So if your patient already established an allergic reaction after the antivenom, so if it is a mild reaction, you can give chlorpheniramine. And uh, if it is a severe reaction or the anaphylaxis, you can give, give uh, 1 in 1,000, 0.5 ml. Again, you need to manage and you might uh, need to start a uh, uh, IV adrenaline infusion and in have you need to pump the antigen. And further monitoring, which I am not going to highlight much. So supportive management, so pain relief, paracetamol, as I said earlier, no NSAIDs, antibiotics, and elevate the limb, and tetanus toxoid is also very important. So that comes to the end of my uh, two lectures. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes, someone has asked uh, the hump nose wiper is highly venomous. Yes, it's highly venomous, but not uh, the antivenom uh, indicated. It has categorized as highly venomous snakes in the uh, SLMA uh, 2018 uh, uh, snake bite management guideline. So don't conf get confused. Yes, uh, I'm happy to give the soft copy. I'll send. Um, this is indicated. Yes, uh, for the intractable uh, pain, uh, we can do morphine, especially in uh, uh, Russell's fiber bite. The, it's very painful. Yes, we can give morphine. Uh, I have given. Uh, at enough instances. So, uh, if initial whole blood clotting time not plotted, do we have to do whole blood clotting time series? Yes, we need to do because um, it might. Uh, oxide. Uh, recently, do we have to give the tetanus toxoid? I mean, in recent guidelines, says if our patient is having all the childhood uh, vaccination up to date and uh, one uh, toxoid do uh, booster dose that comes to all together six no need of further prophylaxis but it is very difficult to find out those stuff in emergency situations so it's better to give a toxoid dose always so uh, So, uh, I mean, there are a lot of other questions as well, but since uh, time is running, um, I'm going to move to the next, next lecture. So, I'll put my uh, email address where you can uh, ask more and more questions. So, uh, so now uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Madhav Dangampola. He's currently working as a uh, Acting consultant emergency physician in a base hospital, uh, Anadura. So he's going to talk about uh, management of a patient with shortness of breath. Um, so um, um, maybe we can uh, have a five minutes break.
if you are more tired or otherwise we, we can um, start the next lecture what do you think roshan are we going to continue or Are we going to continue or um, are, we, are we going to have a five minutes break? Okay, while Madhavi is preparing his slides, maybe you can um, have a small break, you can have some water or a tea and maybe uh, three, four, two, three minutes you can join. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, yes, Madhava. I thought of giving um, one or two minutes break because uh, oh, sure, sure. Um, I can my lecture drag for extra 10 minutes so we'll wait about two three minutes and we'll start is that all right yeah that's fine Um, okay, mother, um, I think uh, we can start now. Okay, good afternoon. So, you all know by now the our topic is uh, approach your patient with acute shortness of breath. So, next 30 to 40 minutes, I'll be discussing uh, on this topic and I'll be answering the questions at the end of the, the, the presentation. Okay, uh, so 
breathlessness or shortness of breath is a common presenting complaint to emergency department or primary care setting. Uh, and uh, not not only it's uh, uh, common, but it is an important uh, presentation. Uh, like uh, like uh, chest pain, it is uh, an important uh, presentation because it, it can present with varying degrees of severity. It might be a mild uh, shortness of breath, uh, which associated with uh, anxiety, or it may it may be associated with acute coronary syndrome, or maybe a uh, severe lung pathology. So most of the time, these uh, presentations are due to heart and lung portions causes 90 percent of the time they are due to heart or lung causes but it is uh, not always so you have to break this barrier and think about the other systems uh, which can involve uh, with this uh, presentation so uh, the dyspnea or shortness of breath is explained in uh, several medical and non-medical uh, terms uh, as you all know, patients might come and tell you that they have uh, Hatiya, Mahansiya, Papuya Mahansiya, Papuya Baragatiya, several words. They use uh, different, different words to describe it because it, it is something which cannot explain them very well. So it, it is explain, it is uh, described as unpleasant awareness of increased respiratory effort. But thing is, uh, they sometimes they uh, feel difficulty in explaining it. And this happened because of uh, of an uh, imbalance between respiratory center and peripheral chemoreceptors uh, and the, the peripheral mechanical centers for uh, respiration. And uh, I would, uh, I'm going to uh, present this case to you. Uh, this is a 60 year old uh, smoker with a history of congestive heart failure and uh, COPD brought into emergency department with the chief complaint of dyspnea. And uh, now he's sitting upright on the bed with some red work of breathing and saturation uh, hanging around, uh, I think, 86. I have, uh, and uh, uh, so what would be the approach for this patient? So this patient uh, 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 coming with shortness of breath. So it, he, uh, his shortness of, of breath can be due to exacerbation of uh, congestive cardiac failure or maybe exacerbation of COPD, maybe a different pathology like uh, due to the history of smoking, uh, he might be having acute coronary syndrome, uh, maybe due to C with the COPD, he may rupture a bullet and uh, now having a pneumothorax or maybe he's having infective exacerbation. So we don't know. So how do how we are going to approach these sort of patients? So, as I said, uh, like the presentation of dyspnea can vary from uh, like mild uh, severity to uh, the extreme conditions. So the approach always uh, I would advise uh, like uh, for uh, like uh, if the patient is unstable, they always go into uh, ALS or ACLS algorithm and it's it's a different management so if the patient is stable enough uh, uh, but who need immediate attention immediate interventions to stabilize uh, the patient might go into a resuscitation area and those patients need iv oxygen and monitoring so here i would like to mention about oxygen therapy so oxygen is just just not oxygen it's just, it's, it's a therapy so uh, so what is our target of oxygen saturation for these uh, sort of patients ideally uh, we can target for 94 to 98 percent but we don't need to aim for 100 percent we can aim for 94 to 98 percent for these patients uh, so initially we can run them on uh, 15 liters of uh, oxygen via non-rebreather mask if the patient knee acutely sneak but you can go for lower ones if the patient, you, if you think the patient is stable enough. Uh, but what if this patient, as our patient, uh, if the patient is having a COPD? So in these patients, uh, what is our target? Our target for these sort of patient is 88 to 92. But by giving 15 liters of oxygen uh, via non rebreather mask, are we going to do any harm to these patients immediately? So, there's no immediate harm. The only thing is with the, the oxygenation, they may lose their hypoxic drive and they start to hypoventilate and they may accumulate uh, uh, carbon dioxide and uh, the condition can 
get worse. But the thing is, this patient is going to be in front of you for next uh, 30 to 30 minutes to 60 minutes or maybe longer. And uh, you might get uh, your basic investigations like BBG in the uh, next few minutes. With all those, you can decide uh, whether you, you can continue uh, oxygen therapy, continue, continue high flow oxygen therapy for this patient or whether you have to reduce your oxygen uh, flow rates. So, uh, so immediately you can put them on oxygen, but uh, later on you can decide uh, towards which end they are, they are going and uh, decide on your oxygen therapy. So are, are, they, are these patients going to get any uh, like benefit? Like a, all, are all patients benefited by oxygen? The answer is no. Like if the patient is hypoxemic, hypoxic, you can treat them with oxygen. Or if they are getting symptomatic relief, uh you can uh, use oxygen but if the, if the patient is not getting any symptomatic relief or if the patient is not hypoxemic there's no uh, like point in putting them on oxygen so other thing is by attaching them to monitor we are looking for heart rate and blood pressure so if the patient's heart rate like if the patient is having tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia it's going under different algorithm and the patient uh, may be uh, dyspneic for due to that reason and uh, it is managing a different algorithm and uh, they might get better with that treatment. So if the patient's blood pressure is high, that means if they are hypertensive, you might be dealing with uh, uh, hypertensive emergency, hypertensive uh, acute pulmonary edema. Or if the patient is hypotensive, you may be, you may be dealing with obstructive uh, shock uh, uh, associated with, uh, like maybe due to a pneumothorax, maybe due to cardiac tamponade. So it is essential to get uh, the monitorings on these patients. So our approach for these patients is like a ABCD approach as always, but uh, this approach has to be more focused on uh, causes for dyspnea. So when we are considering ARV, we have to look for uh, any foreign bodies, any uh, blood or fluid causing any obstructions and uh, any deep tissue infections like uh, Ludwig's angina or uh, peritonsil abscess or retropharyngeal abscess, anything causing any uh, uh, difficulty in breathing on these patients. And uh, we can look whether this patient, these patients have increased difficulty in opening their mouth uh, that can be associated with the deep tissue infections. And if they're having asymmetrical throat swelling uh, involving soft palate and uh, ovular deviation, you may be dealing with a, uh, peritonsil abscess or quincy. In the airway, you, then you can uh, listen to the airway. Like while you are listening to the airway, you may hear a strido, maybe an inspiratory strido if, if it is a supraglottic uh, obstruction. Or uh, they may be snoring with uh, the, the obstructed airway, or they may be having gurgling noises if the, if the airway is collect, if there are any fluid or any blood collected in the airway. And uh, you can listen to their voice. And if they, they might be having a hot pathology voice or a muffled voice, if they're having a deep tissue infection. As you are around the neck, you can look for jugular venous distension and you, you can feel for trachea uh, when you are checking the airway for these patients. Then we move into the breathing. The one of the most important uh, sign in breathing is respiratory rate. So uh, by getting the respiratory rate, by counting the respiratory rate, we can get their degree of uh, uh, dyspnea. And other important thing is work of breathing. We, can, we have to look whether they are working hard for their breathing, whether they are using their accessory muscle, intercostal recessions, subcostal recessions, and uh, tracheal tugs. Uh, so we have to look for those uh, to get an idea about their degree of uh, difficulty in breathing. Especially in kids, you can look for nasal flaring. Like they might they might be having nasal flaring if they're having uh, involvement of the lower respiratory uh, lower respiratory tract for as the cause of for this dyspnea. And then you can listen for breath sounds. So the breath sounds you're 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 looking for uh, any wheezing. So if your patient uh, dyspneic patient is wheezing, you may be dealing with asthma, COPD, or maybe anaphylaxis. In a kid, maybe dealing with croup or bronchiolitis. So, if you have any, 
if, if breath sound absent in one side, you may be dealing with a hemothorax or pneumothorax. Like if you're having a wet lung, that means if you hear uh, crepitations, you may be dealing with congestive heart, cardiac failure or pulmonary edema or maybe uh, ARDS or maybe pneumonia. But if this patient, this uh, this sneak sick patient is having clear lungs, do we have to worry or not? Yes, we have to worry because this patient is sick and having dyspnea, but he's having clear lungs. So you may be dealing with pulmonary embolism or maybe acute coronary syndrome or maybe cardiac tamponade or maybe metabolic co-poisoning uh, uh, cause for their uh, difficulty in breathing. So then uh, uh, we can move into circulation. So in the circulation part, you can uh, look for their mental assessment, but it really comes under DE. But here I brought it, brought it forward because uh, with the poor circulation, they might be having, uh, they might can get uh, altered mental status. And then lo you look for color of the patient, whether the patient is pale. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, severe anemia can lead into like a, rapid bleeding, GI bleeding can uh, cause dyspnea in these patients. So you look for pallor, you look for cyanosis, and then you feel for pulse volume and uh, the regularity. And then you, as uh, in the, as I discussed in the monitoring section, you look for their heart rate and blood pressure. So with the initial monitoring and initial stabilization, so I'll talk about the stabilization on a later slide. If the, your patients get better and if you have time to ask uh, things from either from the patient or from uh, the bystander, you can, uh, the, the salient point in the history are these uh, points. So you, you have to ask about the onset of dyspnea. So whether this uh, dyspnea is a rapid onset one or gradual onset one. If it is a rapid onset one, you may be dealing with acute pulmonary edema or maybe uh, pulmonary embolism or maybe a spontaneous pneumothorax. But if it, if it is a gradual onset one, slowly progressing one, you may be dealing with the infective process or maybe uh, like a fluid overload. And uh, uh, you can uh, you can uh, ask uh, they are like a uh, they are what sort of uh, Disney, what what sort of exertion they are getting uh, dyspnea whether they are getting dyspnea at rest or whether they are getting dyspnea with CV excess and uh, depending on that you can uh, get an idea about the severity of the dyspnea and then uh, you have to ask about the precipitating events and associated symptoms and if this dyspnea is precipitated by any trauma you may be dealing with uh, like tension pneumothorax or maybe dealing with uh, cardiac tamponade and uh, if your patient is associated with uh, having any fever associated with dyspnea uh, you may be dealing with uh, 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 pneumonia and uh, the postural changes especially associated with fluid overload and congestive cardiac failure and uh, past medical history is important in the uh, in the history part because uh, uh, if your patient is having a history of asthma or copd or congestive cardiac failure or they are on drugs for these you may be dealing with a similar condition. Uh, so then uh, with this uh, the initial assessment and if you get a collateral history with all these in mind, you can think of uh, a test for this undifferentiated dyspnea patient. So uh, like I, would, uh, I would have a low threshold to go for ECG and check check on this patient, unless uh, this patient is a young, non-asthmatic uh, who improved with initial nebulization. I won't go for ECG or check check in this, those sort of patients. But otherwise, yeah, like our patient, a smoker, congestive to cardiac failure, COPD history, I would uh, go for an ECG uh, and a chest check uh, ECG, especially we may be dealing with acute coronary syndrome, so we should not miss any STEMIs uh, presenting with dyspnea. Uh, so uh, the next test is blood gas. So most of our ED is now having a point of care uh, blood gas assessment. So uh, I would uh, rather go for venous blood gas uh, for these patients to look, uh, check their carbon dioxide level, check their bicarbonate level, check the acidity. So depending on those, you can uh, narrow down your differentials and you can treat accordingly. And then uh, there are several blood tests which you have to consider in a dysmic patient. But these uh, 
blood test should uh, depend on your clinical assessment, uh, history examination, and uh, the clinical just told. Because uh, if you fire with a shotgun with all these uh, blood tests, you might end up doing a lot of tests on these patients, especially D dimer. Uh, if you if you uh, if you if you are highly suspecting uh, pulmonary embolism in this patient, there are several uh, clinical scores which you can utilize to decide whether you can whether you have to go for a D dimer or not. Uh, because if you order a D dimer and if it positive, uh, because D dimer can get positive with several medical conditions, uh, can go up with infection, can go up during pregnancies. So a lot of reasons can elevate D dimer. So if you you order a D dimer unnecessarily and if it get positive, you might end up doing a, a CTPA on those patients. So you have to uh, uh, use your clinical knowledge and uh, these uh, tools which helps uh, with your decision uh, to decide on D-dimer. So uh, if, you are if you are suspecting heart failure in this patient, you can order a BNP level. Or if you are suspecting sepsis or pneumonia in this patient, you can order lactate or blood culture. Anyway, you will get lactate level in your blood gas. And if you are suspecting acute coronary syndrome, you can order troponin uh, uh, levels for these patients. And as I said, sometimes like severe bleeding, GI bleedings can present with uh, dyspnea only. So in this patient, you have to uh, get a hemoglobin level and see whether these patients are uh, anemic. So other important thing I want to stress out is point of care ultrasound. So this is uh, this is uh, like uh, most of our emergency departments and uh, most of medical and pediatric wards now having uh, ultrasound machines. Uh, so these machines we can uh, use for uh, uh, different things, not only to look for fluid in the abdomen or lungs, but uh, we can use it for several, uh, like uh, to narrow down our differentials, especially uh, in patients coming with dyspnea or a shock. So uh, what we can differentiate with uh, our sound scan, I'm not going to go into details of these views and uh, the 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 findings of ultrasound, but uh, I'm, I'm going to give an overview of what we can differentiate with uh, with an ultrasound. So uh, once you do the ultrasound scan, if you if you see, uh, you can you can differentiate between heart failure and uh, COPD, especially in our patients coming with congestive cardiac failure and COPD. So you can differentiate whether this patient is coming with fluid overload or whether this patient is coming with COPD exacerbation or pneumothorax. And uh, then with the ultrasound scan, you can uh, scan their heart and see whether this patient is having a pleural, uh, pericardial effusion and whether they are having right ventricular uh, like diastolic collapse and having uh, pericardial tamponade. Uh, so you you can utilize these scans. Uh, you can uh, learn about ultrasound scan and uh, utilize this scan to narrow down your differentials in ultrasound scan uh, in patients coming with dyspnea. Sorry. Yeah. So, common interventions uh, to consider are like uh, like nebulizing with uh, salbutamol and protropium. If you are suspecting asthma exacerbation or COPD exacerbation, and if your patient is having wheezing, you can consider nebulizing them. And uh, if you are, if your patient is having a high risk for acute coronary syndrome, and if you are suspecting uh, acute coronary syndrome, you can give them as aspirin dose and there's no harm by giving it. And same for nitroglycerin. If you're suspecting acute pulmonary edema or acute coronary syndrome, you can use nitroglycerin. And other th other important thing is uh, non-invasive ventilation, BiPAP or CPAP. And if, you're, if your patient is coming with uh, COPD exacerbation or acute pulmonary edema, you can uh, think of using uh, BiPAP or CPAP on those patients. And uh, so on, uh, if you are suspecting pneumonia in this patient, you can uh, just the suspicion. If you are suspecting, you can start them on uh, antibiotics after taking cultures. Uh, 
So as I said, uh, there are a lot of courses for Disney. Art. So like uh, I'm not going to uh, go into all the courses for Disney, art, but uh, what I'm focusing on life threatening urgent and uh, urgent uh, courses. So, uh, so I'll be discussing a few cases in next few slides, but that will that might be a repetition of uh, previous lectures because uh, like the cardiac and pulmonary courses uh overlapping so uh so the, the, one of the common uh cause for dyspnea is asthma exacerbation so asthma is a reversible bronchoconstriction so those patients will come with uh tachypnea increased work of breathing and be seen with uh, low saturation and tachycardia so in these patients uh, the mainstay of treatment is bronchodilators and then steroid so depending their depending on their clinical parameters, you can uh, uh, get their uh, severity and uh, start them on uh, empirical treatment and check whether these patients are improving with your initial treatment. So if you, these patients are not improving with your initial treatment, you can consider them giving uh, magnesium sulfate and uh, IV salbutamol and uh, And so other similar presentation is COPD. So, uh, so these patients may come with a history of uh, COPD or maybe history of uh, smoking. So uh, in these patients also, the management is similar to uh, asthma. So you would give them bronchodilators and you would give them uh, steroids. Only difference is whether you have to give them antibiotics. So this depends on whether these patients, uh, this depend on whether these patients, dyspnea is due to infective exacerbation or not. So for to get that, you have to ask whether these patients having fever or increase, uh, whether there's any change in the sputum uh, production in this patient, whether this patient is having increased sputum production or whether there's any change in the color of the sputum or whether there's any change to the thickness of their sputum. So if, you, if you're suspecting, uh, if there's anything like that, if you're suspecting infective, infective exacerbation, you need to treat them with antibiotics. Other uh, difference to asthma is uh, like, uh, if your patient, like uh, you can start them on non-invasive ventilation. Uh, I'm not telling that uh, there's, uh, there's no contraindication to use uh, NIV on asthma patients, but more commonly we are using NIV on COPD patients. If your patient is having acidosis and uh, CO2 above 65, and uh, if the patient is tachypneic to a uh, uh, level uh, like respiratory rate to 23, uh, you may start them on uh, NIV. Uh, we, because uh, time's run out, I, I'll, I'll share these slides and you can uh, look, uh, refer the, for the settings for initial NIV for these patients. And the next, uh, the common presentation is a pneumothorax or open pneumothorax. Especially in trauma patients, you might uh, get, uh, get a, uh, pneumothorax or open pneumothorax. For uh, tension pneumothorax, initial treatment is finger thoracostomy. Earlier, we used to do uh, needle th thoracostomies, but uh, if it is like highly tensioning and you are, your patient is crashing in front of you, that needle might not be enough to uh, take the take uh, air out. So you need to go for uh, finger thoracostomy at the, the same, uh, like uh, in the safe triangle. And it, it should be uh, followed by a definitive treatment of uh, intercostal tube insertion. And then the open pneumothorax. So your initial management is three-way dressing, Ashwamgan's dressing, and uh, which is followed by uh, intercostal tube insertion and the closure of the wound. And the next uh, important uh, differential diagnosis, which, this might be a bit rare, but uh, this is something you should not miss. Uh, you have you should have high degree of suspicion for pulmonary embolisms uh, in patients who are coming with uh, uh, dyspnea or shortness of breath. So basically it's a blood clot in pulmonary circulation. So this patient might present to you with tachypnea, tachycardia, hypoxia, or pleuritic chest pain. So they may have a combination of these or one of these. So there are ECG features which are associated with pulmonary embolism, but uh, they are not highly specific for uh, pulmonary embolism. 
and uh, you can use your ultrasound. You can do a bedside ultrasound scan and see whether these patients have it, having right ventricular dilatation. And as I said uh, earlier, you can use several scores to uh, help with your uh, management and uh, help with your decision to do any investigations. One of these are uh, those are modified well score. So depending on the modified well score, you categorize them into uh, uh, low, moderate, and high uh, 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 risk for pulmonary embolism. And if your patient is low risk, uh, there's a different tool called, uh, different score called per criteria, pulmonary embolism rule out criteria, which you can apply and uh, avoid doing a D-dimer. So I'll skip management part uh, because it's running out of time. And other important thing is uh, acute pulmonary edema. So you may see a lot of patients coming with uh, acute pulmonary edema. Uh, so here, like uh, sometimes patients coming with sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema, which is sudden onset uh, pulmonary edema with uh, hypertension or they may be fine coming with gradual onset of shortness of breath with fluid all over, especially in congestive cardiac failure patients. Uh, so for patients with scape, so sympathetically crashing acute pulmonary edema, these patients will be benefited by uh, like immediate uh, CPAP and uh, nitroglycerin. So in these patients, uh, you can start them on NIV with a peep of uh, CPAP uh, with a peep of uh, six to eight, and then titrate it quickly to ten to fifteen. And these patients need high doses of nitroglycerin, not not uh, lower doses like ten micrograms. These patients, you can start them on uh, four hundred microgram boluses over two two minutes, and then uh, you can start them on fifty to hundred micrograms per minute infusion to drop their blood pressure down. Uh, and uh, then uh, you can, uh, if you want, this patient will improve with this treatment very quickly. Uh, so with the improvement, you can wean off your NIV and um, take them back to a, a face mask, or uh, then you can uh, disposition them to ward uh, with the improvement. So other important uh, differential diagnosis in this yeah. is uh, cardiac tamponade. So this is not seen very often, but uh, if you diagnose this, it is life-saving. So you should uh, have high degree of suspicion if the, your patient is having a history of malignancy, TB, or trauma, or rheumatoid disease, or any recent cardiac surgery. And uh, especially if your patient is having dyspnea with clear lung, you have, you have to suspect uh, cardiac tamponade. So as I said, you can do a bedside ultrasound scan and uh, identify the right ventricular collapse in the diastole. And these patients may have uh, electrical alterance in the ECG. And uh, the, this Beck triad is uh, described in cardiac tamponade, but so in a busy uh, environment uh, in ED, you may not hear muffled uh, heart sounds, but uh, you can look for other signs. And the treatment for this is uh, pericardiosynthesis. So other important uh, differentials uh, in uh, in a patient's coming with dyspnea is metabolic causes. So your patients may be having diabetic ketoacidosis and they may try to uh, compensate uh, with uh, the rapid bleeding and the patient might uh, come and uh, uh, present to you as dyspnea. So these patients need IV fluid, uh, insulin infusion, and uh, you have to look for any underlying causes and treat the underlying causes. At the same time, you should uh, look for any electrical electrolyte imbalances and uh, the, uh, you have to uh, look whether these patients complicating with cerebral edema and uh, uh, adjust your treatment. Uh, and other important diagnosis is sepsis. I'm not going to talk about sepsis here. I think it will be dealt uh, in the shock section. And other important uh, diagnosis, uh, the differentials are poisoning. So patients with uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, salicylate poisoning, and cyanide poisoning, 
Metima Globinia poisoning may come with uh, dyspnea. In these patients uh, with your VBG, you may be able to diagnose uh, most of the, these uh, except carbon monoxide and cyanide poisoning, but uh, you may get something in, your, in the history. Uh, I'll move on to questions. No questions in the chat box, but uh, do you have any questions? As time already passed out, I'll, I'll finish my uh, slide with these take home points. So your approach to dyspnea should be ABCD approach, but if the patient is unstable, uh, ALS, you have to move on to ALS, advanced life support algorithm and manage accordingly. And the dyspnea uh, often associated with life-threatening processes and uh, uh, most undifferentiated patients need close monitoring because they can uh, progress rapidly and uh, they can uh, crash in front of you. Most of the time, uh, the cause for dyspnea is uh, from heart and lung, but uh, as I said, uh, don't forget other system and uh, uh, keep high degree of suspicion uh, if you and uh, so these patients uh, clinical presentation can widely variable from stable to cardiac arrest patients and uh, point of care ultrasound is a useful tool to diagnose uh, or narrow down your differentials in these uh, patients Thank you. So the next uh, presentation would be on uh, transport of critically ill patients by Dr. Sinita Lianagi, a consultant emergency physician working at, currently working at NHSL. Over to Sinit. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Sinita, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks, Nadishan. Thanks, uh, Mother, for introducing me. Can you see the uh, screen with my slide shares? Yeah, we can see. Okay, right. Okay, at the uh, been the last lecture, so the series of lectures of emergency medicine. Now we see how we can pack our patient for a safe transfer. We know all post interns during the internship, at least you have done one or several patient transfers. So just think how it was, did it went smoothly? Anything that you can optimize. The patient transport is a nice and another nice sector of the patient retrievals. We'll see what is a patient transfer and what are the type of transfers. We can classify on different different aspects. As an example, the position care of the pathway, it can be transferred between the primary care, secondary care, or the tertiary care levels, or the patient transfers on the trolley, ambulance, or air, or even the ship or the water base. And urgency of care is an emergency transfer, such as if you have an MI patient, you want to transfer for a cat lab, it's an emergency critical time, critical transfers, and level of care provide transfers. I will explain those things on next couple of slides. And also the transfers can be again, clinical indicated or capacity indicated. If your hospital met a mass casualty, if your hospital can't cater, then you have to transfer the extra amount of people. That is a capacity-based transfers. So next couple of slides, 
I will discuss mainly on the inter-hospital transfers that is in the same region or across the country. So next 20 minutes, we'll see what are the indications for the transfer and what is the receiving end, how to decide the receiving end, how we can optimize our patients before the transfers, and how to select the team members, what equipment that we should carry, and what are the modes of transfers. If you have any questions, just drop the questions in the chat box. I will answer at the end of the, my presentation. We all know the critically ill patient is a patient who is having life-threatening injuries or the illnesses. And that particular person is having poor physiological reserves. Just think that you are asleep on a van or another vehicle moving on a high speed on the road. What is the experience that you will get? I know it is quite annoying. When you are having a critically ill, the disturbances are much more than you think. That is why we need highly trained and skilled practitioners to cater that particular patient because that patient is in poor condition and poor resources inside the ambulance. And also, there should be an effective communication between the sending end and the receiving end as well as the transport team inside the ambulance to give smooth and optimal patient transfer. The decision of the transfer should make by the most senior person in that particular sending board, not by an on-call person. That person should come and assist the patient and decide the risk and the benefits between the transfer and the keeping the patient. Once you decide to transfer the patient or send the patient, the receiving end should be able to cater the need. As example, if you're in a peripheral hospital, if you got the head injury patient, and then you want to move him to a tertiary level or the next level hospital to do a CT scan and make sure and call that receiving end and ask whether the CT scan is working or not. If the CT scan is out of order, if you send the patient to the receiving end, the time is wasting and the resources are wasting because that receiving end can't cater the CT patient. Therefore, always call the receiving end and then decide if that receiving end is able to cater the need. And also, especially if you are transferring the patients between the highly specialized unit, as example, if you have an ICU patient, have to transfer to another ICU, call that particular ICU and ask and receive the bed for that particular patient. Otherwise, if you are taking the patient to the receiving end, at that time, if the ICU bed is taken by another the patient, you are all in trouble. There are several theories between the transfers in the patients. One is the scoop and run. The scoop and run is a condition what you are going to do in a pre-hospital. If a poor resource place, you can go grab the patient and run to the nearest hospital. That is the scoop and run. The keep and play means if you have an unstable patient without and before transferring, you keep the patient in your station and keep on stabilizing, keep on stabilizing. Both theories are not the optimum. So you have to transfer a stabilized patient sooner the better. As an example, if you have a septic shock patient and if you are planning to transfer, don't grab and run or scoop and run. Just start good two IV cannulas, start IV fluids, take the samples to the septic screening, start IV antibiotic, and then take the patient. Always stabilize and then transfer quickly. And the time of transfers. 
we can we are happy to do a night time transit because less traffic we can go with smoothly but the problem is so if the receiving end have poor staff at night time then patient might not get the optimal care so always contact the receiving end and then transfer the patient that will minimize the problems for the transit team who is responsible for the patient care during the transfer the patient therefore it's better to contact the receiving end when you are going towards the hospital to the receiving end the team selection that also depending on the patient condition team can be a doctor a nurse paramedic and the ambulance driver usually each and every transfer is having a paramedic and the driver but the nurse and the doctor is depending on the patient condition we say it as a level 0 to level 3 level 0 is the one only ambulance and the driver goes we are the patient going for a clinic visit or very stable routine transfers level 1 is the one with the paramedic and the nursing officer and that patient is also stable and not anticipate any worsening of the condition level 2 is a transfer which consists of a doctor nurse and the paramedic with the ambulance driver and level 3 is a unstable critically ill patient which goes with the retrieval specialist doctor that is the team consist and thinking the patient is in danger so therefore if you are the doctor who has to go in the retrieval make sure you are either you are physically fit or you are not having motion sickness or else you are pre medicated with some medication to minimize the symptoms and also the team should have adequate resources adequate ppe and they should have some meal or they have should have some meal arrangement because we know a transfer will take hours and hours to come back now we'll move to stabilization of patient the airway is the first thing we all is going to stabilize we all know a low gcs patient or rapidly dropping patient we always we need to intubate because it's quite difficult to intubate in a moving vehicle or in very confined patient so therefore make sure that you are intubate the patient before you are moving the patient from the sending end and once you intubate please secure the tubes otherwise it's high chances to dislodge and then always confirm the tube position if the patient is intubated with clinically or radiologically by taking chest x rays if you have the resources once the airways deal and confirm and stabilize then we move to the breathing part all is check the pulse oximetry and the blood gases if available and the chest x rays to check the effectiveness of the breathing and then if the patient is trauma patient if you suspect the patient is having pneumothorax at least do a finger thoracostomy and decompress before the patient transfers because if you have intubated and ventilated a pneumothorax patient the positive pressure will worsen the pneumothorax and ended up with tension pneumothorax soon after i'm not going to detail on the insertion of the ic tubes and things here but i think is the core knowledge next thing we have to calculate the oxygen requirement when you are taking a patient our minor staff is really helpful to take the oxygen and they ask how much oxygen that we should carry it all depends how how long you are going on the journey and how much oxygen that patient required we have to calculate according to some of the formulas if the patient is intubated and ventilated the most of the newer ventilators are power driven that means that need a battery supply to run the ventilator but all ventilators are oxygen driven 
So therefore, if you are going to take oxygen, if you have a very old machine, which is not a power driven, you have to take extra oxygen for the, for the ventilator as well. If the patient is on a 40% oxygen via the venturi mask, we can calculate it. The usually the 40% uh, venturi mask need 10 liters per minute. So therefore, if the patient is going on a two hour journey, we have to take 2,400 liters, a simple calculation. That means we have to take 10 liters per minute, 10 into 120, that means one, one minute we are giving 10 liters for two hours, that means two, 120 minutes, they need 1,200. But we should carry the double the amount, not the exact amount. We know if the journey is two hours, but it will take another at least 15 minutes to take the patient to the ambulance from the sending end. And also once you reach to the receiving end, it takes another 15 minutes to dispatch the patient so half an hour, we have to take extra oxygen. And also there can be some mechanical problems. There can be traffic jams. There can be road issues. So therefore, always we have to take double the oxygen requirement than we calculated. That is not for up and down. That double is a single way because of unavoidable circumstances. Here I have mentioned the some cylinder capacity and cylinder names, but you can't keep them in mind. Just always follow what are the, uh, the available cylinders in your setup and arrange accordingly. Then we'll move to the circulation. We all should have at least two working IV cannulas because we know one week, once we connect it to the ambulance and the IV drips, when you're moving, IV drips are easily can come out. If you have only one cannula, if the IV access is get, get blocked, then it's very difficult to put a new cannula. So therefore, if you're transferring a critically ill patient, make sure he, is, he or she is having at least two good running IV cannulas. And also, you should make sure that IV cannula is nicely secured and fixed. Next thing is that IV cannula is should at a readily accessible place. When you're moving in an ambulance, we all know only the right hand and the right leg are closer to the team and left leg and the left arm is away from your uh, reach. It is at the wall of the ambulance. So usually we are happy if you can have a right hand cannula because that is the most easily reach. And the blood pressure monitoring, we usually goes by the non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. It is quite easy and simple to use, but sometimes can give erroneous results because the it all depends on the vibration. So if we are moving in a very irregular road, that gives very erroneous blood pressure recordings. And make sure you are having additional methods to keep the assessing of the blood pressure. Next thing is a disability. As a habit, when you're moving a patient, we always start a bit of more sedation and more analgesia because when we are moving a patient, that can increase their pain and that can uh, make them more distressed. So always as a habit, if patient is on morphine or midazolam infusions, we give a small bolus and increase the level of infusion. And if the patient is on paralysis and always continue the paralysis during the transfer and make sure that accompanying doctor is much more comfortable and knowledgeable about all the sedation infusions as well as the paradigm agents. A blood glucose is one of the commonest thing that we are going to uh, forget. If the patient is on transfer, sometimes we keep nil by mouth. 
Sometimes the trance get delayed for hours and hours throughout the period. Patient can be kneel by mouth. So patient deteriorate or patient become drowsy because of the hypoglycemic. Even my practice, I have seen a couple of patients. I'm getting to exercise in HSL, intubated, ventilated, being in ICUs for one or two days, but on arrival, they're hypoglycemic because the staff has forget to check the sugar level and they have kept the patient fasting to optimize the during trance. So make sure that you check the sugar level before you depart from your sending end. If the patient is having seizures, make sure if you started some midusolam or benzodiazepine to stop the seizure and start some phenytoin or something to prevent the seizure recurrence. Otherwise, midusolam and morphine, very short acting, they will stop the current seizure, but it won't prevent the recurrence. And as well as if you're transferring the patient with high intracranial pressure or head injury, all this, if possible, just discuss with the receiving end. What are the measures that they want you to do before the patient sending from the sending end and during the transfer? That will make the patients much more easily recoverable and prevent worsening. And always give the patients all regular medications and the feeding before and during the transfer. We know we are keeping the patient on a stretcher, but may vehicle moves in a high speed. So we have to immobilize the patient very nicely and tightly. And we should use cervical spine uh, immobilizing with the cervical collars and apply the pelvic binders and long bone fractures always should splinter before the transfer of the patient. And if the patient is having a lot of lines, IV lines, infusion pump lines, everything, try to minimize lines towards the only necessary infusions. If the patient is on fluid infusions, you can omit that infusion if you are going to take the patient for very short transfer. So keep all the necessary lines and avoid unnecessary lines. That will minimize the disturbance. All the lines should securely fix and double check whether it is fixed. We all know inside the ambulance is quite cold if you're having an air conditioned cabin. So always wrap the patient before you go and never ever forget to do the gastric decompress decompression with the NG tubes and make sure the patient is having urinary during catheter and the diapers. We all know how it disturbing for transferring team if the patient open bowel or bladder inside the ambulance. Blanket or some bed sheet at least. And pressure point care also important if the patient can get injuries according to the compression with the patient between the stretch, stretcher as well as patient with the equipment, what you are carrying. Next important thing is we are always trying to keep the patient on a spinal board or the scoop, scoop stretcher during the transport. If the patient is not having any unstable cervical spine fractures or any other spinal fractures, please don't keep the patient on the scoop or the spinal board for a long time. Any patient on the spinal board for more than four hours, they can get the pressure source. So always avoid unnecessary spinal board or scoop stretches on the, to keep the patient. Next thing is the equipment. We all know we are having very limited environment inside the ambulance. We should be comfortable and quite knowing what are the available equipments. What we are going to do normally, we are keeping all the packets. If you, as example, if you want to check the sugar, we have a glucometer packet. It's just a polythene packet which carry the glucometer, swabs and small needle and glucometer strips. If you want to check the sugar, we take, we take the glucometer pack out 
check the sugar and then put it back. It's quite easy and tidy in the environment in the limited resources. We can keep, prepare this kind of ambulance bag, which is quite organized and we know exactly what we have inside. These are some prepared list of equipments that what we should carry in our airway or the ambulance bag, right? So these are the equipments on the airway bag. We should carry the face mask or oropharyngeal airways, like etc. And the ventilator, what should carry the ventilator and blue bag and the other things. I will share the slides here in the chat box, or I will give the slides to the Nadisha, the coordinator. Then. He will be sending these slides, no need to jot down the dead stuff. And here I have mentioned what are the equipments that should be carried for the circulation and other equipments and the essential drug list. All the emergency drugs should drawn up. If the patient is having bradycardia, take atrophy and draw it up and keep yourself but. Once you draw and once you dilute it, please kindly label it appropriately. Otherwise, you, you will forget which drug inside. Especially if you are transiting the pediatric patients, always make sure you are diluting and prepare the appropriate medicines and label it properly. The equipment, what we are going to take, in the ambulance should be durable, compact, and well-maintained. We know we have a lot of high-end multipara monitors, but when you take them into the ambulance, it might not work due to absence of the battery power. So always you should have to keep additional equipment which are compatible with their battery support to run without electric power supply. And also, that's really beneficial if you have an ambulance with power source. You can be UPS or the battery backup from the vehicle itself. Sorry for the very crowded slide that shows what are the requirements of a transport vehicle. It's lengthy and lengthy. The vehicle should appropriate to give the task and cabin should we have enough equipment and enough spacing and power su supply is the idea. The adequate suction and illumination that is quite important to do some procedures inside the ambulance. And there should be easy access for take the patient out and put it in. And other important thing is the restraints. You have the seat belts and the tapes and straps to connect the patient into the stretcher and to connect the stretcher into the vehicle. And also, not only the patient and the stretcher, the equipment also nicely attached to the vehicle. And not only that, the passengers, the doctors, nurses, and the cabin crew all should have the seat belts because the ambulance are flying on the roads. And the driver should be educated and knowledge according to the speed. The speed is not sky high. Speed should be somewhere around 60 to 70 kilometers per minute per hour, but we should minimize the acceleration and deceleration as much as possible. The speed is good, but we should avoid sudden brakes and sudden accelerations that will cause more harm to the patient. If the patient is half filled, we call it as a, is it gravity? Is it forces? We should minimize high changes or rapid changes of the speeds that cause pro uh, problems to the circulation, especially intracranial pressures. Other than that, we have to take the needful documents when you're going to When you're going to take the patient, we have to take all the transfer forms. We all know our standard transfer form is not a real, real form to take the patient because 
we are having one printed site and back site is the blank area. The printed area doesn't carry any clinical detail of the patient. At the moment, with the collaboration with the Minister of Health, emergency medicine physicians are planning to have a nice structured transfer form which carries much more detail. It is at the moment in the processing. But till that, make sure that you are taking good clinical summary. Why I'm telling that thing? Because I'm getting about 10 to 15 transfers each and every day to my accident service. I welcome all of you if you are bringing the patient. But take a proper summary and come. Because most of the time, I am getting the junior most staff patient accompanying the patient, but they are not in the team of management. So how this patient present to the hospital, what are the things that the patient has undergone are not knowing most of the time. If you can have a nice clinical summary, each and everything on nice order, it's quite easy for you to hand over for the receiving end. And also, please carry all the blood investigations and the imaging films when you are carrying it so we can avoid duplicating them here again. And also, make sure that you are carrying the details of the next of kin. That means if the patient needs any special advices or any extra details, then we can call the next of the king or the spouse or the close family member to get the extra details. And the communication is, is the utmost important during the trance of the patient. As I mentioned previously, if you are sending a patient to accident service, please inform us. We are really happily, happily taking any patients comes to our hospital. But if you inform us beforehand, we can keep our hospital ready to accommodate your patient and accept your, right? And when you're communicating, and also not only the, over the phone, once you come, it's very easy to communicate using the ISBAR tool. I know it is not a very strange way. The ISBAR stands for identification of the patient and identify who you are talking and to whom you are talking and the situation of the patient and the background, what you have done to the patient and assessment and what you want us to do, right? During the COVID era, we know adequate PPE is one of the main prerequisites before the transfer or even a ward work. It is not limited to the COVID era. Always you have to have adequate PPE according to the patient and the clinical need. And also, if you are in the transfer team, then make sure that you are getting good training program to optimize the patient transfers. The retrieval medicine is wonderful area that you all can master. Any questions? In the absence of the questions in the chat, uh, chat box, I will summarize the needed staff. Make sure you are having a checklist. That is the most important thing in patient transfers. You can browse in the internet. You can find out easily a transport record checklist. So I have mentioned huge list of equipments and uh, other requirements during the transfers, but no one can keep them in mind. But if you have a checklist, it's quite easily, you can recall all the needed stuff. So most important thing is to have a checklist in your department, which can be used during the patient transfers. Thank you.
I think now we are concluding the today's sessions. So we'll join the next session on the subsequent day. Thank you very much for your kind participation. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maduranga. So uh, that concludes today's program in emergency medicine. Uh, we will send the Zoom link uh, to your emails regarding the surgery training on Monday. And we will uh, coordinate with your relevant hospital uh, focal points. So do keep in touch because uh, they have not send us the schedule yet, so probably today evening. So until then, uh, Monday we will see you. Right. Thank you. So a uh, special thanks goes to Dr. Nadish Fernand, emergency physician at Karapitya for organizing this program and uh, College of Emergency Medicine, Dr. Ganesh Gan Samarajiva as well. Thank you very much. Recording stopped.